section one of the crime of sylvestre bonnard by anatole france this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the crime of sylvestre bonnard by anatole france part one the log december twenty four eighteen forty nine i had put on my slippers and my dressing-gown i wiped away a tear with which the north wind blowing over the quay had obscured my vision a bright fire was leaping in the chimney of my study ice crystals shaped like fern leaves were sprouting over the window-panes and concealed from me the seine with its bridges and the louvre of the valois i drew up my easy chair to the hearth and my table volant and took up so much of my place by the fire as hamilcar deigned to allow me hamilcar was lying in front of the andirons curled up on a cushion with his nose between his paws his thick fine fur rose and fell with his regular breathing at my coming he slowly slipped a glance of his agate eyes at me from between his half-opened lids which he closed again almost at once thinking to himself it is nothing it is only my friend hamilcar i said to him as i stretched my legs hamilcar somnolent prince of the city of books thou guardian nocturnal like that divine cat who combated the impious in heliopolis in the night of the great combat thou dost defend from vile nibblers those books which the old savant acquired at the cost of his slender savings and indefatigable zeal sleep hamilcar softly as a sultana in this library that shelters thy military virtues for verily in thy person are united the formidable aspect of a tater warrior and the slumbrous grace of a woman of the orient sleep thou heroic and voluptuous hamilcar while awaiting the moonlight hour in which the mice will come forth to dance before the actus sanctorum of the learned bolandists the beginning of this discourse pleased hamilcar who accompanied it with a throat sound like the song of a kettle on the fire but as my voice waxed louder hamilcar notified me by lowering his ears and by wrinkling the striped skin of his brow that it was bad taste on my part so to declaim this old book man evidently thought hamilcar talks to no purpose at all while our housekeeper never utters a word which is not full of good sense full of significance containing either the announcement of a meal or the promise of a whipping one knows what she says but this old man puts together a lot of sounds signifying nothing so thought hamilcar to himself leaving him to his reflections i opened a book which i began to read with interest for it was a catalogue of manuscripts i do not know any reading more easy more fascinating more delightful than that of a catalogue the one i was reading edited in eighteen twenty four by mr thompson librarian to sir thomas raleigh sins it is true by excess of brevity and does not offer that character of exactitude which the archivists of my own generation were the first to introduce into works upon diplomatics and paleography it leaves a good deal to be desired and to be divined this is perhaps why i find myself aware while reading it of a state of mind which in nature more imaginative than mine might be called reverie i had allowed myself to drift away this gently upon the current of my thoughts when my housekeeper announced in a tone of ill-humour that monsieur coco desired to speak with me in fact some one had slipped into the library after her he was a little man a poor little man of puny appearance wearing a thin jacket he approached me with a number of little bows and smiles but he was very pale and although still young and alert he looked ill i thought as i looked at him of a wounded squirrel he carried under his arm a green toilette which he put upon a chair then unfastening the four corners of the toilette he uncovered a heap of little yellow books monsieur he then said to me i have not the honour to be known to you 
i am a book agent monsieur i represent the leading houses of the capital and in the hope that you will kindly honour me with your confidence i take the liberty to offer you a few novelties kind gods just gods such novelties as the homunculus coco showed me the first volume that he put in my hand was l'histoire de la tour de nestel with the armour à marguerite de bourgogne and the captain buridan it is a historical book he said to me with a smile a book of real history in that case i replied it must be very tiresome for all the historical books which contain no lies are extremely tedious i write some authentic ones myself and if you were unlucky enough to carry a copy of any of them from door to door you would run the risk of keeping it all your life in that green baize of yours without ever finding even a cook foolish enough to buy it from you certainly monsieur the little man answered out of pure good nature and all smiling again he offered me the amour de louise et d'abella but i made him understand that at my age i had no use for love stories still smiling he proposed me the regle des jeux de la société pique bezique et carte whist dice draughts and chess alas i said to him if you want to make me remember the rules of bezique give me back my old friend bignon with whom i used to play cards every evening before the five academies solemnly escorted him to the cemetery or else bring down to the frivolous level of human amusements the grave intelligence of hamilcar whom you see on that cushion for he is the sole companion of my evenings the little man's smile became vague and uneasy here he said is a new collection of society amusements jokes and puns with a receipt for changing a red rose to a white rose i told him that i had fallen out with the roses for a long time and that as to jokes i was satisfied with those which i unconsciously permitted myself to make in the course of my scientific labours the homunculus offered me his last book with his last smile he said to me here is the clef des songs the key of dreams with the explanation of any dreams that anybody can have dreams of gold dreams of robbers dreams of death dreams of falling from the top of a tower it is exhaustive i had taken hold of the tongs and brandishing them energetically i replied to my commercial visitor yes my friend but those dreams and a thousand others joyous or tragic are all summed up in one the dream of life is your little yellow book able to give me the key to that yes monsieur answered the homunculus the book is complete and it is not dear one franc twenty-five centimes monsieur i called my housekeeper for there is no bell in my room and said to her therese monsieur coco whom i am going to ask you to show out has a book here which might interest you the key of dreams i shall be very glad to buy it for you my housekeeper responded monsieur when one has not even time to dream awake one has still less time to dream asleep thank god my days are just enough for my work and my work for my days and i am able to say every night lord bless thou the rest which i am going to take i never dream either on my feet or in bed and i never mistake my eiderdown coverlet for a devil as my cousin did and if you will allow me to give my opinion about it i think you have books enough here now monsieur has thousands and thousands of books which simply turn his head and as for me i have just two which are quite enough for all my wants and purposes my catholic prayer-book and my cuisinier bourgeoise and with those words my housekeeper helped the little man to fasten up his stock again within the green toilette the homunculus coco had ceased to smile his relaxed features took such an expression of suffering that i felt sorry to have made fun of so unhappy a man i called him back and told him that i had caught a glimpse of a copy of the histoire d'estelle et de Nebohin which he had among his books that i was very fond of shepherds and shepherdesses and that i would be quite willing to purchase at a reasonable price the story of these two perfect lovers i will sell you that book for one franc twenty-five centimes monsieur replied coco whose face at once beamed with joy it is historical and you will be pleased with it i know now just what suits you i see that you are a connoisseur to-morrow i will bring you the 
cream des pop it is a good book i will bring you the edition d'amateur with coloured plates i begged him not to do anything of the sort and sent him away happy when the green toilette and the agent had disappeared in the shadow of the corridor i asked my housekeeper whence the little man had dropped upon us dropped is the word she answered he dropped on us from the roof monsieur where he lives with his wife you say he has a wife therese that is marvellous women are very strange creatures this one must be a very unfortunate little woman i don't really know what she is answered therese but every morning i see her trailing a silk dress covered with grease spots over the stairs she makes soft eyes at people and in the name of common sense does it become a woman that has been received here out of charity to make eyes and to wear dresses like that for they allowed the couple to occupy the attic during the time the roof was being repaired in consideration of the fact that the husband is sick and the wife in an interesting condition the concierge even says that the pain came on her this morning and that she is now confined they must have been very badly off for a child therese i replied they had no need of a child doubtless but nature had decided that they should bring one into the world nature made them fall into her snare one must have exceptional prudence to defeat nature's schemes let us be sorry for them and not blame them as for silk dresses there is no young woman who does not like them the daughters of eve adore adornment you yourself therese who are so serious and sensible what a fuss you make when you have no white apron to wait at table in but tell me have they got everything necessary in their attic how could they have it monsieur my housekeeper made answer the husband whom you have just seen used to be a jewellery peddler at least so the concierge tells me and nobody knows why he stopped selling watches you have just seen that he is now selling almanacs that is no way to make an honest living and i never will believe that god's blessing can come to an almanac peddler between ourselves the wife looks to me for all the world like a good-for-nothing a marie couge toile i think she would be just as capable of bringing up a child as i should be of playing the guitar nobody seems to know where they came from but i am sure they must have come by misery's coach from the country of sans souci wherever they have come from therese they are unfortunate and their attic is cold pardi the roof is broken in several places and the rain comes through in streams they have neither furniture nor clothing i don't think cabinet makers and weavers work much for christians of that sect that is very sad therese a christian woman much less well provided for than this pagan hamilcar here what does she have to say monsieur i never speak to those people i don't know what she says or what she sings but she sings all day long i hear her from the stairway whenever i am going out or coming in well the heir of the coco family will be able to say like the egg in the village riddle ma mere me fit en chantant my mother sang when she brought me into the world the like happened in the case of henry the fourth when jeanne d'albret felt herself about to be confined she began to sing an old bernays canticle notre dame de bout du pont venez à mon aide en sept heures priez le dieu du ciel qu'il me délivre vite qu'il me donne un garçon it is certainly unreasonable to bring little unfortunates into the world but the thing is done every day my dear therese and all that philosophers on earth will never be able to reform the silly custom madame coco has followed it and she sings this is creditable at all events but tell me therese have you not put the soup to boil to-day yes monsieur and it is time for me to go and skim it good but don't forget therese to take a good bowl of soup out of the pot and carry it to madame coco our attic neighbour my housekeeper was on the point of leaving the room when i added just in time therese before you do anything else please call your friend the porter and tell him to take a good bundle of wood out of our stock and carry it up to the attic of those coco folks see above all that he puts a first-class log in the lot a real christmas log as for the homunculus if he comes back again do not allow either himself or any of his yellow books to come in here having taken all these little precautions with the refined egotism of an old bachelor i returned to my catalogue again with what surprise with what emotion with what anxiety did i therein discover the following mention which i cannot even now 
copy without feeling my hand tremble la legende dore de jacques de jean jacques de varagine traduction française petit un quatre this manuscript of the fourteenth century contains besides the tolerably complete translation of the celebrated work of jacques de varagine un the legends of saint ferreol veroutillon germain vincent and doctorius de a poem on the miraculous burial of m saint germain of auxerre this translation as well as the legends and the poem are due to the clerk alexander this manuscript is written upon vellum it contains a great number of illuminated letters and two finely executed miniatures in a rather imperfect state of preservation one represents the purification of the virgin and the other the coronation of proserpine what a discovery perspiration moistened my forehead and a veil seemed to come before my eyes i trembled i flushed and without being able to speak i felt a sudden impulse to cry out at the top of my voice what a treasure for more than forty years i had been making a special study of the history of christian gaul and particularly of that glorious abbey of st germain des prés whence issued forth those king monks who founded our national dynasty now despite the culpable insufficiency of the description given it was evident to me that the manuscript of the clerk alexander must have come from the great abbey everything proved this fact all the legends added by the translator related to the pious foundation of the abbey by king childebert then the legend of saint dracteus was particularly significant being the legend of the first abbot of my dear abbey the poem in french verse on the burial of saint germain led me actually into the nave of that venerable basilica which was the umbilicus of christian gaul the golden legend is in itself a vast and gracious work jacques de varagine definitor of the order of saint dominic and archbishop of genoa collected in the thirteenth century the various legends of catholic saints and formed so rich a compilation that from all the monasteries and castles of the time there arose the cry this is the golden legend the legende dore was especially opulent in roman hagiography edited by an italian monk it reveals its best merits in the treatment of matters relating to the terrestrial domains of st peter varagine can only perceive the greater saints of the occident as through a cold mist for this reason the aquitanian and saxon translators of the good legend writer were careful to add to his recital the lives of their own national saints i have read and collated a great many manuscripts of the golden legend i know all those described by my learned colleague m paulin paris in his handsome catalogue of the manuscripts of the bibliothèque de Roi they were two among them which especially drew my attention one is of the fourteenth century and contains a translation by jean belay the other younger by a century presents the version of jacques vignet both come from the colbert collection and were placed on the shelves of that glorious colbertine library by the librarian balus whose name i can never pronounce without uncovering my head for even in the century of the giants of erudition balus astounds by his greatness i know also a very curious codex in the bijot collection i know seventy-four printed editions of the work commencing with the venerable ancestor of all the gothic of strasbourg begun in fourteen seventy one and finished in fourteen seventy five but no one of those manuscripts no one of those editions contains the legends of saint ferreol ferroutillon germain vincent and doctorius no one bears the name of the clerk alexander no one in fine came from the abbey of st germain des prés compared with the manuscript described by mr thompson they are only a straw to gold i have seen with my eyes i have touched with my fingers an incontrovertible testimony to the existence of this document but the document itself what has become of it sir thomas raleigh went to end his days by the shores of the lake of como whither he carried with him a part of his literary wealth where did the books go after the death of that aristocratic collector where could the manuscript of the clerk alexander have gone and why i asked myself why should i have learned that this precious book exists 
if i am never to possess it never even to see it i would go to seek it in the burning heart of africa or in the icy regions of the pole if i knew it were there but i do not know where it is i do not know if it be guarded in a triple locked iron case by some jealous bibliomaniac i do not know if it be growing mouldy in the attic of some ignoramus i shudder at the thought that perhaps its torn out leaves may have been used to cover the pickled jars of some housekeeper End of section one section two of the crime of sylvestre bonheur by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain august thirty eighteen fifty the heavy heat compelled me to walk slowly i kept close to the walls of the north keys and in the lukewarm shade the shops of the dealers in old books engravings and antiquated furniture drew my eyes and appealed to my fancy rummaging and idling among these i hastily enjoyed some verses spiritedly thrown off by a poet of the pleiad i examined an elegant masquerade by watteau i felt with my eye the weight of a two-handed sword a steel gorgerin a morion what a thick helmet what a ponderous breastplate seigneur a giant's garb no the carapace of an insect the men of those days were cuirassed like beetles their weakness was within them to-day on the contrary our strength is interior and our armed souls dwell in feeble bodies here is a pastel portrait of a lady of the old time the face vague like a shadow smiles and a hand gloved with an open-work mitten retains upon her satiny knees a lapdog with a ribbon about its neck that picture fills me with a sort of charming melancholy let those who have no half-effaced pastels in their own hearts laugh at me like the horse that scents the stable i hasten my pace as i near my lodgings there it is that great human hive in which i have a cell for the purpose of therein distilling the somewhat acrid honey of erudition i climb the stairs with slow effort only a few steps more and i shall be at my own door but i divine rather than see a robe descending with a sound of rustling silk i stop and press myself against the balustrade to make room the lady who is coming down is bareheaded she is young she sings her eyes and teeth gleam in the shadow for she laughs with lips and eyes at the same time she is certainly a neighbour and a very familiar one she holds in her arms a pretty child a little boy quite naked like the son of a goddess he has a medal hung round his neck by a little silver chain i see him sucking his thumb and looking at me with those big eyes so newly opened on this old universe the mother simultaneously looks at me in a sly mysterious way she stops i think blushes a little and holds out the little creature to me the baby has a pretty wrinkle between wrist and arm a pretty wrinkle about his neck and all over him from head to foot the daintiest dimples laugh in his rosy flesh the mamma shows him to me with pride monsieur she says don't you think he is very pretty my little boy she takes one tiny hand lifts it to the child's own lips and drawing out the darling pink fingers again towards me says baby throw the gentleman a kiss then folding the little being in her arms she flees away with the agility of a cat and is lost to sight in a corridor which judging by the odour must lead to some kitchen i enter my own quarters therese who can that young mother be whom i saw bareheaded on the stairs just now with a pretty little boy and therese replies that it was madame coco 
i stare up at the ceiling as if trying to obtain some further illumination therese then recalls to me the little book peddler who tried to sell me almanacs last year while his wife was lying in and coco himself i asked i was answered that i would never see him again the poor little man had been laid away underground without my knowledge and indeed with the knowledge of very few people on a short time after the happy delivery of madame coco i learned that his wife had been able to console herself i did likewise but therese i asked has madame coco got everything she needs in that attic of hers you would be a great dupe monsieur replied my housekeeper if you should bother yourself about that creature they gave her notice to quit the attic when the roof was repaired but she stays there yet in spite of the proprietor the agent the concierge and the bailiffs i think she has bewitched every one of them she will leave the attic when she pleases monsieur but she is going to leave in her own carriage let me tell you that therese reflected for a moment and then uttered these words a pretty face is a curse from heaven then i ought to thank heaven for having spared me that curse but here put my hat and cane away i am going to amuse myself with a few pages of Morayry. if i can trust my old fox nose we are going to have a nicely flavoured pullet for dinner look after that estimable fowl my girl and spare your neighbours so that you and your old master may be spared by them in turn having thus spoken i proceeded to follow out the tufted ramifications of a princely genealogy End of section two section three of the crime of sylvestre bonheur by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain may seventh eighteen fifty one i have passed the winter according to the ideal of the sages in angelo cum libello and now the swallows of the quai malaque find me on their return about as when they left me he who lives little changes little and it is scarcely living at all to use up one's days over old texts yet i feel myself to-day a little more deeply impregnated than ever before with that vague melancholy which life distils the economy of my intelligence i dare scarcely confess it to myself has remained disturbed ever since that momentous hour in which the existence of the manuscript of the clerk alexander was first revealed to me it is strange that i should have lost my rest simply on account of a few old sheets of parchment but it is unquestionably true the poor man who has no desires possesses the greatest of riches he possesses himself the rich man who desires something is only a wretched slave i am just such a slave the sweetest pleasures those of converse with some one of a delicate and well-balanced mind or dining out with a friend are insufficient to enable me to forget the manuscript which i know that i want and have been wanting from the moment i knew of its existence i feel the want of it by day and by night i feel the want of it in all my joys and pains i feel the want of it while at work or asleep i recall my desires as a child how well i can now comprehend the intense wishes of my early years i can see once more with astonishing vividness a certain doll which when i was eight years old used to be displayed in the window of an ugly little shop of the rue de saint i cannot tell how it happened that this doll attracted me i was very proud of being a boy i despised little girls and i longed impatiently for the day which alas has come when a strong beard should bristle on my chin i played at being a soldier and under the pretext of obtaining forage 
for my rocking-horse i used to make sad havoc among the plants my poor mother delighted to keep on her window-sill manly amusements those i should say and nevertheless i was consumed with longing for a doll characters like hercules have such weaknesses occasionally was the one i had fallen in love with at all beautiful no i can see her now she had a splotch of vermilion on either cheek short soft arms horrible wooden hands and long sprawling legs her flowered petticoat was fastened at the waist with two pins even now i can see the black heads of those two pins it was a decidedly vulgar doll smelt of the faubourg i remember perfectly well that child as i was then before i had put on my first pair of trousers i was quite conscious in my own way that this doll lacked grace and style that she was gross that she was coarse but i loved her in spite of that i loved her just for that i loved her only i wanted her my soldiers and my drums had become as nothing in my eyes i ceased to stick sprigs of heliotrope and veronica into the mouth of my rocking horse that doll was all the world to me i invented ruses worthy of a savage to oblige virginie my nurse to take me by the little shop in the rue de saint i would press my nose against the window until my nurse had to take my arm and drag me away monsieur sylvestre it is late and your mamma will scold you monsieur sylvestre in those days made very little of either scoldings or whippings but his nurse lifted him up like a feather and monsieur sylvestre yielded to force in after years with age he degenerated and sometimes yielded to fear but at that time he used to fear nothing i was unhappy an unreasoning but irresistible shame prevented me from telling my mother about the object of my love thence all my sufferings for many days that doll incessantly present in fancy danced before my eyes stared at me fixedly opened her arms to me assuming in my imagination a sort of life which made her appear at once mysterious and weird and thereby all the more charming and desirable finally one day a day i shall never forget my nurse took me to see my uncle captain victor who had invited me to lunch i admired my uncle a great deal as much because he had fired the last french cartridge at waterloo as because he used to prepare with his own hands at my mother's table certain chapon à l'ail crust on which garlic has been rubbed which he afterwards put in the chicory salad i thought that was very fine my uncle victor also inspired me with much respect by his frogged coat and still more by his way of turning the whole house upside down from the moment he came into it even now i cannot tell just how he managed it but i can affirm that whenever my uncle victor found himself in any assembly of twenty persons it was impossible to see or to hear anybody but him my excellent father i have reason to believe never shared my admiration for uncle victor he used to sicken him with his pipe gave him great thumps in the back by way of friendliness and accuse him of lacking energy my mother though always showing a sister's indulgence to the captain sometimes advised him to fold the brandy bottle a little less frequently but i had no part either in these repugnances or these reproaches and uncle victor inspired me with the purest enthusiasm it was therefore with a feeling of pride that i entered into the little lodging he occupied in the rue Ganagold the entire lunch served on a small table close to the fireplace consisted of cold meats and confectionery the captain stuffed me with cakes and undiluted wine he told me of numberless injustices to which he had been a victim he complained particularly of the bourbons and as he neglected to tell me who the bourbons were i got the idea i can't tell how that the bourbons were horse-dealers established at waterloo 
the captain who never interrupted his talk except for the purpose of pouring out wine furthermore made charges against a number of dirty scoundrels blackguards and good-for-nothings whom i did not know anything about but whom i hated from the bottom of my heart at dessert i thought i heard the captain say my father was a man who could be led anywhere by the nose but i am not quite sure that i understood him i had a buzzing in my ears and it seemed to me that the table was dancing my uncle put on his frogged coat took his bell-shaped hat and we descended to the street which seemed to me singularly changed it looked to me as if i had not been in it before for ever so long a time nevertheless when we came to the rue de seine the idea of my doll suddenly returned to my mind and excited me in an extraordinary way my head was on fire i resolved upon a desperate expedient we were passing before the window she was there behind the glass with her red cheeks and her flowered petticoat and her long legs uncle i said with a great effort will you buy that doll for me and i waited buy a doll for a boy sacre bleu cried my uncle in a voice of thunder do you wish to dishonour yourself and it is that old mag there that you want well i must compliment you my young fellow if you grow up with such tastes as that you will never have any pleasure in life and your comrades will call you a precious ninny if you ask me for a sword or a gun my boy i would buy them for you with the last silver crown of my pension but to buy a doll for you by all that's holy to disgrace you never in the world why if i were ever to see you playing with a puppet rigged out like that monsieur my sister's son i would disown you for my nephew on hearing these words i felt my heart so wrung that nothing but pride a diabolical pride kept me from crying my uncle suddenly calming down returned to his ideas about the bourbons but i still smarting under the weight of his indignation felt an unspeakable shame my resolve was quickly made i promised myself never to disgrace myself i firmly and for ever renounced that red-cheeked doll i felt that day for the first time the austere sweetness of sacrifice captain though it be true that all your life you swore like a pagan smoked like a beetle and drank like a bell-ringer be your memory nevertheless honoured not merely because you were a brave soldier but also because you revealed to your little nephew in petticoats the sentiment of heroism pride and laziness had made you almost insupportable uncle victor but a great heart used to beat under those frogs upon your coat you always used to wear i now remember a rose in your buttonhole that rose which you offered so readily to the shop-girls that large open-hearted flower scattering its petals to all the winds was the symbol of your glorious youth you despised neither wine nor tobacco but you despised life neither delicacy nor common sense could have been learned from you captain but you taught me even at an age when my nurse had to wipe my nose a lesson of honour and self-abrogation that i shall never forget you have now been sleeping for many years in the cemetery of montparnasse under a plain slab bearing the epitaph si gite aristide victor maldon capitaine d'infanterie chevalier de la légion d'honneur but such captain was not the inscription devised by yourself to be placed above those old bones of yours knocked about so long on fields of battle and in haunts of pleasure among your papers was found this proud and bitter epitaph which despite your last will none could have ventured to put upon your tomb c'est un brigand de la loire therese we will get a wreath of immortelles to-morrow and lay them on the tomb of the brigand of the loire but therese is not here and how indeed could she be near me seeing that i am at the rond point of the champs-elysees there at the termination of the avenue the arc de triomphe which bears under its vaults the names of uncle victor's companions in arms 
opens its giant gate against the sky the trees of the avenue are unfolding to the sun of spring their first leaves still all pale and chilly beside me the carriages keep rolling by to the bois de boulogne unconsciously i have wandered into this fashionable avenue on my promenade and halted quite stupidly in front of a booth stocked with gingerbread and decanters of licorice water each topped by a lemon a miserable little boy covered with rags which expose his chapped skin stares with widely opened eyes at those sumptuous sweets which are not for such as he with the shamelessness of innocence he betrays his longing his round fixed eyes contemplate a certain gingerbread man of lofty stature it is a general and it looks a little like uncle victor i take it i pay for it and present it to the little pauper who dares not extend his hand to receive it for by reason of precocious experience he cannot believe in luck he looks at me in the same way that certain big dogs do with the air of one saying you are cruel to make fun of me like that come little stupid i say to him in that rough tone i am accustomed to use take it take it and eat it for you happier than i was at your age you can satisfy your tastes without disgracing yourself and you uncle victor you whose manly figure has been recalled to me by that gingerbread general come glorious shadow help me to forget my new doll we remain forever children and are always running after new toys same day in the oddest way that coco family has become associated in my mind with the clerk alexander therese i said as i threw myself into my easy chair tell me if the little coco is well and whether he has got his first teeth yet and bring me my slippers he ought to have them by this time monsieur replied therese but i never saw them the very first fine day of spring the mother disappeared with the child leaving furniture and clothes and everything behind her they found thirty-eight empty pomade pots in the attic it passes all belief she had visitors latterly and you may be quite sure she is not now in a convent of nuns the niece of the concierge says she saw her driving about in a carriage on the boulevards i always told you she would end badly therese i replied that young woman has not ended either badly or well as yet wait until the term of her life is over before you judge her and be careful not to talk too much with that concierge it seemed to me though i only saw her for a moment on the stairs that madame coco was very fond of her child for that mother's love at least she deserves credit as far as that goes monsieur certainly the little one never wanted for anything in all the quarter one could not have found a child better kept or better nourished or more petted and coddled every day that god makes she puts a clean bib on him and sings to him to make him laugh from morning till night therese a poet has said that child whose mother has never smiled upon him is worthy neither of the table of the gods nor of the couch of the goddesses end of section three section four of the crime of sylvestre bonheur by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain july eighth eighteen fifty two having been informed that the chapel of the virgin at saint germain des prés was being repaved i entered the church with the hope of discovering some old inscriptions possibly exposed by the labours of the workmen i was not disappointed the architect kindly showed me a stone which he had just raised up against the wall i knelt down to look at the inscription engraved upon that stone and then half aloud i read in the shadow of the old apsis these words which made my heart leap si just alexandre moine de cesse d'église 
qui fissent mettre en agent le montant de saint vincent et de saint amand et le pied des innocents qui toujours en son vivant fou prodame et vaillante priez pour l'âme de lui i wiped gently away with my handkerchief the dust covering that gravestone i could have kissed it it is he it is alexander i cried out and from the height of the vaults the name fell back upon me with a clang as if broken the silent severity of the beetle whom i saw advancing towards me made me ashamed of my enthusiasm and i fled between the two holy water sprinklers with which two rival rats d'eglise seemed desirous of barring my way at all events it was certainly my own alexander there could be no more doubt possible than translator of the golden legend the author of the saints lives of saint germain vincent ferreo ferroutillon and Droctovius was just as i had supposed a monk of saint germain des prés and what a monk too pious and generous he had a silver chin a silver head and a silver foot made that certain precious remains should be covered with an incorruptible envelope but shall i never be able to view his handiwork or is this new discovery only destined to increase my regrets End of section four section five of the crime of sylvestre bonau by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain august twenty eighteen fifty nine i that please some try all both joy and terror of good and bad that make an unfold error now take upon me in the name of time to use my wings impute it not a crime to me or my swift passage that i slide o'er years who speaks thus tis an old man whom i know too well it is time shakespeare after having terminated the third act of the winter's tale pauses in order to leave time for little perdita to grow up in wisdom and in beauty and when he raises the curtain again he evokes the ancient scythe-bearer upon the stage to render account to the audience of those many long days which have waited down upon the head of the jealous leontes like shakespeare in his play i have left in this diary of mine a long interval to oblivion and after the fashion of the poet i make time himself intervene to explain the omission of ten whole years ten whole years indeed have passed since i wrote one single line in this diary and now that i take up the pen again i have not the pleasure alas to describe a perdita now grown in grace youth and beauty are the faithful companions of poets but those charming phantoms scarcely visit the rest of us even for the space of a season we do not know how to retain them with us if the fairest shade of some perdita should ever through some inconceivable whim take a notion to traverse my brain she would hurt herself horribly against heaps of dog-eared parchments happy the poets their white hairs never scare away the hovering shades of helen's francesca's juliet's julia's and dorothea's but the nose alone of sylvestre bonheur would put to flight the whole swarm of love's heroines yet i like others have felt beauty i have known that mysterious charm which nature has lent to animate form and that clay which lives has given to me that shudder of delight which makes the lover and the poet but i have never known either how to love or how to sing now in my memory all encumbered as it is with the rubbish of old texts i can discern again like a miniature forgotten in some attic a certain bright young face with violet eyes why barnard my friend what an old fool you are becoming read that catalogue which a florentine bookseller sent you this very morning it is a catalogue of manuscripts 
and he promises you a description of several famous ones long preserved by the collectors of italy and sicily there is something better suited to you something more in keeping with your present appearance i read i cry out hamilcar who has assumed with the approach of age an air of gravity that intimidates me looks at me reproachfully and seems to ask me whether there is any rest in this world since he cannot enjoy it beside me who am old also like himself in the sudden joy of my discovery i need a confidant and it is to the sceptic hamilcar that i address myself with all the effusion of a happy man no hamilcar no i said to him there is no rest in this world and the quietude which you long for is incompatible with the duties of life and you say that we are old indeed listen to what i read in this catalogue and then tell me whether this is a time to be reposing la legende dorée de jacques de voragine traduction française du quatorzième siècle par le clerc alexandre superb manuscript ornamented with two miniatures wonderfully executed and in a perfect state of preservation one representing the purification of the virgin the other the coronation of proserpine at the termination of the legende dorée are the legends of saints Ferriol, Verutian, germain and roctovius thirty-eight pages and the miraculous sepulture of m saint germain d'auxerre twelve pages this rare manuscript which formed part of the collection of sir thomas raleigh is now in the private study of signor michelangelo polizzi of gergenti you hear that hamilcar the manuscript of the clerk alexander is in sicily at the house of michelangelo polizzi heaven grant he may be a friend of learned men i am going to write him which i did forthwith in my letter i requested signor polizzi to allow me to examine the manuscript of clerk alexander stating on what grounds i ventured to consider myself worthy of so great a favour i offered at the same time to put at his disposal several unpublished texts in my own possession not devoid of interest i begged him to favour me with a prompt reply and below my signature i wrote down all my honorary titles monsieur monsieur where are you running like that cried therese quite alarmed coming down the stairs in pursuit of me four steps at a time with my hat in her hand i am going to post a letter therese good god is that a way to run out in the street bareheaded like a crazy man i am crazy i know therese but who is not give me my hat quick and your gloves monsieur and your umbrella i had reached the bottom of the stairs but still heard her protesting and lamenting End of section five. Section six of the crime of Sylvestre Bonnard by Anatole France. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. October tenth, eighteen fifty nine. I awaited Signor Polizzi's reply with ill contained impatience. I could not even remain quiet i would make sudden nervous gestures open books and violently close them again one day i happened to upset a book with my elbow a volume of Mohéry. hamilcar who was washing himself suddenly stopped and looked angrily at me with his paw over his ear was this the tumultuous existence he must expect under my roof had there not been a tacit understanding between us that we should live a peaceful life i had broken the covenant my poor dear comrade i made answer i am the victim of a violent passion which agitates and masters me the passions are enemies of peace and quiet i acknowledge but without them there would be no arts or industries in the world everybody would sleep naked on a dung heap and you would not be able hamilcar to repose all day on a silken cushion in the city of books i expatiated no further to hamilcar on the theory of the passions however because my housekeeper brought me a letter it bore the postmark of naples and read as follows most illustrious sir i do indeed possess that incomparable manuscript of the golden legend which could not escape your keen observation all important reasons however 
forbid me imperiously tyrannically to let the manuscript go out of my possession for a single day for even a single minute it will be a joy and pride for me to have you examine it in my humble home in Gergenti, which will be embellished and illuminated by your presence it is with the most anxious expectation of your visit that i presume to sign myself seigneur academician your humble and devoted servant michelangelo polizzi wine merchant and archaeologist at Gurgenti, sicily well then i will go to sicily extremum hunc arethusa mihi concadi laborum end of section six section seven of the crime of sylvestre bonard by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain october twenty five eighteen fifty nine my resolve had been taken and my preparations made it only remained for me to notify my housekeeper i must acknowledge it was a long time before i could make up my mind to tell her i was going away i feared her remonstrances her railleries her objurgations her tears she is a good kind girl i said to myself she is attached to me she will want to prevent me from going and the lord knows that when she has her mind set upon anything gestures and cries cost her no effort in this instance she will be sure to call the concierge the scrubber the mattress-maker and the seven sons of the fruit-seller they will all kneel down in a circle around me they will begin to cry and then they will look so ugly that i shall be obliged to yield so as not to have the pain of seeing them any more such were the awful images the sick dreams which fear marshalled before my imagination yes fear fecund fear as the poet says gave birth to these monstrosities in my brain for i may as well make the confession in these private pages i am afraid of my housekeeper i am aware that she knows i am weak and this fact alone is sufficient to dispel all my courage in any contest with her contests are of frequent occurrence and i invariably succumb but for all that i had to announce my departure to therese she came into the library with an armful of wood to make a little fire un flamme she said for the mornings are chilly i watched her out of the corner of my eye while she crouched down at the hearth with her head in the opening of the fireplace i do not know how i then found the courage to speak but i did so without much hesitation i got up and walking up and down the room observed in a careless tone with that swaggering manner characteristic of cowards by the way therese i am going to sicily having thus spoken i awaited the consequence with great anxiety therese did not reply her head and her vast cap remained buried in the fireplace and nothing in her person which i closely watched betrayed the least emotion she poked some paper under the wood and blew up the fire that was all finally i saw her face again it was calm so calm that it made me vexed surely i thought to myself this old maid has no heart she lets me go away without saying so much as ah can the absence of her old master really affect her so little well then go monsieur she answered at last only be back here by six o'clock there's a dish for dinner to-day which will not wait for anybody end of section seven section eight of the crime of sylvestre bonnard by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain 
naples november tenth eighteen fifty nine Cota cala viva magna e lava a facia. I understand, my friend, for three centimes I can eat, drink, and wash my face, all by means of one of those slices of watermelon you display there on a little table. But occidental prejudices would prevent me from enjoying that simple pleasure freely and frankly, and how could I suck a watermelon? i have enough to do merely to keep on my feet in this crowd what a luminous noisy night in the strada di porto mountains of fruit tower up in the shops illuminated by multi-coloured lanterns upon charcoal furnaces lighted in the open air water boils and steams and ragouts are singing in frying-pans the smell of fried fish and hot meats tickles my nose and makes me sneeze at this moment i find that my handkerchief has left the pocket of my frock-coat i am pushed lifted up and turned about in every direction by the gayest the most talkative the most animated and the most adroit populace possible to imagine and suddenly a young woman of the people while i am admiring her magnificent hair with a single shock of her powerful elastic shoulder pushes me staggering three paces back at least without injury into the arms of a macaroni eater who receives me with a smile i am in naples how i ever managed to arrive here with a few mutilated and shapeless remains of baggage i cannot tell because i am no longer myself i have been travelling in a condition of perpetual fright and i think that i must have looked a while ago in this bright city like an owl bewildered by sunshine to-night it is much worse wishing to obtain a glimpse of popular manners i went to the strada di porto where i now am all about me animated throngs of people crowd and press before the eating-places and i float like a waif among these living surges which even while they submerge you still caress for this neapolitan people has in its very vivacity something indescribably gentle and polite i am not roughly jostled i am merely swayed about and i think that by dint of thus rocking me to and fro these good folks want to lull me asleep on my feet i admire as i tread the lava pavements of the strada those porters and fishermen who move by me chatting singing smoking gesticulating quarrelling and embracing each other the next moment with astonishing versatility of mood they live through all their sense at the same time and being philosophers without knowing it keep the measure of their desires in accordance with the brevity of life i approach a much patronized tavern and see inscribed above the entrance this quatrain in neapolitan patois amice allegra magnamo e bravimo ne fan de che ne che stacca noglio alla lucerna ci sa la lotra muna ne che verdimo ci sa sa lotra muna a ne che taverna friends let us merrily eat and drink as long as oil remains in the lamp who knows if we shall meet again in another world who knows if in the other world there will be a tavern even such counsels was horace wont to give to his friends you received them posthumous you heard them also lucano perverse beauty who wished to know the secrets of the future that future is now the past and we know it well of a truth you were foolish to worry yourselves about so small a matter and your friend showed his good sense when he told you to take life wisely and to filter your greek wines sapius vena liquis even thus the sight of a fair land under a spotless sky urges to the pursuit of quiet pleasures but there are souls for ever harassed by some sublime discontent those are the noblest you were of such lucono and i visiting for the first time in my declining years that city where your beauty was famed of old i salute with deep respect your melancholy memory those souls of kin to your own who appeared in the age of christianity were souls of saints and the golden legend is full of the miracles they wrought your friend horace left a less noble posterity and i see one of his descendants in the person of that tavern poet who at this moment is serving out wine in cups under the epicurean motto of his sign and yet life decides in favour of friend 
flaccus and his philosophy is the only one which adapts itself to the course of events there is a fellow leaning against that trellis-work covered with vine leaves and eating an ice while watching the stars he would not stoop even to pick up the old manuscript i am going to seek with so much trouble and fatigue and in the truth man is made rather to eat ices than to pour over old texts i continued to wander about among the drinkers and the singers there were lovers biting into beautiful fruit each with an arm about the other's waist man must be naturally bad for all this strange joy only evoked in me a feeling of uttermost despondency that thronging populace displayed such artless delight in the simple act of living that all the shynesses begotten by my old habits as an author awoke and intensified into something like fright furthermore i found myself much discouraged by my inability to understand a word of all the storm of chatter about me it was a humiliating experience for a philologist thus i had begun to feel quite sulky when i was startled to hear someone behind me observe dmitri that old man is certainly a frenchman he looks so bewildered and i really feel sorry for him shall i speak to him he has such a goo-natured look with that round back of his do you not think so dmitri it was said in french by a woman's voice for the moment it was disagreeable to hear myself spoken of as an old man is a man old at sixty-two only the other day on the pont des arts my colleague perrot de avrignac complimented me on my youthful appearance and i should think him a better authority about one's age than that young chatterbox who has taken it on herself to make remarks about my back my back is round she says ah ah i had some suspicion myself to that effect but i am not going now to believe it at all since it is the opinion of a giddy-headed young woman certainly i will not turn my head around to see who it was that spoke but i am sure it was a pretty woman why because she talks like a capricious person and like a spoiled child ugly women may be naturally quite as capricious as pretty ones but as they are never petted and spoiled and as no allowances are made for them they soon find themselves obliged either to suppress their whims or to hide them on the other hand the pretty women can be just as fantastical as they please my neighbour is evidently one of the latter but after all coming to think it over she really did nothing worse than to express in her own way a kindly thought about me for which i ought to feel grateful these reflections include the last and decisive one pass through my mind in less than a second and if i have taken a whole minute to tell them it is characteristic of most philologists in less than a second therefore after the voice had ceased i did turn round and saw a pretty little woman a sprightly brunette madame i said with a bow excuse my involuntary indiscretion i could not help overhearing what you have just said you would like to be of service to a poor old man and the wish madame has already been fulfilled the mere sound of a french voice has given me such pleasure that i must thank you i bowed again and turned to go away but my foot slipped upon a melon rind and i should certainly have embraced the parthenopean soil had not the young lady put out her hand and caught me there is a force in circumstances even of the very smallest circumstances against which resistance is vain i resigned myself to remain the protege of the fair unknown it is late she said do you not wish to go back to your hotel which must be quite close to ours unless it be the same one madame i replied i do not know what time it is because somebody has stolen my watch but i think as you say that it must be time to retire and i shall be very glad to regain my hotel in the company of such courteous compatriots so saying i bowed once more to the young lady and also saluted her companion a silent colossus with a gentle and melancholy face after having gone a little way with them i learned among other matters that my new acquaintances were the prince and princess tripoff and that they were making a trip round the world for the purpose of finding match-boxes of which they were making a collection we proceeded along a narrow tortuous vicholetto lighted only by a single lamp burning in the niche of a madonna the purity and transparency of the air gave a celestial softness and clearness to the very darkness itself and one could find one's way without difficulty under such a limpid night but in a little while we began to pass through a vinalia or in neapolitan parlance a sotto portico which led under so many archways and so many far projecting balconies that no gleam of light from the sky could reach us 
my young guide had made us take this route as a short cut she assured us but i think she did so quite as much simply in order to show that she felt at home in naples and knew the city thoroughly indeed she needed to know it very thoroughly to venture by night into the labyrinth of subterranean alleys and flights of steps if ever any many showed absolute docility in allowing himself to be guided that man was myself dante never followed the steps of beatrice with more confidence than i felt in following those of princess Trepoff the lady appeared to find some pleasure in my conversation for she invited me to take a carriage drive with her on the morrow to visit the grotto of Pasolippo and the tomb of virgil she declared she had seen me somewhere before but she could not remember if it had been a stockholm or at canton in the former event i was a very celebrated professor of geology in the latter a provision merchant whose courtesy and kindness had been much appreciated one thing certain was that she had seen my back somewhere before excuse me she added we are continually travelling my husband and i to collect match-boxes and to change our ennui by changing country perhaps it would be more reasonable to content ourselves with a single variety of ennui but we have made all our preparations and arrangements for travelling all our plans have been laid out in advance and it gives us no trouble whereas it would be very troublesome for us to stop anywhere in particular i tell you all this so that you may not be surprised if my recollections have become a little mixed up but from the moment i first saw you at a distance this evening i felt in fact i knew that i had seen you before now the question is where was it that i saw you you are not then either the geologist or the provision merchant no madame i replied i am neither the one nor the other and i am sorry for it since you have had reason to esteem them there is really nothing about me worthy of your interest i have spent all my life poring over books and i have never travelled you might have known that from my bewilderment which excited your compassion i am a member of the institute you are a member of the institute how nice will you not write something for me in my album do you know chinese i would like so much to have you write something in chinese or persian in my album i will introduce you to my friend miss ferguson who travels everywhere to see all the famous people in the world she will be delighted dmitri did you hear that this gentleman is a member of the institute and he has passed all his life over books the prince nodded approval monsieur i said trying to engage him in our conversation it is true that something can be learned from books but a great deal more can be learned by travelling and i regret that i have not been able to go round the world like you i have lived in the same house for thirty years and i scarcely ever go out lived in the same house for thirty years cried madame trepoff is it possible yes madame i answered but you must know the house is situated on the bank of the seine and in the very handsomest and most famous part of the world from my window i can see the tuileries and the louvre the pont neuf the towers of notre dame the turrets of the palais de justice and the spire of the saint chapelle all those stones speak to me they tell me stories about the days of saint louis of the valois of henri quatre and of louis quatorze i understand them and i love them all it is only a very small corner of the world but honestly madam where is there a more glorious spot at this moment we found ourselves upon a public square a largo steeped in the soft glow of the night madame Trepoff looked at me in an uneasy manner her lifted eyebrows almost touched the black curls about her forehead where do you live then she demanded brusquely on the quai malaquais madame and my name is bonnard it is not a name very widely known but i am contented if my friends do not forget it this revelation unimportant as it was produced an extraordinary effect upon madame trepoff she immediately turned her back upon me and caught her husband's arm come dmitri she exclaimed do walk a little faster i am horribly tired and you will not hurry yourself in the least we shall never get home as for you monsieur your way lies over there she made a vague gesture in the direction of some dark vicolo pushed her husband the opposite way and called to me without even turning her head adieu monsieur we shall not go to Pasilipo to-morrow nor the day after either i have a frightful headache dmitri you are unendurable will you not walk faster i remained for the moment stupefied vainly trying to think what i could have done to offend madame Trepoff, but i had also lost my way and seemed doomed to wander about all night in order to ask my way i would have to see somebody and it did not seem likely that i should find a single human being who could understand me in my despair i entered a street at random a street or rather a horrible alley that had the look of a murderous place it proved so in fact for i had not been two minutes in it before i saw two men fighting with knives 
they were attacking each other more fiercely with their tongues than with their weapons and i concluded from the nature of the abuse they were showering upon each other that it was a love affair i prudently made my way into a side alley while those two good fellows were still much too busy with their own affairs to think about mine i wandered hopelessly about for a while and at last sat down completely discouraged on a stone bench inwardly cursing the strange caprices of madame Trepoff. how are you signor are you back from san carlo did you hear the diva sing it is only at naples you can hear singing like hers i looked up and recognized my host i had seated myself with my back to the facade of my hotel under the window of my own room End of section eight. Section nine of the crime of Sylvestre Bonald by Anatole France. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Montalegro, November thirty, eighteen fifty nine. We were all resting, myself, my guides, and their mules on a road from Schiaccia to Gergenti at a tavern in the miserable village of Montalegro, whose inhabitants, consumed by the mal aurea, continually shiver in the sun. But nevertheless they are Greeks, and their gaiety triumphs over all circumstances. A few gather about the tavern, full of smiling curiosity, one good story would have sufficed had i known how to tell it to them to make them forget all the woes of life they had all a look of intelligence and their women although tanned and faded wore their long black cloaks with much grace before me i could see old ruins whitened by the sea-wind ruins about which no grass ever grows the dismal melancholy of deserts prevails over this arid land whose cracked surface can barely nourish a few shrivelled mimosas cacti and dwarf palms twenty yards away along the course of a ravine stones were gleaming whitely like a long line of scattered bones they told me that was the bed of a stream i had been fifteen days in sicily on coming into the bay of palermo which opens between the two mighty naked masses of the pellegrino and the catalfano and extends inward along the golden conch the view inspired me with such admiration that i resolved to travel a little in this island so ennobled by historic memories and rendered so beautiful by the outlines of its hills which reveal the principles of greek art old pilgrim though i was grown hoary in the gothic occident i dared to venture upon that classic soil and securing a guide i went from palermo to trapani from trapani to silenante from silenante to schiaccia which i left this morning to go to gergenti where i am to find the manuscript of clerk alexander the beautiful things i have seen are still so vivid in my mind that i feel the task of writing them would be a useless fatigue why spoil my pleasure trip by collecting notes lovers who love truly do not write down their happiness wholly absorbed by the melancholy of the present and the poetry of the past my thoughts people with beautiful shapes and my eyes ever gratified by the pure and harmonious lines of the landscape i was resting in the tavern at montalegro sipping a glass of heavy fiery wine when i saw two persons enter the waiting-room whom after a moment's hesitation i recognized as the prince and princess Trepoff this time i saw the princess in the light and what a light he who has known that of sicily can better comprehend the words of sophocles o oh, holy light i of the golden day madame trepoff dressed in a brown holland and wearing a broad-brimmed straw hat appeared to me a very pretty woman of about twenty-eight her eyes were luminous as a child's but her slightly plump chin indicated the age of plenitude she is i must confess it quite an attractive person she is supple and changeful her mood is like water itself and thank heaven i am no navigator i thought i discerned in her manner a sort of ill-humour which i attributed presently by reason of some observations she uttered at random to the fact that she had met no brigands upon her route such things only happen to us she exclaimed with a gesture of discouragement she called for a glass of iced water which the landlord presented to her with a gesture that recalled to me those scenes of funeral offerings painted upon greek vases 
i was in no hurry to introduce myself to a lady who had so abruptly dropped my acquaintance in the public square at naples but she perceived me in my corner and her frown notified me very plainly that our accidental meeting was disagreeable to her after she had sipped her ice-water for a few moments whether because her whim had suddenly changed or because my loneliness aroused her pity i did not know she walked directly to me good day monsieur bonnard she said how do you do what strange chance enables us to meet again in this frightful country this country is not frightful madame i replied beauty is so great and so august a quality that centuries of barbarism cannot efface it so completely that adorable vestiges of it will not always remain the majesty of the antique series still overshadows these arid valleys and that greek muse who made arethusa and menalus ring with her divine accents still sings for my ears upon the barren mountain and in the place of the dried-up spring yes madam when our globe no longer inhabited shall like the moon roll a wan corpse through space the soil which bears the ruins of silenante will still keep the seal of beauty in the midst of universal death and then then at least there will be no frivolous mouth to blaspheme the grandeur of these solitudes i knew well enough that my words were beyond the comprehension of that pretty little empty head which heard them but an old fellow like myself who has worn out his life over books does not know how to adapt his tone to circumstances besides i wished to give madame trepoff a lesson in politeness she received it with so much submission and with such an air of comprehension that i hastened to add as good-naturedly as possible as to whether the chance which has enabled me to meet you again be lucky or unlucky i cannot decide the question until i am sure that my presence be not disagreeable to you you appeared to become weary of my company very suddenly at naples the other day i can only attribute that misfortune to my naturally unpleasant manner since on that occasion i had had the honour of meeting you for the first time in my life these words seemed to cause her inexplicable joy she smiled upon me in the most gracious mischievous way and said very earnestly holding out her hand which i touched with my lips monsieur bernard do not refuse to accept a seat in my carriage you can chat with me on the way about antiquity and that will amuse me ever so much my dear exclaimed the prince you can do just as you please but you ought to remember that one is horribly cramped in that carriage of yours and i fear that you are only offering monsieur bonnard the chance of getting a frightful attack of lumbago madame trepoff simply shook her head by way of explaining that such considerations had no weight with her whatever then she untied her hat the darkness of her black curls descended over her eyes and bathed them in a velvety shadow she remained a little while quite motionless and her face assumed a surprising expression of reverie but all of a sudden she darted at some oranges which the tavern-keeper had brought in a basket and began to throw them one by one into a fold of her dress these will be nice on the road she said we are going just where you are going to giganti i must tell you all about it you know that my husband is making a collection of match-boxes we bought thirteen hundred match-boxes at marseilles but we heard there was a factory of them at giganti according to what we were told it is a very small factory and its products which are very ugly never go outside the city and its suburbs so we are going to giganti just to buy match-boxes dmitri has been a collector of all sorts of things but the only kind of collection which can now interest him is a collection of match-boxes he has already got five thousand two hundred and fourteen different kinds some of them gave us frightful trouble to find for instance we knew that at naples boxes were once made with the portraits of mazzini and garibaldi on them and that the police had seized the plates from which the portraits were printed and put the manufacturer in jail well by dint of searching and inquiring for ever so long a while we found one of those boxes at last for sale at one hundred francs instead of two sous it was not really too dear at that price but we were denounced for buying it we were taken for conspirators all our baggage was searched they could not find the box because i had hidden it so well but they found my jewels and carried them off they have them still the incident made quite a sensation and we were going to get arrested but the king was displeased about it and he ordered them to leave us alone up to that time i used to think it was very stupid to collect match-boxes but when i found that there were risks of losing liberty and perhaps even life by doing it i began to feel a taste for it now i am an absolute fanatic on the subject we are going to sweden next summer to complete our series are we not dmitri 
i felt must i confess it a thorough sympathy with these intrepid collectors no doubt i would rather have found m and madame trepoff engaged in collecting antique marbles or painted vases in sicily i should have like to have found them interested in the ruins of syracuse or the poetical traditions of the erics but at all events they were making some sort of a collection they belonged to the great confraternity and i could not possibly make fun of them without making fun of myself besides madame trepoff had spoken of her collection with such an odd mingling of irony and enthusiasm that i could not help finding the idea a very good one we were getting ready to leave the tavern when we noticed some people coming downstairs from the upper room carrying carbines under their dark cloaks to me they had the look of thorough bandits and after they were gone i told m trepoff my opinion of them he answered me very quietly that he also thought they were regular bandits and the guides begged us to apply for an escort of gendarmes but madame trepoff besought us not to do anything of the kind she declared that we must not spoil her journey then turning her persuasive eyes upon me she asked do you not believe monsieur bernard that there is nothing in life worth having except sensations why certainly madame i answered but then we must take into consideration the nature of the sensations themselves those which a noble memory or a grand spectacle creates within us certainly represent what is best in human life but those merely resulting from the menace of danger seem to me sensations which one should be very careful to avoid as much as possible for example would you think it a very pleasant thing madame while travelling over the mountains at midnight to find the muzzle of a carbine suddenly pressed against your forehead oh no she replied the comic operas have made carbines absolutely ridiculous and it would be a great misfortune to any young woman to find herself in danger from an absurd weapon but it would be quite different with a knife a very cold and very bright knife blade which makes a cold shudder go right through one's heart she shuddered even as she spoke closed her eyes and threw her head back then she resumed people like you are so happy you can interest yourselves in all sorts of things she gave a sidelong look at her husband who was talking with the innkeeper then she leaned towards me and murmured very low you see dmitri and i we are both suffering from ennui we have still the match-boxes but at last one gets tired even of match-boxes besides our collection will soon be complete and then what are we going to do oh madame i exclaimed touched by the moral unhappiness of this pretty person if you only had a son then you would know what to do you would then learn the purpose of your life and your thoughts would become at once more serious and yet more cheerful but i have a son she replied he is a big boy he is eleven years old and he suffers from ennui like the rest of us yes my george has ennui too he is tired of everything it is very wretched she glanced again towards her husband who was superintending the harnessing of the mules on the road outside testing the condition of girths and straps then she asked me whether there had been many changes on the quai malaque during the past ten years she declared she never visited that neighbourhood because it was too far away too far from montalegro i queried why no she replied too far from the avenue des champs elysees where we live and she murmured over again as if talking to herself too far too far in a tone of reverie which i could not possibly account for all at once she smiled again and said to me i like you monsieur bernard i like you very very much the mules had been harnessed the young woman hastily picked up a few oranges which had rolled off her lap rose up looked at me and burst out laughing oh she exclaimed how i should like to see you grappling with the brigands you would say such extraordinary things to them please take my hat and hold my umbrella for me monsieur bonnard what a strange little mind i thought to myself as i followed her it could only have been in a moment of inexcusable thoughtlessness that nature gave a child to such a giddy little woman End of section nine Section 10 of The Crime of Sylvestre Bonnard by Anatole France. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Girgenti, same day. Her manners had shocked me. I left her to arrange herself in her letica, and I made myself as comfortable as I could in my own. These vehicles, which have no wheels, are carried by two mules, one before and one behind this kind of litter or chaise is of ancient origin 
i had often seen representations of similar ones in the french manuscripts of the fourteenth century i had no idea then that one of those vehicles would be at a future day placed at my own disposal we must never be too sure of anything for three hours the mules sounded their little bells and thumped the calcined ground with their hoofs on either hand there slowly defiled by us the barren monstrous shapes of a nature totally african halfway we made a halt to allow our animals to recover breath madame trepoff came to me on the road took my arm and drew me a little away from the party then very suddenly she said to me in a tone of voice i had never heard before do not think that i am a wicked woman my george knows that i am a good mother we walked side by side for a moment in silence she looked up and i saw that she was crying madame i said to her look at this soil which has been burned and cracked by five long months of fiery heat a little white lily has sprung up up from it and i pointed with my cane to the frail stalk tipped by a double blossom your heart i said however arid it be bears also its white lily and that is reason enough why i do not believe that you are what you say a wicked woman yes 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 she cried with the obstinacy of a child i am a wicked woman but i am ashamed to appear so before you who are so good so very very good you do not know anything at all about it i said to her i know it i know all about you monsieur bonnard she declared with a smile and she jumped back into her letica end of section ten section eleven of the crime of sylvester bonnard by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain dear genti november thirty eighteen fifty nine i woke the following morning in the house of gellius gellius was a rich citizen of ancient agrigentum he was equally celebrated for his generosity and for his wealth and he endowed his native city with a great number of free inns gellius has been dead for thirteen hundred years and nowadays there is no gratuitous hospitality among civilized peoples but the name of gellius has become that of a hotel in which by reason of fatigue i was able to obtain one good night's sleep the modern girgenti lifts its high narrow solid streets dominated by a sombre spanish cathedral upon the side of the acropolis of the antique agrigentum i can see from my windows half way on the hillside towards the sea the white range of temples partially destroyed the ruins alone have some aspect of coolness all the rest is arid water and life have forsaken agrigentine water the divine nestus of the agrigentine empedocles is so necessary to animated beings that nothing can live far from the rivers and the springs but the port of girgenti situated at a distance of three kilometres from the city has a great commerce and it is in this dismal city i said to myself upon this precipitous rock that the manuscript of clerk alexander is to be found i asked my way to the house of signor michael angelo polizzi and proceeded thither i found signor polizzi dressed all in white from head to feet busy cooking sausages in a frying-pan at the sight of me he let go the frying-pan threw up his arms in the air and uttered shrieks of enthusiasm he was a little man whose pimply features aquiline nose round eyes and projecting chin formed a very expressive physiognomy he called me excellence said he was going to mark the day with a white stone and made me sit down the hall in which we were represented the union of the kitchen reception-room bedchamber studio and wine-cellar there were charcoal furnaces visible a bed paintings an easel bottles strings of onions and a magnificent lustre of coloured glass pendants i glanced at the paintings on the wall the arts the arts cried signor polizzi throwing up his arms again to heaven the arts what dignity what consolation excellence i am a painter 
and he showed me an unfinished st francis which indeed could very well remain unfinished for ever without any loss to religion or to art next he showed me some old paintings of a better style but apparently restored after a decidedly reckless manner i repair he said i repair old paintings oh the old masters what genius what soul why then i said to him you must be a painter an archaeologist and a wine merchant all in one at your service excellency answered i have a zaccio here at this very moment a zaccio of which every single drop is a pearl of fire i want your lordship to taste of it i esteem the wines of sicily i responded but it was not for the sake of your flagons that i came to see you signor polizzi he then you have come to see me about paintings you are an amateur it is an immense delight for me to receive amateurs i am going to show you the chef d'oeuvre of montrealise yes excellence his chef d'oeuvre an adoration of shepherds it is the pearl of the whole sicilian school i later on i will be glad to see the chef d'oeuvre but let us first talk about the business which brings me here his little quick bright eyes watched my face curiously and i perceived with anguish that he had not the least suspicion of the purpose of my visit a cold sweat broke out over my forehead and in the bewilderment of my anxiety i stammered out something to this effect i have come from paris expressly to look at a manuscript of the legende dore which you informed me was in your possession at these words he threw up his arms opened his mouth and eyes to the widest possible extent and betrayed every sign of extreme nervousness oh the manuscript of the golden legend a pearl excellence a ruby a diamond two miniatures so perfect that they give one the feeling of glimpses of paradise what suavity those colours ravished from the corollas of flowers make a honey for the eyes even a sicilian could have done no better let me see it then i ask unable to conceal either my anxiety or my hope let you see it cried polizzi but how can i excellence i have not got it any longer i have not got it and he seemed determined to tear out his hair he might indeed have pulled every hair in his head out of his hide before i should have tried to prevent him but he stopped of his own accord before he had done himself any grievous harm what i cried out in anger what you make me come all the way from paris to Gurgenti by promising to show me a manuscript and now when i come you tell me you have not got it it is simply infamous monsieur i shall leave your conduct to be judged by all honest men anybody who could have seen me at that moment would have been able to form a good idea of the aspect of a furious sheep it is infamous it is infamous i repeated waving my arms which trembled from anger then michelangelo polizzi let himself fall into a chair in the attitude of a dying hero i saw his eyes fill with tears and his hair until then flamboyant and erect upon his head fall down in limp disorder over his brow i am a father excellence i am a father he groaned wringing his hands he continued sobbing my son raphael the son of my poor wife for whose death i have been mourning fifteen years raphael excellence wanted to settle at paris he hired a shop in the rue lafitte for the sale of curiosities i gave him everything precious which i had i gave him my finest majalikas but my most beautiful urbino where my masterpieces of art what paintings signor even now they dazzle me with i see them only in imagination and all of them signed finally i gave him the manuscript of the golden legend i would have given him my flesh and my blood and only son signor the son of my poor saintly wife so i said while i relying on your written word monsieur was travelling to the very heart of sicily to find the manuscript of the clerk alexander the same manuscript was actually exposed for sale in the window in the rue lafitte only fifteen hundred yards from my house yes it was there that is positively true exclaimed signor polizzi suddenly growing calm again and it is there still at least i hope it is excellence he took a card from a shelf as he spoke and offering it to me saying here is the address of my son make it known to your friends and you will oblige me faience and enamelled wares hangings pictures he has a complete stock of objects of art all at the fairest possible prices and everything authentic i can vouch for it upon my honour go and see him he will show you the manuscript of the golden legend two miniatures miraculously fresh in colour i was feeble enough to take the card he held out to me the fellow was taking further advantage of my weakness to make me circulate the name of raphael polizzi among the societies of the learned my hand was already on the doorknob when the sicilian caught me by the arm he had a look as of sudden inspiration ah excellence he cried what a city is this city of ours he gave birth to empedocles empedocles what a great man what a great citizen what audacity of thought what virtue what soul at the port over there is a statue of empedocles before which i bear my head each time that i pass by 
when raphael my son was going away to found an establishment of antiquities in the rue lafitte at paris i took him to the port and there at the foot of that statue of empedocles i bestowed upon him my paternal benediction always remember empedocles i said to him ah signor what our unhappy country needs to-day is a new empedocles would you not like me to show you the way to his statue excellence i will be your guide among the ruins here i will show you the temple of castor and pollux the temple of the olympian jupiter the temple of the lucinian juno the antique well the tomb of theron and the gate of gold all the professional guides are asses but we we shall make excavations if you are willing and we shall discover treasures i know the science of discovering hidden treasures the secret art of finding their whereabouts a gift from heaven i succeeded in tearing myself away from his grasp but he ran after me again stopped me at the foot of the stairs and said in my ear listen excellence i will conduct you about the city i will introduce you to some gentines what a race what types what forms sicilian girls signor the antique beauty itself go to the devil i cried at last in anger and rushed into the street leaving him still writhing in the loftiness of his enthusiasm when i had got out of his sight i sank down upon a stone and began to think with my face in my hands and it was for this i said to him myself it was to hear such propositions as this that i came to sicily that polizzi is simply a scoundrel and his son another and they made a plan together to ruin me but what was their scheme i could not unravel it meanwhile it may be imagined how discouraged and humiliated i felt a merry burst of laughter caused me to turn my head and i saw madame trepoff running in advance of her husband and holding up something which i could not distinguish clearly she sat down beside me and showed me laughing more merrily all the while an abominable little pasteboard box on which was printed a red and blue face which the inscription declared to be the face of empedocles yes madame i said but the abominable polizzi to whom i advise you not to send m trepoff has made me fall out for ever with empedocles and this portrait is not at all of a nature to make me feel more kindly to the ancient philosopher oh declared madame trepoff it is ugly but it is rare these boxes are not exported at all you can buy them only where they are made dmitri has six others just like this in his pocket we got them so as to exchange with other collectors you understand at nine o'clock this morning we were at the factory you see we did not waste our time so i certainly perceived madame i replied bitterly but i have lost mine i then saw that she was a naturally good-hearted woman all her merriment vanished poor monsieur bernard poor monsieur bernard she murmured and taking my hand in hers she added tell me about your troubles i told her about them my story was long but she was evidently touched by it for she asked me quite a number of circumstantial questions which i took for proof of her friendly interest she wanted to know the exact title of the manuscript its shape its appearance and its age she asked me for the address of signor raphael polizzi and i gave it to her thus doing o oh, destiny precisely what the abominable polizzi had told me to do it is sometimes difficult to check oneself i recommenced my plaints and my imprecations but this time madame trepoff only burst out laughing why do you laugh i asked her because i am a wicked woman she answered and she fled away leaving me all disheartened on my stone End of section eleven section twelve of the crime of sylvestre bonheur by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain paris december eighth eighteen fifty nine my unpacked trunk still encumbered the hall i was seated at a table cover with all those good things which the land of france produces for the delectation of gourmets i was eating a pate le chartre which is alone sufficient to make one love one's country therese standing before me with her hands joined over her white apron was looking at me with benignity with anxiety and with pity hamilcar was rubbing himself against my legs wild with delight these words of an old poet came back to my memory happy is he who like ulysses hath made a goodly journey well i thought to myself i travelled to no purpose i have come back with empty hands but like ulysses i made a goodly journey and having taken my last sip of coffee i asked therese for my hat and cane which she gave me not without dire suspicions she feared i might be going upon another journey but i reassured her by telling her to have dinner ready at six o'clock 
it had always been a keen pleasure for me to breathe the air in those parisian streets whose every paving slab and every stone i loved devotedly but i had an end in view and i took my way straight to the rue lafitte i was not long in finding the establishment of signor raphael polizzi it was distinguishable by a great display of old paintings which although all bearing the signature of some illustrious artist had a certain family air of resemblance that might have suggested some touching idea about the fraternity of genius had it not still more forcibly suggested the professional tricks of polizzi senior enriched by these doubtful works of art the shop was further rendered attractive by various petty curiosities poignards drinking vessels goblets figurines brass and irons and hispano-arabian wares of metallic lustre upon a portuguese armchair decorated with an escutcheon lay a copy of the hure of simon Varstre, open at the page which has an astrological figure on it and an old vitruvius placed upon a quaint chest displayed its masterly engravings of caryatids and telemones this apparent disorder which only masked cunning arrangement this factitious hazard which had placed the best objects in the most favourable light would have increased my distrust of the place but that the distrust which the mere name of police had already inspired could not have been increased by any circumstances being already infinite signor raphael who sat there as the presiding genius of all these vague and incongruous shapes impressed me as a phlegmatic young man with a sort of english character he betrayed no sign whatever of those transcendent faculties displayed by his father in the arts of mimicry and declamation i told him what i had come for he opened a cabinet and drew from it a manuscript which he placed on a table that i might examine it at my leisure never in my life did i experience such an emotion except indeed during some few brief months of my youth months whose memories though i should live a hundred years would remain as fresh at my last hour as in the first day they came to me it was indeed the very manuscript described by the librarian of sir thomas raleigh it was indeed the manuscript of the clerk alexander which i saw which i touched the work of voragine himself had been perceptibly abridged but that made little difference to me all the inestimable editions of the monk of st germain des prés were there that was the main point i tried to read the legend of st droctovius but i could not all the lines of the page quivered before my eyes and there was a sound in my ears like the noise of a windmill in the country at night nevertheless i was able to see that the manuscript offered every evidence of indubitable authenticity the true drawings of the purification of the virgin and the coronation of proserpine were meagre in design and vulgar in violence of colouring considerably damaged in eighteen twenty four as attested by the catalogue of sir thomas they had obtained during the interval a new aspect of freshness but this miracle did not surprise me at all and besides what did i care about the two miniatures the legends and the poem of alexander those alone formed the treasure i desired my eyes devoured as much of it as they had the power to absorb i affected indifference while asking signor polizzi the price of the manuscript and while awaiting his reply i offered up a secret prayer that the price might not exceed the amount of ready money at my disposal already much diminished by the cost of my expensive voyage signor polizzi however informed me that he was not at liberty to dispose of the article inasmuch as it did not belong to him and was to be sold at auction shortly at the hotel des vents with a number of other manuscripts and several incunabula this was a severe blow to me i tried to preserve my calmness notwithstanding and replied somewhat to this effect you surprise me monsieur your father whom i talked with recently at Giugenti, told me positively that the manuscript was yours you cannot now attempt to make me discredit your father's word i did own the manuscript indeed answered signor raphael with absolute frankness but i do not own it any longer i sold that manuscript the remarkable interest of which you have not failed to perceive to an amateur whom i am forbidden to name and who for reasons which i am not at liberty to mention finds himself obliged to sell his collection i am honoured with the confidence of my customer and was commissioned by him to draw up the catalogue and manage the sale which takes place the twenty fourth of december now if you will be kind enough to give me your address i shall have the pleasure of sending you the catalogue which is already in the press you will find the legende dorée described in it as number forty two 
i gave my address and left the shop the polite gravity of the son impressed me quite as disagreeably as the impudent buffoonery of the father i hated from the bottom of my heart the tricks of the vile hagglers it was perfectly evident that the two rascals had a secret understanding and had only devised this auction sale with the aid of a professional appraiser to force the bidding on the manuscript i wanted so much up to an outrageous figure i was completely at their mercy there is one evil in all passionate desires even the noblest namely that they leave us subject to the will of others and in so far dependent this reflection made me suffer cruelly but it did not conquer my longing to win the work of clerk alexander while i was thus meditating i heard a coachman swear and i discovered it was i whom he was swearing at only when i felt the pole of a carriage poke me in the ribs i started aside barely in time to save myself from being run over and whom did i perceive through the windows of the coupe madame trepoff being taken by two beautiful horses and a coachman all wrapped up in furs like a russian boyard into the very street i had just left she did not notice me she was laughing to herself with that artless grace of expression which still preserved for her at thirty years all the charm of her early youth well well i said to myself she is laughing i suppose she must have just found another match-box and i made my way back to the pont feeling very miserable nature eternally indifferent neither hastened nor hurried the twenty-fourth day of december i went to the hotel bouillon and took my place in salle number four immediately below the high desk at which the auctioneer blues and the expert polizzi were to sit i saw the hall gradually fill with familiar faces i shook hands with several old booksellers of the keys but that prudence which any large interest inspires in even the most self-assured caused me to keep silence in regard to the reason of my unaccustomed presence in the halls of the hotel bouillon on the other hand i questioned those gentlemen at the auction sale and I had the satisfaction of finding them all interested about matters in no wise related to my affair little by little the hall became thronged with interested or merely curious spectators and after half an hour's delay the auctioneer with his ivory hammer the clerk with his bundle of memorandum papers and the crier carrying his collection box fixed to the end of a pole all took their places on the platform in the most solemn business manner the attendants ranged themselves at the foot of the desk the presiding officer having declared the sale open a partial hush followed a commonplace series of presidia with miniatures were first sold off at mediocre prices needless to say the illuminations of these books were in perfect condition the lowness of the bids gave courage to the gathering of second-hand booksellers present who began to mingle with us and become more familiar the dealers in old brass and bric-a-brac pressed forward in their turn waiting for the doors of an adjoining room to be opened and the voice of the auctioneer was drowned by the jests of the auvergnat a magnificent codex of the guerre des juifs revived attention it was long disputed for five thousand francs five thousand cried the crier while the bric-a-brac dealers remained silent with admiration then seven or eight antiphonaries brought us back again to low prices a fat old woman in a loose gown bareheaded a dealer in second-hand goods encouraged by the size of the books and the low prices bidden had one of the antiphonaries knocked down to her for thirty francs at last the expert police see, announced number forty two the golden legend french manuscript unpublished two superb miniatures with a starting bid of three thousand francs three thousand three thousand bid yelled the crier three thousand dryly repeated the auctioneer there was a buzzing in my head and as through a cloud i saw a host of curious faces all turning towards the manuscript which a boy was carrying open through the audience three thousand and fifty i said i was frightened by the sound of my own voice and further confused by seeing or thinking that i saw all eyes turned on me three thousand and fifty on the right called the crier taking up my bid three thousand one hundred responded signor polizzi then began a heroic duel between the expert and myself three thousand five hundred six hundred seven hundred four thousand four thousand five hundred then by a sudden bold stroke signor polizzi raised the bid at once to six thousand six thousand francs was all the money i could dispose of it represented the possible i risked the impossible six thousand one hundred alas even the impossible did not suffice six thousand five hundred replied signor polizzi with calm i bowed my head and sat there stupefied unable to answer either yes or no to the crier who called to me six thousand five hundred by me not by you on the right there it is my bid no mistake six thousand five hundred perfectly understood declared the auctioneer six thousand five hundred perfectly clear perfectly plain any more bids 
the last bid is six thousand five hundred francs a solemn silence prevailed suddenly i felt as if my head had burst open it was the hammer of the officiant who with a loud blow on the platform adjudged number forty two irrevocably to signor polizzi forthwith the pen of the clerk coursing over the papier tombe registered that great fact in a single line i was absolutely prostrated and i felt the utmost need of rest and quiet nevertheless i did not leave my seat my powers of reflection slowly returned hope is tenacious i had one more hope it occurred to me that the new owner of the legendre might be some intelligent and liberal bibliophile who would allow me to examine the manuscript and perhaps even to publish the more important parts and with this idea as soon as the sale was over i approached the expert as he was leaving the platform monsieur i asked him did you buy in number forty two on your own account or on commission on commission i was instructed said not to let it go at any price can you tell me the name of the purchaser monsieur i regret that i cannot serve you in that respect i have been strictly forbidden to mention the name i went home in despair End of section twelve section thirteen of the crime of sylvestre bonheur by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain december thirty eighteen fifty nine therese don't you hear the bell somebody has been ringing at the door for the last quarter of an hour therese does not answer she is chattering downstairs with the concierge for sure so that is the way you observe your old master's birthday you desert me even on the eve of saint sylvestre alas if i am to hear any kind wishes to-day they must come up from the ground for all who love me have long been buried i really don't know what i am still living for there is the bell again i get up slowly from my seat at the fire with my shoulders still bent from stooping over it and go to the door myself whom do i see at the threshold it is not a dripping love and i am not an old anacreon but it is a very pretty little boy of about ten years old he is alone he raises his face to look at me his cheeks are blushing but his little pert nose gives one an idea of mischievous pleasantry he has feathers in his cap and a great lace ruff on his jacket the pretty little fellow he holds in both arms a bundle as big as himself and asks me if i am monsieur sylvestre bonheur i tell him yes he gives me the bundle tells me his mamma sent it to me and then he runs downstairs i go down a few steps i lean over the balustrade and see the little cap whirling down the spiral of the stairway like a feather in the wind good-bye my little boy i should have liked so much to question him but what after all could i have asked it is not polite to question children besides the package itself would probably give me more information than the messenger could it is a very big bundle but not very heavy i take it into my library and there untie the ribbons and unfasten the paper wrappings and i see what a log a first-class log a real christmas log but so light that i know it must be hollow then i find that it is indeed composed of two separate pieces opening on hinges and fastened with hooks i slip the hooks back and find myself inundated with violets violets they pour over my table over my knees over the carpet they tumble into my vest into my sleeves i am all perfumed with them therese therese fill me some vases with water and bring them here quick here are violets sent to us i know not from what country nor by what hand but it must be from a perfumed country and by a very gracious hand do you hear me old crow i have put all the violets on my table now completely covered by the odorous mass but there is still something in the log a book a manuscript it is i cannot believe it and yet i cannot doubt it it is the legende dore it is the manuscript of the clerk alexander here is the purification of the virgin and the coronation of proserpine here is the legend of saint Dractavi dractovius i contemplate this violet perfumed relic i turn the leaves of it between which the dark rich blossoms have slipped in here and there and right opposite the legend of saint cecilia i find a card bearing this name princess trepoff princess trepoff 
you laughed and wept by turns so sweetly under the fair sky of agrigentum you whom across old men believed to be only a foolish little woman to-day i am convinced of your rare and beautiful folly and the old fellow whom you now overwhelm with happiness will go to kiss your hand and give you back in another form this precious manuscript of which both he and science owe you an exact and sumptuous publication therese entered my study just at that moment she seemed to be very much excited monsieur she cried guess whom i saw just now in a carriage with a coat of arms painted on it that was stopping before the door parbleu madame trepoff i exclaimed i don't know anything about any madame trepoff answered my housekeeper the woman i saw just now was dressed like a duchess and had a little boy with her with lace frills all along the seams of his clothes and it was that same little madame cocos you once sent a log to when she was lying in here about eleven years ago i recognized her at once what i exclaimed you mean to say it was madame cocos the widow of the almanac peddler herself monsieur the carriage door was open for a minute to let her little boy who had just come from i don't know where get in she hasn't changed scarcely at all but why should those women change they never worry themselves about anything only the cocos woman looks a little fatter than she used to be and the idea of a woman that was taken in here out of pure charity coming to show off her velvets and diamonds in a carriage with a crest painted on it isn't it shameful therese i cried in a terrible voice if you ever speak to me again about that lady except in terms of the deepest respect you and i will fall out bring me the several vases to put those violets in which now give the city of books a charm it never had before while therese went off with a sigh to get the several vases i continued to contemplate those beautiful scattered violets whose odour spread all about me like the perfume of some sweet presence some charming soul and i asked myself how it had been possible for me never to recognise madame cocos in the person of the princess trepoff but that vision of the young widow showing me her little child on the stairs had been a very rapid one i had much more reason to reproach myself for having passed by a gracious and lovely soul without knowing it bonar i said to myself thou knowest how to decipher old texts but thou dost not know how to read in the book of life that giddy little madame trepoff whom thou once believed to possess no more soul than a bird has expended in pure gratitude more zeal and finer tact than thou didst ever show for anybody's sake right royally hath she repaid thee for the log fire of her churching day therese a while ago you were a magpie now you are becoming a tortoise come and give some water to these parmese violets End of section thirteen section fourteen of the crime of sylvestre bonnard by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain part two the daughter of clementine chapter one the fairy when i left the train at the melon station night had already spread its peace over the silent country the soil heated through all the long day by a strong sun by a gros soleil as the harvesters of the val de vire say still exhaled a warm heavy smell lush dense odours of grass passed over the level of the fields i brushed away the dust of the railway carriage and joyfully inhaled the pure air my travelling bag filled by my housekeeper with linen and various small toilet articles moon de teas seemed so light in my hand that i swung it about just as a schoolboy swings his strapped package of rudimentary books when the class is let out would to heaven that i were again a little urchin at school but it is fully fifty years since my good dead mother made me some tartines of bread and preserves and placed them in a basket of which she slipped the handle over my arm and then led me thus prepared to the school kept by monsieur du loir at a corner of the passage du commerce well known to the sparrows between a court and a garden the enormous monsieur du loir smiled upon us genially and patted my cheek to show no doubt the affectionate interest which my first appearance had inspired 
but when my mother had passed out of the court startling the sparrows as she went m dulois ceased to smile he showed no more affectionate interest he appeared on the contrary to consider me as a very troublesome little fellow i discovered later on that he entertained the same feelings towards all his pupils he distributed wax of his ferule with an agility no one could have expected on the part of so corpulent a person but his first aspect of tender interest invariably reappeared when he spoke to any of our mothers in our presence and always at such times while warmly praising our remarkable aptitudes he would cast down upon us a look of intense affection still those were happy days which i passed on the benches of m dulois with my little playfellows who like myself cried and laughed by turns with all their might from morning till evening after a whole half-century these souvenirs flowed up again fresh and bright as ever to the surface of memory under this starry sky whose face has in no wise changed since then and to serene and immutable lights will doubtless see many other schoolboys such as i was slowly turn into grey-headed servants afflicted with catarrh stars who have shone down upon each wise or foolish head among all my forgotten ancestors it is under your soft light that i now feel stir within me a certain poignant regret i would that i could have a son who might be able to see you when i shall see you no more how i should love him ah such a son would what am i saying why he would be no just twenty years old if you had only been willing clementine you whose cheeks used to look so ruddy under your pink hood but you are married to that young bank clerk noel alexandra who made so many millions afterwards i never met you again after your marriage clementine but i can see you now with your bright curls and your pink hood a looking-glass a looking-glass a looking-glass really it would be curious to see what i look like now with my white hair sighing clementine's name to the stars still it is not right to end with sterile irony the thought begun in the spirit of faith and love no clementine if your name came to my lips by chance this beautiful night be it for ever blessed your dear name and may you ever as a happy mother a happy grandmother enjoy to the very end of life with your rich husband the utmost degree of that happiness which you had the right to believe you could not win with the poor young scholar who loved you if though i cannot even now imagine it if your beautiful hair has become white clementine bear worthily the bundle of keys confided to you by noel alexandra and impart to your grandchildren the knowledge of all domestic virtues ah beautiful night she rules with such noble repose over men and animals alike kindly loosed by her from the yoke of daily toil and even i feel her beneficent influence although my habits of sixty years have so changed me that i can feel most things only through the signs which represent them my world is wholly formed of words so much of a philologist i have become each one dreams the dream of life in his own way i have dreamed it in my library and when the hour shall come in which i must leave this world may it please god to take me from my ladder from before my shelves of books well well it is really himself pardieu how are you monsieur sevastre monard and where have you been travelling to all this time over the country while i was waiting for you at the station with my cabriolet you missed me when the train came in and i was driving back quite disappointed to lusance give me your valise and get up here beside me in the carriage why do you know it is fully seven kilometres from here to the chateau who addresses me thus at the very top of his voice from the height of his cabriolet m paul de gabry nephew and heir of m honore de gabry peer of france in eighteen forty two who recently died at monaco 
and it was precisely to m paul de gabry's house that i was going with that valise of mine so carefully strapped by my housekeeper this excellent young man has just inherited conjointly with his two brothers-in-law the property of his uncle who belonging to a very ancient family of distinguished lawyers had accumulated in his chateau at lucens a library rich in manuscripts some dating back to the fourteenth century it was for the purpose of making an inventory and catalogue of these manuscripts that i had come to lazans at the urgent request of m paul de gabry whose father a perfect gentleman and distinguished bibliophile had maintained the most pleasant relations with me during his lifetime to tell the truth m paul has not inherited the fine tastes of his father m paul likes sporting he is a great authority on horses and dogs and i much fear that of all the sciences capable of satisfying or of duping the inexhaustible curiosity of mankind those of the stable and the dog kennel are the only ones thoroughly mastered by him i cannot say i was surprised to meet him since we had made a rendezvous but i acknowledge that i had become so preoccupied with my own thoughts that i had forgotten all about the chateau de la Zance and its inhabitants and that the voice of the gentleman calling out to me as i started to follow the country road winding away before me en bon ruban de queue as they say had given me quite a start i fear my face must have betrayed my incongruous distraction by a certain stupid expression which it is apt to assume in most of my social transactions my valise was pulled up into the carriage and i followed my valise my host pleased me by his straightforward simplicity i don't know anything myself about your old parchments he said but i think you will find some folks to talk to at the house besides the cure who writes books himself and the doctor who is a very good fellow although a radical you will meet somebody able to keep you company i mean my wife she is not a very learned woman but there are few things which she can't divine pretty well then i count upon being able to keep you with us long enough to make you acquainted with mademoiselle jeanne who has the fingers of a magician and the soul of an angel and is this delightfully gifted young lady one of your family i asked not at all replied m paul then she is just a friend of yours i persisted rather stupidly she has lost both her father and mother answered m de gabry keeping his eyes fixed upon the ears of his horse whose hoofs rang loudly over the road blue tinted by the moonshine her father managed to get us into some very serious trouble and we did not get off with a fright either then he shook his head and changed the subject he gave me due warning of the ruinous condition in which i should find the chateau and the park they had been absolutely deserted for thirty-two years i learned from him that m honore de gabry his uncle had been on very bad terms with some poachers whom he used to shoot at like rabbits one of them a vindictive peasant who had received a whole charge of shot in his face lay in wait for the seigneur one evening behind the trees of the mall and very nearly succeeded in killing him for the ball took off the tip of his ear my uncle m paul continued tried to discover who had fired the shot but he could not see any one and he walked back slowly to the house the day after he called his steward and ordered him to close up the manor and the park and allow no living soul to enter he expressly forbade that anything should be touched or looked after or any repairs made on the estate during his absence he added between his teeth that he would return at easter or trinity sunday as they say in the song and just as the song has it trinity sunday passed without a sign of him he died last year at monaco my brother-in-law and myself were the first to enter the chateau after it had been abandoned for thirty-two years we found a chestnut tree growing in the middle of the parlour 
as for the park it was useless trying to visit it because there were no longer any paths or alleys my companion ceased to speak and only the regular hoof beat of the trotting horse and the chirping of insects in the grass broke the silence on either hand the sheaves standing in the fields took in the vague moonlight the appearance of tall white women kneeling down and i abandoned myself a while to those wonderful childish fancies which the charm of night always suggests after driving under the heavy shadows of the mall we turned to the right and rolled up a lordly avenue at the end of which the chateau suddenly rose into view a black mass with turrets en poivriere we followed a sort of causeway which gave access to the court of honour and which passing over a moat full of running water doubtless replaced a long vanished drawbridge the loss of that drawbridge must have been i think the first of various humiliations to which the warlike manner had been subjected ere being reduced to that pacific aspect with which it received me the stars reflected themselves with marvellous clearness in the dark water monsieur pole like a courteous host escorted me to my chamber at the very top of the building at the end of a long corridor and then excusing himself for not presenting me at once to his wife by reason of the lateness of the hour bade me good-night my apartment painted in white and hung with chintz seemed to keep some traces of the elegant gallantry of the eighteenth century a heap of still glowing ashes which testified to the pains taken to dispel humidity filled the fireplace whose marble mantelpiece supported a bust of Moïse antoinette in basalt attached to the frame of the tarnished and discoloured mirror two brass hooks that had once doubtless served the ladies of old-fashioned days to hang their chatelaines on seemed to offer a very opportune means of suspending my watch which i took care to wind up beforehand for contrary to the opinion of the thelemites i hold that man is only master of time which is life itself when he has divided it into hours minutes and seconds that is to say into parts proportioned to the brevity of human existence and i thought to myself that life really seems short to us only because we measure it irrationally by our own mad hopes we have all of us like the old man in the fable a new wing to add to our building i want for example before i die to finish my history of the abbots of st germain de prez the time god allots to each one of us is like a precious tissue which we embroider as we best know how i had begun my woof with all sorts of philological illustrations so my thoughts wandered on and at last as i bound my foulard about my head the notion of time led me back to the past and for the second time within the same round of the dial i thought of you clementine to bless you again in your prosperity if you have any before blowing out my candle and falling asleep amid the chanting of the frogs end of section fourteen section fifteen of the crime of sylvestre bonard by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two during breakfast i had many opportunities to appreciate the good taste tact and intelligence of madame de gabry who told me that the chateau had its ghosts and was especially haunted by the lady with three wrinkles in her back a prisoner during her lifetime and thereafter a soul in pain i could never describe how much wit and animation she gave to this old nurse's tale we took out coffee on the terrace whose balusters clasped and forcibly torn away from their stone coping by a vigorous growth of ivy remained suspended in the grasp of the amorous plant like bewildered athenian women 
in the arms of ravishing centaurs the chateau shaped something like a four-wheeled wagon with a turret at each of the four angles had lost all original character by reason of repeated remodellings it was merely a fine spacious building nothing more it did not appear to me to have suffered much damage during its abandonment of thirty-two years but when madame de gabry conducted me into the great salon of the ground floor i saw that the planking was bulged in and out the plinths rotten the wainscoting split apart the paintings of the peers turned black and hanging more than half out of their settings a chestnut tree after forcing up the planks of the floor had grown tall under the ceiling and was reaching out its large leaved branches towards the glassless windows this spectacle was not devoid of charm but i could not look at it without anxiety as i remembered that the rich library of m honore de gabry in an adjoining apartment must have been exposed for the same length of time to the same forces of decay yet as i looked at the young chestnut tree in the salon i could not but admire the magnificent vigour of nature and that resistless power which forces every germ to develop into life on the other hand i felt saddened to think that whatever effort we scholars may make to preserve dead things from passing away we are labouring painfully in vain whatever has lived becomes the necessary food of new existences and the arab who builds himself a hut out of the marble fragments of a palmyra temple is really more of a philosopher than all the guardians of museums at london munich or paris august eleven all day long i have been classifying manuscripts the sun came in through the loft uncurtained windows and during my reading often very interesting i could hear the languid bumblebees bump heavily against the windows and the flies intoxicated with light and heat making their wings hum in circles around my head so loud became their humming about three o'clock that i looked up from the document i was reading a document containing very precious materials for the history of milan in the thirteenth century to watch the concentric movements of those tiny creatures bestion la fontaine calls them he found this form of the word in the old popular speech whence also the term tapisserie à bestion applied to figure tapestry i was compelled to confess that the effect of heat upon the wings of a fly is totally different from that it exerts upon the brain of a paleographical archivist for i found it very difficult to think and a rather pleasant languor weighing upon me from which i could rouse myself only by a very determined effort the dinner bell then startled me in the midst of my labours and i had barely time to put on my new dress-coat so as to make a respectable appearance before madame de gabry the repast generously served seemed to prolong itself for my benefit i am more than a fair judge of wine and my hostess who discovered my knowledge in this regard was friendly enough to open a certain bottle of chateau margot in my honour with deep respect i drank of this famous and knightly old wine which comes from the slopes of bordeaux and of which the flavour and exhilarating power are beyond praise the ardour of it spread gently through my veins and filled me with an almost juvenile animation seated beside madame de gabry on the terrace in the gloaming which gave a charming melancholy to the park and lent to every object an air of mystery i took pleasure in communicating my impression of the scene to my hostess i discoursed with a vivacity quite remarkable on the part of a man so devoid of imagination as i am i described to her spontaneously without quoting from an old text the caressing melancholy of the evening and the beauty of that natal earth which feeds us not only with bread and wine but also with ideas sentiments and beliefs and which will at 
last take us all back to her maternal breast again like so many tired little children at the close of a long day monsieur said the kind lady you see these old towers those trees that sky is it not quite natural that the personage of the popular tales and folk songs should have been evoked by such scenes why over there is the very path which little red riding hood followed when she went to the woods to pick nuts across this changeful and always vapory sky the fairy chariots used to roll and the north tower might have sheltered under its pointed roof that same old spinning woman whose distaff pricked the sleeping beauty in the wood i continued to muse upon her pretty fancies while m pole related to me as he puffed a very strong cigar the history of some suit he had brought against the commune about a water right madame de gabry feeling the chill night air began to shiver under the shawl her husband had wrapped about her and left us to go to her room i then decided instead of going to my own to return to the library and continue my examination of the manuscripts in spite of the protests of m pole i entered what i may call in old-fashioned phrase the book-room and started to work by the light of a lamp after having read fifteen pages evidently written by some ignorant and careless scribe for i could scarcely discern their meaning i plunged my hand into the pocket of my coat to get my snuff-box but this movement usually so natural and almost instinctive this time cost me some effort and even fatigue nevertheless i got out the silver box and took from it a pinch of the odorous powder which somehow or other i managed to spill all over my shirt-bosom under my baffled nose i am sure my nose must have expressed its disappointment for it is a very expressive nose more than once it has betrayed my secret thoughts and especially upon a certain occasion at the public library of coutances where i discovered right in front of my colleague brieu the cartulary of notre dame des anges what a delight my little eyes remained as dull and expressionless as ever behind my spectacles but at the mere sight of my thick pug nose which quivered with joy and pride brieu knew that i had found something he noted the volume i was looking at observed the place where i put it back pounced upon it as soon as i turned my heel copied it secretly and published in haste for the sake of playing me a trick but his edition swarms with errors and i had the satisfaction of afterwards criticising some of the gross blunders he made but to come back to the point at which i left off i began to suspect that i was getting very sleepy indeed i was looking at a chart of which the interest may be divined from the fact that it contained mention of a hutch sold to Johann de stonville priest in thirteen twelve but although even then i could recognize the importance of the document i did not give it that attention it so strongly invited my eyes would keep turning against my will towards a certain corner of the table where there was nothing whatever interesting to a learned mind there was only a big german book there bound in pigskin with brass studs on the sides and very thick cording upon the back it was a fine copy of a compilation which has little to recommend it except the wood engravings it contains and which is known as the cosmography of munster this volume with its cover slightly open was placed upon edge with the back upwards i could not say for how long i had been staring causelessly at the sixteenth-century folio when my eyes were captivated by a sight so extraordinary that even a person as devoid of imagination as i could not have been greatly astonished by it i perceived all of a sudden without having noticed her coming into the room a little creature seated on the back of the book with one knee bent and one leg hanging down somewhat in the attitude of the amazons of hyde park or the bois de boulogne on horseback she was so small that her swinging foot did not reach the table over which the trail of her dress extended in a serpentine line but her face and figure were those of an adult 
the fullness of her corsage and the roundness of her waist could leave no doubt of that even for an old savant like myself i will venture to add that she was very handsome with a proud mien for my iconographic studies have long accustomed me to recognize at once the perfection of a type and the character of a physiognomy the countenance of this lady who had seated herself inopportunely on the back of cosmography of Montmunster, expressed a mingling of haughtiness and mischievousness she had the air of a queen but a capricious queen and i judged from the mere expression of her eyes that she was accustomed to wield great authority somewhere in a very whimsical manner her mouth was imperious and mocking and those blue eyes of hers seemed to laugh in a disquieting way under her finely arched black eyebrows i have always heard that black eyebrows are very becoming to blondes but this lady was very blonde on the whole the impression she gave me was one of greatness it may seem odd to say that a person who was no taller than a wine-bottle and who might have been hidden in my coat-pocket but that it would have been very disrespectful to put her in it gave me precisely an idea of greatness but in the fine proportions of the lady seated upon the cosmography of munster there was such a proud elegance such a harmonious majesty and she maintained an attitude at once so easy and so noble that she really seemed to me a very great person although my ink-bottle which she examined with an expression of such mockery as appeared to indicate that she knew in advance every word that would come out of it at the end of my pen was for her a deep basin in which she would have blackened her gold-clocked pink stockings up to the garter i can assure you that she was great and imposing even in her sprightliness her costume worthy of her face was extremely magnificent it consisted of a robe of gold and silver brocade and a mantle of nacarat velvet lined with vair her head-dress was a sort of henan with two high points and pearls of splendid lustre made it bright and luminous as a crescent moon her little white hand held a wand that wand drew my attention very strongly because my archaeological studies had taught me to recognize with certainty every sign by which the notable personages of legend and of history are distinguished this knowledge came to my aid during various very queer conjectures with which i was laboring i examined the wand and saw that it appeared to have been cut from a branch of hazel then it's a fairy's wand i said to myself consequently the lady who carries it is a fairy happy at thus discovering what sort of a person was before me i tried to collect my mind sufficiently to make her a graceful compliment it would have given me much satisfaction i confess if i could have talked to her about the part taken by her people not less in the life of the saxon and germanic races than in that of the latin occident such a dissertation it appeared to me would have been an ingenious method of thanking the lady for having thus appeared to an old scholar contrary to the invariable custom of her kindred who never show themselves but to innocent children or ignorant village folk because one happens to be a fairy one is none the less a woman i said to myself and since madame recamier according to what i heard j j ampere say used to blush with pleasure when the little chimney-sweeps opened their eyes as wide as they could to look at her surely the supernatural lady seated upon the cosmography of munster might feel flattered to hear an erudite man discourse learnedly about her as about a medal a seal a fibula or a token but such an undertaking which would have cost my timidity a great deal became totally out of the question when i observed the lady of the cosmography suddenly take from an alms-purse hanging at her girdle the very smallest of nuts i had ever seen crack the shells between her teeth and throw them at my nose while she nibbled the kernels with the gravity of a sucking child at this conjuncture i did what the dignity of science demanded of me i remained silent but the nutshells caused such a painful tickling that i put my, my hand to my nose and found to my great surprise that my spectacles were straddling the very end of it so that i was actually looking at the lady not through my spectacles but over them
this was incomprehensible because my eyes worn out over old texts cannot ordinarily distinguish anything without glasses could not tell a melon from a decanter though the two were placed close up to my nose that nose of mine remarkable for its size its shape and its coloration legitimately attracted the attention of the fairy for she seized my goose quill pen which was sticking up from the ink bottle like a plume and she began to pass the feather end of that pen over my nose i had had more than once in company occasion to suffer cheerfully from the innocent mischief of young ladies who made me join their games and would offer me their cheeks to kiss through the back of a chair or invite me to blow out a candle which they would lift suddenly above the range of my breath but until that moment no person of the fair sex had ever subjected me to such a whimsical piece of familiarity as that of tickling my nose with my own feather pen happily i remembered the maxim of my late grandfather who was accustomed to say that everything was permissible on the part of ladies and that whatever they do to us is to be regarded as a grace and a favour therefore as a grace and a favour i received the nutshells and the titillations with my own pen and i tried to smile much more i even found speech madam i said with dignified politeness you accord the honour of a visit not to a silly child not to a bore but to a bibliophile who is very happy to make your acquaintance and who knows that long ago you used to make elf knots in the manes of mares at the crib drink the milk from the skimming pails slip grains of gratter down the backs of our great-grandmothers make the hearths sputter in the faces of the old folks and in short fill the house with disorder and gaiety you can also boast of giving the nicest frights in the world to lovers who stayed out in the woods too late of evenings but i thought you had vanished out of existence at least three centuries ago can it really be madame that you are still to be seen in this age of railways and telegraphs my concierge who used to be a nurse in her young days does not know your story and my little boy neighbour whose nose is still wiped for him by his bun declares that you do not exist what do you yourself think about it she cried in a silvery voice straightening up her royal little figure in a very haughty fashion and whipping the back of the cosmography of munster as though it were a hippogriff i don't really know i answered rubbing my eyes this reply indicating a deeply scientific scepticism had the most deplorable effect upon my questioner monsieur sylvestre bonnard she said to me you are nothing but an old pedant i always suspected as much the smallest little ragamuffin who goes along the road with his shirt-tail sticking out through a hole in his pantaloons knows more about me than all the old spectacled folks in your institutes and your academies to know is nothing at all to imagine is everything nothing exists except that which is imagined i am imaginary that is what it is to exist i should think i am dreamed of and i appear everything is only a dream and as nobody ever dreams about you sylvester bonnard it is you who do not exist i charm the world i am everywhere on a moonbeam in the trembling of a hidden spring in the moving of leaves that murmur in the white vapours that rise each morning from the hollow meadow in the thickets of pink briar everywhere i am seen i am loved there are sighs uttered weird thrills of pleasure felt by those who follow the light print of my feet as i make the dead leaves whisper i make the little children smile i give wit to the dullest-minded nurses leaning above the cradles i play i comfort i lull to sleep and you doubt whether i exist sylvester bonnard your warm coat covers the hide of an ass she ceased speaking her delicate nostrils swelled with indignation and while i admired despite my vexation the heroic anger of this little person she pushed my pen about in the ink bottle backward and forward like an oar and then suddenly threw it at my nose point first i rubbed my face and felt it all covered with ink she had disappeared my lamp was extinguished a ray of moonlight streamed down through a window and descended upon the cosmography of moonster a strong cool wind which had arisen very suddenly without my knowledge was blowing my papers pens and wafers about my table was all stained with ink i had left my window open during the storm what an imprudence End of section fifteen section sixteen of the crime of sylvester bonnard by anatole france 
this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three i wrote to my housekeeper as i promised that i was safe and sound but i took good care not to tell her that i had caught a cold from going to sleep in the library at night with the window open for the good woman would have been as unsparing in her remonstrances to me as parliaments to kings at your age monsieur she would have been sure to say one ought to have more sense she is simple enough to believe that sense grows with age i seem to her an exception to this rule not having any similar motive for concealing my experiences from madame de gabry i told her all about my vision which she seemed to enjoy very much why that was a charming dream of yours she said and one must have real genius to dream such a dream then i am a real genius when i am asleep i responded when you dream she replied and you are always dreaming i know that madame de gabry in making this remark only wished to please me but that intention alone deserves my utmost gratitude and it is therefore in a spirit of thankfulness and kindliest remembrance that i write down her words which i will read over and over again until my dying day and which will never be read by any one save myself i passed the next few days in completing the inventory of the manuscripts in the lusans library certain confidential observations dropped by m paul de gabry however caused me some painful surprise and made me decide to pursue the work after a different manner from that in which i had begun it from those few words i learned that the fortune of m honore de gabry which had been badly managed for many years and subsequently swept away to a large extent through the failure of a banker whose name i do not know had been transmitted to the heirs of the old french nobleman only under the form of mortgaged real estate and irrecoverable assets m paul by agreement with his joint heirs had decided to sell the library and i was entrusted with the task of making arrangements to have the sale effected upon advantageous terms but totally ignorant as i was of all the business methods and trade customs i thought it best to get the advice of a publisher who was one of my private friends i wrote him at once to come and join me at Luzans and while waiting for his arrival i took my hat and cane and made visits to the different churches of the diocese in several of which i knew there were certain mortuary inscriptions to be found which had never been correctly copied so i left my hosts and departed my pilgrimage exploring the churches and the cemeteries every day visiting the parish priests and the village notaries supping at the public inns with peddlers and cattle dealers sleeping at night between sheets scented with lavender i passed one whole week in the quiet but profound enjoyment of observing the living engaged in their various daily occupations even while i was thinking of the dead as for the purpose of my researches i made only a few mediocre discoveries which caused me only a mediocre joy and one therefore salubrious and not at all fatiguing i copied a few interesting epitaphs and i added to this little collection a few recipes for cooking country dishes which a certain good priest kindly gave me with these riches i returned to lusance and i crossed the court of honour with such secret satisfaction as a bourgeois feels on entering his own home this was the effect of the kindness of my hosts and the impression i received on crossing their threshold proves better than any reasoning could do the excellence of their hospitality i entered the great parlour without meeting anybody and the young chestnut tree there spreading out its broad leaves seemed to me like an old friend but the next thing which i saw on the pier table caused me such a shock of surprise that i readjusted my glasses upon my nose with both hands at once and then felt myself over so as to get at least some superficial proof of my own existence 
in less than one second there thronged from my mind twenty different conjectures the most rational of which was that i had suddenly become crazy it seemed to me absolutely impossible that what i was looking at could exist yet it was equally impossible for me not to see it as a thing actually existing what caused my surprise was resting on the pier table above which rose a great dull speckled mirror i saw myself in that mirror and i can say that i saw for once in my life the perfect image of stupefaction but i made proper allowance for myself i approved myself for being so stupefied by a really stupefying thing the object i was thus examining with a degree of astonishment that all my reasoning power failed to lessen obtruded itself on my attention though quite motionless the persistence and fixity of the phenomenon excluded any idea of hallucination i am totally exempt from all nervous disorders capable of influencing the sense of sight the cause of such visual disturbance is i think generally due to stomach trouble and thank god i have an excellent stomach moreover visual illusions are accompanied with special abnormal conditions which impress the victims of hallucination themselves and inspire them with a sort of terror now i felt nothing of this kind the object which i saw although seemingly impossible in itself appeared to me under all the natural conditions of reality i observed that it had three dimensions and colours and that it cast a shadow ah how i stared at it the water came into my eyes so that i had to wipe the glasses of my spectacles finally i found myself obliged to yield to the evidence and to affirm that i had really before my eyes the fairy the very same fairy i had been dreaming of in the library a few evenings before it was she it was her very self i assure you she had the same air of child queen the same proud supple poise she held the same hazel wand in her hand she still wore her double peaked headdress and the train of her long brocade robe undulated about her little feet same face same figure it was she indeed and to prevent any possible doubt of it she was seated on the back of a huge old-fashioned book strongly resembling the cosmography of munster her immobility but half reassured me i was really afraid that she was going to take some more nuts out of her alms purse and throw the shells at my face i was standing there waving my hands and gaping when the musical and laughing voice of madame de gabry suddenly rang in my ears so you are examining your fairy monsieur bonnard said my hostess well do you think the resemblance good it was very quickly said but even while hearing it i had time to perceive that my fairy was a statuette in coloured wax modelled with much taste and spirit by some novice hand but the phenomenon even thus reduced by a rational explanation did not cease to excite my surprise how and by whom had the lady of the cosmography been enabled to assume plastic existence that was what remained for me to learn turning towards madame de gabry i perceived that she was not alone a young girl dressed in black was standing beside her she had large intelligent eyes of a grey as sweet as that of the sky of the isle of france and at once artless and characteristic in their expression at the extremities of her rather thin arms were fidgeting uneasily two slender hands supple but slightly red as it becomes the hands of young girls to be sheathed in her closely fitting merino robe she had the slim grace of a young tree and her large mouth bespoke frankness i could not describe how much the child pleased me at first sight she was not beautiful but the three dimples of her cheeks and chin seemed to laugh and her whole person which revealed the awkwardness of innocence had something in it indescribably good and sincere my gaze alternated from the statuette to the young girl and i saw her blush so frankly and fully the crimson passing over her face as by waves well said my hostess who had become sufficiently accustomed to my distracted moods to put the same question to me twice is that the very same lady who came in to see you through the window that you left open she was very saucy but then you were quite imprudent 
anyhow do you recognize her it is her very self i replied i see her now on that pier table precisely as i saw her on the table in the library then if that be so replied madame de gabry you have to blame for it in the first place yourself as a man who although devoid of all imagination to use your own words knew how to depict your dream in such vivid colours in the second place me who was able to remember and repeat faithfully all your dream and lastly mademoiselle jeanne whom i now introduce to you for she herself modelled that wax figure precisely according to my instructions madame de gabry had taken the young girl's hand as she spoke but the latter had suddenly broken away from her and was already running through the park with the speed of a bird little crazy creature madame de gabry cried after her how can one be so shy come back here to be scolded and kissed but it was all of no avail the frightened child disappeared among the shrubbery madame de gabry seated herself in the only chair remaining in the dilapidated parlour i should be much surprised she said if my husband had not already spoken to you of jeanne she is a sweet child and we both love her very much tell me the plain truth what do you think of her statuette i replied that the work was full of good taste and spirit but that it showed some want of study and practice on the author's part otherwise i had been extremely touched to think that those young fingers should have thus embroidered an old man's rough sketch of fancy and given form so brilliantly to the dreams of a dotard like myself the reason i ask your opinion replied madame de gabry seriously is that jeanne is a poor orphan do you think she could earn her living by modelling statuettes like this one as for that no i replied and i think there is no reason to regret the fact you say the girl is affectionate and sensitive i can well believe you i could believe it from her face alone there are excitements in artist life which impel generous hearts to act out of all rule and measure this young creature is made to love keep her for the domestic heart there only is real happiness but she has no dowry replied madame de gabry then extending her hand to me she continued you are our friend i can tell you everything the father of this child was a banker and one of our friends he went into a colossal speculation and it ruined him he survived only a few months after his failure in which as paul must have told you three-fourths of my uncle's fortune were lost and more than half of our own we had made his acquaintance at monaco during the winter we passed there at my uncle's house he had an adventurous disposition but such an engaging manner he deceived himself before ever he deceived others after all it is in the ability to deceive oneself that the greatest talent is shown is it not well we were captured my husband my uncle and i and we risked much more than a reasonable amount in a very hazardous undertaking but bah as paul says since we have no children we need not worry about it besides we have the satisfaction of knowing that the friend in whom we trusted was an honest man you must know his name it was so often in the paper and on public placards noel alexandra his wife was a very sweet person i knew her only when she was already past her prime with traces of having once been very pretty and a taste for fashionable style and display which seemed quite becoming to her she was naturally fond of social excitement but she showed a great deal of courage and dignity after the death of her husband she died a year after him leaving jeanne alone in the world clementine i cried out and on thus learning what i had never imagined the mere idea of which would have set all the forces of my soul in revolt upon hearing that clementine was no longer in this world something like a great silence came upon me and the feeling which flooded my whole being was not a keen strong pain but a quiet and solemn sorrow yet i was conscious of some incomprehensible sense of alleviation and my thought rose suddenly to heights before unknown from wheresoever thou art at this moment clementine i said to myself look down upon this old heart now indeed cooled by age yet whose blood once boiled for thy sake and say whether it is not reanimated by the mere thought of being able to love all that remains of thee on earth everything passes away since thou thyself hast passed away but life is immortal it is that life we must love in its forms eternally renewed all the rest is child's play and i myself with all my books am only like a child playing with marbles the purpose of life it is thou clementine who has revealed it to me 
madame de gabry aroused me from my thoughts by murmuring the child is poor the daughter of clementine is poor i exclaimed aloud how fortunate that is so i would not wish that any one but myself should prove for her and dower her no the daughter of clementine must not have her dowry from any one but me and approaching madame de gabry as she rose from her chair i took her right hand i kissed that hand and placed it on my arm and said you will conduct me to the grave of the widow of noel alexandre and i heard madame de gabry asking me why are you crying End of section sixteen. Section seventeen of the Crime of Sylvestre Bonal by Anatole France. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter four The Little Saint George, April sixteen saint jocovius and the early abbots of saint germain des prés have been occupying me for the past forty years but i do not know if i shall be able to write their history before i go to join them it is already quite a long time since i became an old man one day last year on the pont des arts one of my fellow members of the institute was lamenting before me over the ennui of becoming old still saint beuve replied to him it is the only way that has yet been found of living a long time i have tried this way and i know just what it is worth the trouble of it is not that one lasts too long but that one sees all about him pass away mother wife friends children nature makes and unmakes all these divine treasures with gloomy indifference and at last we find that we have not loved we have only been embracing shadows but how sweet some shadows are if ever creature glided like a shadow through the life of a man it was certainly that young girl whom i fell in love with when incredible though it now seems i was myself a youth a christian sarcophagus from the catacombs of rome bears a formula of imprecation the whole terrible meaning of which i only learned with time it says whatsoever impious man violates this sepulchre may he die the last of his own people in my capacity of archaeologist i have opened tombs and disturbed ashes in order to collect the shreds of apparel metal ornaments or gems that were mingled with those ashes but i did it only through that scientific curiosity which does not exclude feelings of reverence and of piety may that malediction graven by some one of the first followers of the apostles upon a martyr's tomb never fall upon me i ought not to fear to survive my own people so long as there are men in the world for there are always some whom one can love but the power of love itself weakens and gradually becomes lost with age like all the other energies of man example proves it and it is this which terrifies me am i sure that i have not myself already suffered this great loss i should surely have felt it but for the happy meeting which has rejuvenated me poets speak of the fountain of youth it does exist it gushes up from the earth at every step we take and one passes by without drinking of it the young girl i loved married of her own choice to a rival passed all gray-haired into the eternal rest i have found her daughter so that my life which before seemed to me without utility now once more finds a purpose and a reason for being to-day i take the sun as they say in provence i take it on the terrace of the luxembourg at the foot of the statue of marguerite de navarre it is a spring sun intoxicating as young wine i sit and dream my thoughts escape from my head like the foam from a bottle of beer they are light and their fizzing amuses me i dream such a pastime is certainly permissible to an old fellow who has published thirty volumes of texts and contributed to the journal des savants for twenty-six years i have the satisfaction of feeling that i perform my task as well as it was possible for me to do and that i utilized to their fullest extent those mediocre faculties with which nature endowed me my efforts were not all in vain and i have contributed in my own modest way to that renaissance of historical labors which will remain the honor of this restless century i shall certainly be counted among those ten or twelve who revealed to france her own literary antiquities 
my publication of the poetical works of gautier de quincy inaugurated a judicious system and, and fixed a date it is in the austere calm of old age that i decree to myself this deserved credit and god who sees my heart knows whether pride or vanity have aught to do with this self-award of justice but i am tired my eyes are dim my hand trembles and i see an image of myself in those old men of homer whose weakness excluded them from the battle and who seated upon the ramparts lifted up their voices like crickets among the leaves so my thoughts were wandering when three young men seated themselves near me i do not know whether each one of them had come in three boats like the monkey of la fontaine but the three certainly displayed themselves over the space of twelve chairs i took pleasure in watching them not because they had anything very extraordinary about them but because i discerned in them that brave joyous manner which is natural to youth they were from the schools i was less assured of it by the books they were carrying than by the character of their physiognomy for all who busy themselves with the things of the mind can be at once recognized by an indescribably something which is common to all of them i am very fond of young people and these please me in spite of a certain provoking wild manner which recalled to me my own college days with marvellous vividness but they did not wear velvet doublets and long hair as we used to do they did not walk about as we used to do hell and malediction they were quite properly dressed and neither their costume nor their language had anything suggestive of the middle ages i must also add that they paid considerable attention to the women passing on the terrace and expressed their admiration of some of them in very animated language but their reflections even on this subject were not of a character to oblige me to flee from my seat besides so long as youth is studious i think it has a right to its gaieties one of them having made some gallant pleasantry which i forget the smallest and darkest of the three exclaimed with a slight gascon accent what a thing to say only physiologists like us have any right to occupy ourselves about living matter as for you Jaly, who only live in the past like all your fellow archivists and paleographers you will do better to confine yourself to those stone women over there who are your contemporaries and he pointed to the statues of the ladies of ancient france which towered up all white in a half circle under the trees of the terrace this joke though in itself trifling enabled me to know that the young man called Jaly was a student at the ecole des chartres from the conversation which followed i was able to learn that his neighbour blonde and wan almost to diaphaneity taciturn and sarcastic was boumier a fellow-student Jaly and the future doctor i hope he will become one some day discoursed together with much fantasy and spirit in the midst of the loftiest speculations they would play upon words and make jokes after the peculiar fashion of really witty persons that is to say in a style of enormous absurdity i need hardly say i suppose that they only deigned to maintain the most monstrous kind of paradoxes they employed all their powers of imagination to make themselves as ludicrous as possible and all their powers of reasoning to assert the contrary of common sense all the better for them i do not like to see young folks too rational the student of medicine after glancing at the title of the book that boulmeyer held in his hand exclaimed what you read michelet you yes replied boulmeyer very gravely i like novels Jaly, who dominated both by his fine stature imperious gestures and ready wit took the book turned over a few pages rapidly and said michelet always had a great propensity to emotional tenderness he wept sweet tears over maillard that nice little man introduced la paperasserie into the september massacres but as emotional tenderness leads to fury he becomes all at once furious against the victims there was no help for it it is the sentimentality of the age the assassin is pitied but the victim is considered quite unpardonable in his later manner michelet is more michelet than ever before there is no common sense in it it is simply wonderful neither art nor science neither criticism nor narrative only furies and fainting spells and epileptic fits over matters which he never deigns to explain childish outcries envie de femme grosse and a style my friends not a single finished phrase it is astounding and he handed the book back to his comrade this is amusing madness i thought to myself and not quite so devoid of common sense as it appears this young man though only playing has sharply touched the defect in the curus but the provencal student declared that history was a thoroughly despicable exercise of rhetoric according to him the only true history was the natural history of man michelet was in the right path when he came in contact with the fistula of louis the fourteenth but he fell back into the old rut almost immediately afterwards 
after this judicious expression of opinion the young physiologist went to join a party of passing friends the two archivists less well acquainted in the neighbourhood of a garden so far from the rue paradis aux marais remained together and began to chat about their studies jaillie who had completed his third class year was preparing a thesis on the subject of which he expatiated with youthful enthusiasm indeed i thought the subject a very good one particularly because i had recently thought myself called upon to treat a notable part of it it was the monasticum gallicanum the young erudite i gave him the name as a presage wanted to describe all the engravings made about sixteen ninety for the work which dom michel germain would have had printed but for the one irremediable hindrance which is rarely foreseen and never avoided dom michel germain left his manuscript complete however and in good order when he died shall i be able to do as much with mine but that is not the present question so far as i am able to understand m jelly intends to devote a brief archaeological notice to each of the abbeys pictured by the humble engravers of dom michel germain his friend asked him whether he was acquainted with all the manuscripts and printed documents relating to the subject it was then that i pricked up my ears they spoke at first of original sources and i must confess they did so in a satisfactory manner despite their innumerable and detestable puns then they began to speak about contemporary studies on the subject have you read asboumier the notice of Courageau? good i thought to myself yes replied Gilles, it is accurate have you read said Boulmier, the article of Tamassi de la roque in the revue des questions historiques good i thought to myself for the second time yes replied jaillie it is full of things have you read said boulmier the tableau des abbes benedictines en mille six cents by sylvestre bonnard good i said to myself for the third time mais foi no replied jaillie bonnard is an idiot turning my head i perceived that the shadow had reached the place where i was sitting it was growing chilly and i thought to myself what a fool i was to have remained sitting there at the risk of getting rheumatism just to listen to the impertinence of those two young fellows well well i said to myself as i got up let this prattling fledgling write his thesis and sustain it he will find my colleague Kishara, or some other professor at the school to show him what an ignoramus he is i consider him neither more nor less than a rascal and really now that i come to think of it what he said about michelet a while ago was quite insufferable outrageous to talk in that way about an old master replete with genius it was simply abominable End of section seventeen. section eighteen of the crime of sylvestre bonnard by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain april seventeen therese give me my new hat my best frock coat and my silver-headed cane but therese is deaf as a sack of charcoal and slow as justice years have made her so the worst is that she thinks she can hear well and move about well and proud of her sixty years of upright domesticity she serves her old master with the most vigilant despotism what did i tell you and now she will not give me my silver-headed cane for fear that i might lose it it is true that i often forget umbrellas and walking-sticks in the omnibuses and booksellers shops but i have a special reason for wanting to take out with me to-day my old cane with the engraved silver head representing don quixote charging a windmill lance in rest while sancho panza with uplifted arms vainly conjures him to a stop that cane is all that came to me from the heritage of my uncle captain victor who in his lifetime resembled don quixote much more than sancho panza and who loved blows quite as much as most people fear them for thirty years i have been in the habit of carrying this cane upon all memorable or solemn visits which i make and those two figures of knight and squire give me inspiration and counsel i imagine i can hear them speak don quixote says think well about great things and know that thought is the only reality in this world lift up nature to thine own stature and let the whole universe be for thee no more than the reflection of thine own heroic soul 
combat for honour's sake that alone is worthy of a man and if it should fall thee to receive wounds shed thy blood as a beneficent do and smile and sancho panza says to me in his turn remain just what heaven made thee comrade prefer the bread crust which has become dry in thy wallet to all the partridges that roast in the kitchen of lords obey thy master whether he by a wise man or fool and do not cumber thy brain with too many useless things fear blows tis verily tempting god to seek after danger but if the incomparable knight and his matchless squire are imagined only upon this cane of mine they are realities to my inner conscience within every one of us there lives both a don quixote and a sancho panza to whom we hearken by turns and though sancho most persuades us it is don quixote that we find ourselves obliged to admire but a truce to this dotage and let us go to see madame de gabri about some matters more important than the everyday details of life same day i found madame de gabri dressed in black just buttoning her gloves i am ready she said ready so i have always found her upon any occasion of doing a kindness after some compliments about the good health of her husband who was taking a walk at the time we descended the stairs and got into the carriage i do not know what secret influence i feared to dissipate by breaking silence but we followed the great deserted drives without speaking looking at the crosses the monumental columns and the mortuary wreaths awaiting sad purchasers the vehicle at last halted at the extreme verge of the land of the living before the gate upon which words of hope are graven follow me said madame de gabri whose tall stature i noticed then for the first time she first walked down an alley of cypresses and then took a very narrow path contrived between the tombs finally halting before a plain slab she said to me it is here and she knelt down i could not help noticing the beautiful and easy manner in which this christian woman fell upon her knees leaving the folds of her robe to spread themselves at random about her i had never before seen any lady kneel down with such frankness and such forgetfulness of self except two fair polish exiles one evening long ago in a deserted church in paris this image passed like a flash and i saw only the sloping stone on which was graven the name of clementine what i then felt was something so deep and vague that only the sound of some rich music could convey the idea of it i seemed to hear instruments of celestial sweetness make harmony in my old heart with the solemn accords of a funeral chant there seemed to mingle the subdued melody of a song of love for my soul blended into one feeling the grave sadness of the present with the familiar graces of the past i cannot tell whether we had remained a long time at the tomb of clementine before madame de gabri arose we passed through the cemetery again without speaking to each other only when we found ourselves among the living once more did i feel able to speak while following you there i said to madame de gabri i could not help thinking of those angels with whom we are said to meet on the mysterious confines of life and death that tomb you led me to of which i knew nothing as i know nothing or scarcely anything concerning her whom it covers brought back to me emotions which were unique in my life and which seem in the dullness of that life like some light gleaming upon a dark road the light recedes farther and farther away as the journey lengthens i have now almost reached the bottom of the last slope and nevertheless each time i turn to look back i see the glow as bright as ever you madame who knew clementine as a young wife and mother after her hair had become grey you cannot imagine her as i see her still a young fair girl all pink and white since you have been so kind as to be my guide dear madame i ought to tell you what feelings were awakened in me by the sight of that grave to which you led me memories throng back upon me i feel myself like some old 
gnarled and mossy oak which awakens a nestling world of birds by shaking its branches unfortunately the song my birds sing is old as the world and can amuse no one but myself tell me your souvenirs said madame de gabry i cannot read your books because they are written only for scholars but i like very much to have you talk to me because you know how to give interest to the most ordinary things in life and talk to me just as you would talk to an old woman this morning i found three grey threads in my hair let them come without regret madame i replied time deals gently only with those who take it gently and when in some years more you will have a silvery fringe under your black fillet you will be reclothed with a new beauty less vivid but more touching than the first and you will find your husband admiring your grey tresses as much as he did that black curl which you gave him when about to be married and which he preserves in a locket as a thing sacred these boulevards are broad and very quiet we can talk at our ease as we walk along i will tell you to begin with how i first made the acquaintance of clementine's father but you must not expect anything extraordinary or anything even remarkable you would be greatly deceived monsieur de lesay used to live in the second story of an old house in the avenue de l'observatoire having a stuccoed front ornamented with antique busts and a large unkept garden attached to it that facade and that garden were the first images my child eyes perceived and they will be the last no doubt which i still see through my closed eyelids when the inevitable day comes for it was in that house that i was born it was in that garden i first learned while playing to feel and know some particles of this old universe magical hours sacred hours when the soul all fresh from the making first discovers the world which for its sake seems to assume such caressing brightness such mysterious charm and that madame is indeed because the universe itself is only the reflection of our soul my mother was being very happily constituted she rose with the sun like the birds and she herself resembled the birds by her domestic industry by her maternal instinct by her perpetual desire to sing and by a sort of brusque grace which i could feel the spirit of very well even as a child she was the soul of the house which she filled with her systematic and joyous activity my father was just as slow as she was brisk i can recall very well that placid face of his over which at times an ironical smile used to flit he was fatigued with active life and he loved his fatigue seated beside the fire in his big armchair he used to read from morning till night and it is from him that i inherit my love for of books i have in my library a mably and a now which he annotated with his own hand from beginning to end but it was utterly useless attempting to interest him in anything practical whatever when my mother would try by all kinds of gracious little ruses to lure him out of his retirement he would simply shake his head with that inexorable gentleness which is the force of weak characters he used in this way gently to worry the poor woman who could not enter at all into his own sphere of meditative wisdom and could understand nothing of life except its daily duties and the merry labour of each hour she thought him sick and feared he was going to become still more so but his apathy had a different cause my father entering the naval office under m Decroix in eighteen o one gave early proof of high administrative talent there was a great deal of activity in the marine department in those times and in eighteen o five my father was appointed chief of the second administrative division that same year the emperor whose attention had been called to him by the minister ordered him to make a report upon the organization of the english navy this work which reflected a profoundly liberal and philosophic spirit of which the editor himself was unconscious was only finished in eighteen o seven about eighteen months after the defeat of admiral villeneuve at trafalgar 
napoleon who from that disastrous day never wanted to hear the word ship mentioned in his presence angrily glanced over a few pages of the memoir and then threw it in the fire vociferating words words i said once before that i hate ideologists my father was told afterwards that the emperor's anger was so intense at the moment that he stamped the manuscript down into the fire with his boot heels at all events it was his habit when very much irritated to poke down the fire with his boot soles my father never fully recovered from this disgrace and the fruitlessness of all his efforts towards reform was certainly the cause of the apathy which came upon him at a later day nevertheless napoleon after his return from elba sent for him and ordered him to prepare some liberal and patriotic bulletins and proclamations for the fleet after waterloo my father whom the event had rather saddened than surprised retired into private life and was not interfered with except that it was generally averred of him that he was a jacobin a bouver de sang one of those men with whom no one could afford to be on intimate terms my mother's eldest brother victor maldon an infantry captain retired on half pay in eighteen fourteen and disbanded in eighteen fifteen aggravated by his bad attitude the situation in which the fall of the empire had placed my father captain victor used to shout in the cafes and the public balls that the bourbons had sold france to the cossacks he used to show everybody a tricolored cockade hidden in the lining of his hat and carried with much ostentation a walking stick the handle of which had been so carved that the shadow thrown by it made the silhouette of the emperor unless you have seen certain lithographs by charlet madame you could form no idea of the physiognomy of my uncle victor when he used to stride about the garden of the tuileries with a fiercely elegant manner of his own buttoned up in his frogged coat with his cross of honour upon his breast and a bouquet of violets in his buttonhole idleness and intemperance greatly intensified the vulgar recklessness of his political passions he used to insult people whom he happened to see reading the quotidienne or the drapeau blanc and compel them to fight with him in this way he had the pain and the shame of wounding a boy of sixteen in a duel in short my uncle victor was the very reverse of a well-behaved person and as he came to lunch and dine at our house every blessed day in the year his bad reputation became attached to our family my poor father suffered cruelly from some of his guests pranks but being very good-natured he never made any remarks and continued to give the freedom of his house to the captain who only despised him for it all this which i have told you madame was explained to me afterwards but at the time in question my uncle the captain filled me with the very enthusiasm of admiration and i promised myself to try to become some day as like him as possible so one fine morning in order to begin the likeness i put my arms akimbo and swore like a trooper my excellent mother at once gave me such a box on the ear that i remained half stupefied for some little while before i could even burst out crying i can still see the old armchair covered with yellow utrecht velvet behind which i wept innumerable tears that day i was a very little fellow then one morning my father lifting me upon his knees as he was in the habit of doing smiled at me with that slightly ironical smile which gave a certain piquancy to his perpetual gentleness of manner as i sat on his knee playing with his long white hair he told me something which i did not understand very well but which interested me very much for the simple reason that it was mysterious to me i think but am not quite sure that he related to me that morning the story of the little king of yves to according to the song all of a sudden we heard a great report and the windows rattled my father slipped me down gently on the floor at his feet he threw up his trembling arms with a strange gesture his face became all inert and white and his eyes seemed enormous he tried to speak but his teeth were chattering at last he murmured they have shot him i did not know what he meant and felt only a vague terror i knew afterwards however 
that he was speaking of marshal ney who fell on the seventh of december eighteen fifteen under the wall enclosing some waste ground beside our house about that time i used often to meet on the stairway an old man or perhaps not exactly an old man with little black eyes which flashed with extraordinary vivacity and an impassive swarthy face he did not seem to me alive or at least he did not seem to me alive in the same way that other men are alive i had once seen at the residence of m denon where my father had taken me with him on a visit a mummy brought from egypt and i believed in good faith that m denon's mummy used to get up when no one was looking leave its gilded case put on a brown coat and powdered wig and become transformed into m de lesay and even to-day dear madame while i reject that opinion as being without foundation i must confess that m de lesay bore a very strong resemblance to m de nan's mummy the fact is enough to explain why this person inspired me with fantastic terror in reality m de lesay was a small gentleman and a great philosopher as a disciple of mably and rousseau he flattered himself on being a man without any prejudices and this pretension itself is a very great prejudice he professed to hate fanaticism yet was himself a fanatic on the topic of toleration i am telling you madame about a character belonging to an age that is past i fear i may not be able to make you understand and i am sure i shall not be able to interest you it was so long ago but i will abridge as much as possible besides i did not promise you anything interesting and you could not have expected to hear of remarkable adventures in the life of sylvestre bonard madame de gabry encouraged me to proceed and i resumed m de lesay was brusque with men and courteous to ladies he used to kiss the hand of my mother whom the customs of the republic and the empire had not habituated to such gallantry in him i touched the age of louis the sixteenth m de lesay was a geographer and nobody i believe ever showed more pride than he in occupying himself with the face of the earth under the old regime he had attempted philosophical agriculture and thus squandered his estates to the very last acre when he had ceased to own one square foot of ground he took possession of the whole globe and prepared an extraordinary number of maps based upon the narratives of travellers but as he had been mentally nourished with the very marrow of the encyclopedie he was not satisfied with merely parking off human beings within so many degrees minutes and seconds of latitude and longitude he also occupied himself alas with the question of their happiness it is worthy of remark madame that those who have given themselves the most concern about the happiness of peoples have made their neighbours very miserable m de lesay who was more of a geometrician than d'alembert and more of a philosopher than jean jacques was also more of a royalist than louis the eighteenth but his love for the king was nothing to his hate for the emperor he had joined the conspiracy of georges against the first consul but in the framing of the indictment he was not included among the inculpated parties having been either ignored or despised and this injury he never could forgive bonaparte whom he called the ogre of corsica and to whom he used to say he would never have confided even the command of a regiment so pitiful a soldier he judged him to be in eighteen twenty m de lesay who had then been a widower for many years married again at the age of sixty a very young woman whom he pitilessly kept at work preparing maps for him and who gave him a daughter some years after their marriage and died in childbed my mother had nursed her during her brief illness and had taken care of the child the name of that child was clementine it was from the time of that birth and that death that the relations between our family and m de lesay began in the meanwhile i had been growing dull as i began to leave my true childhood behind me i had lost the charming power of being able to see and feel and things no longer caused me those delicious surprises which form the enchantment of the more tender age for the same reason perhaps i have no distinct remembrance of the period following the birth of clementine i only know that a few months afterwards i had a misfortune the mere thought of which still wrings my heart i lost my mother a great silence a great coldness and a great darkness seemed all at once to fill the house i fell into a sort of torpor my father sent me to the lycee but i could only arouse myself from my lethargy with the greatest of effort
still i was not altogether a dullard and my professors were able to teach me almost everything they wanted namely a little greek and a great deal of latin my acquaintances were confined to the ancients i learned to esteem miltiades and to admire themistocles i became familiar with quintus fabius as far at least as it was possible to become familiar with so great a consul proud of these lofty acquaintances i scarcely ever condescended to notice little clementine and her old father who in any event went away to normandy one fine morning without my having deigned to give a moment's thought to their possible return they came back however madame they came back influences of heaven forces of nature all ye mysterious powers which vouchsafe to man the ability to love you know how i again beheld clementine they re-entered our melancholy home m de lacey no longer wore a wig bald with a few grey locks about his ruddy temples he had all the aspect of robust old age but that divine being whom i saw all resplendent as she leaned upon his arm she whose presence illuminated the old faded parlour she was not an apparition it was clementine herself i am speaking the simple truth her violet eyes seemed to me in that moment supernatural and even to-day i cannot imagine how those two living jewels could have endured the fatigues of life or become subjected to the corruption of death she betrayed a little shyness in greeting my father whom she did not remember her complexion was slightly pink and her half-open lips smiled with that smile which makes one think of the infinite perhaps because it betrays no particular thought and expresses only the joy of living and the bliss of being beautiful under a pink hood her face shone like a gem in an open casket she wore a cashmere scarf over a robe of white muslin plaited at the waist from beneath which protruded the tip of a little morocco shoe oh you must not make fun of me dear madame that was the fashion of the time and i do not know whether our new fashions have nearly so much simplicity brightness and decorous grace m de lacey informed us that in consequence of having undertaken the publication of a historical atlas he had come back to live in paris and that he would be pleased to occupy his former apartment if it was still vacant my father asked mademoiselle de lacey whether she was pleased to visit the capital she appeared to be for her smile blossomed out in reply she smiled at the windows that looked out upon the green and luminous garden she smiled at the bronze marius seated among the ruins of carthage above the dial of the clock she smiled at the old yellow velveted armchairs and at the poor student who was afraid to lift his eyes to look at her from that day how i loved her but here we are already at the rue de Sevres, and in a little while we shall be in sight of your windows i am a very bad story-teller and if i were by some impossible chance to take it into my head to compose a novel i know i should never succeed i have been drawing out to tiresome length a narrative which i must finish briefly for there is a certain delicacy a certain grace of soul which an old man could not help offending by an complacent expatiation upon the sentiments of even the purest love let us take a short turn on this boulevard lined with convents and my recital will be easily finished within the distance separating us from that little spire you see over there m de lacey on finding that i had graduated at the ecole des chartes judged me worthy to assist him in preparing his historical atlas the plan was to illustrate by a series of maps what the old philosopher termed the vicissitudes of empires from the time of noah down to that of charlemagne m de lacey had stored up in his head all the errors of the eighteenth century in regard to antiquity i belonged so far as my historical studies were concerned to the new school and i was just at that age when one does not know how to dissemble the manner in which the old man understood or rather misunderstood the epoch of the barbarians his obstinate determination to find in remote antiquity only ambitious princes hypocritical and avaricious prelates virtuous citizens poet philosophers and other personages who never existed outside of the novels of marmontel made me dreadfully unhappy and at first used to excite me into attempts at argument rational enough but perfectly useless and sometimes dangerous for m de lacey was very irascible 
and clementine was very beautiful between her and him i passed many hours of torment and of delight i was in love i was a coward and i granted to him all that he demanded of me in regard to the political and historical aspect which the earth that was at a later day to bear clementine presented in the time of abraham of menes and of deucalion as fast as we drew our maps mademoiselle de lesay tinted them in water-colours bending over the table she held the brush lightly between two fingers the shadow of her eyelashes descended upon her cheeks and bathed her half-closed eyes in a delicious penumbra sometimes she would lift her head and i would see her lips pout there was so much expression in her beauty that she could not breathe without seeming to sigh and her most ordinary poses used to throw me into the deepest ecstasies of admiration whenever i gazed at her i fully agreed with m de lesay that jupiter had once reigned as a despot king over the mountainous regions of thessaly and that orpheus had committed the imprudence of leaving the teaching of philosophy to the clergy i am not now quite sure whether i was a coward or a hero when i accorded all this to the obstinate old man mademoiselle de lesay i must acknowledge paid very little attention to me but this indifference seemed to me so just and so natural that i never even dreamed of thinking i had a right to complain about it it made me unhappy but without my knowing that i was unhappy at the time i was hopeful we had then only got as far as the first assyrian empire m de lesay came every evening to take coffee with my father i do not know how they became such friends for it would have been difficult to find two characters more oppositely constituted my father was a man who admired very few things but was still capable of excusing a great many still as he grew older he evinced more and more dislike of everything in the shape of exaggeration he clothed his ideas with a thousand delicate shades of expression and never pronounced an opinion without all sorts of reservations these conversational habits natural to a finely trained mind used greatly to irritate the dry terse old aristocrat who was never in the least disarmed by the moderation of an adversary quite the contrary i always foresaw one danger that danger was bonaparte my father had not himself retained a particular affection for his memory but having worked under his direction he did not like to hear him abused especially in favour of the bourbons against whom he had serious reason to feel resentment m de lesay more of a voltairian and a legitimist than ever now traced back to bonaparte the origin of every social political and religious evil such being the situation the idea of uncle victor made me feel particularly uneasy this terrible uncle had become absolutely insufferable now that his sister was no longer there to calm him down the harp of david was broken and saul was wholly delivered over to the spirit of madness the fall of charles x had increased the audacity of the old napoleonic veteran who uttered all imaginable bravados he no longer frequented our house which had become too silent for him but sometimes at the dinner hour we would see him suddenly make his appearance all covered with flowers like a mausoleum ordinarily he would sit down to table with an oath growled out from the very bottom of his chest and bragged between every two mouthfuls of his good fortune with the ladies as a vieux brave then when the dinner was over he would fold up his napkin in the shape of a bishop's mitre gulp down half a decanter of brandy and rush away with the hurried air of a man terrified at the mere idea of remaining for any length of time without drinking in conversation with an old philosopher and a young scholar i felt perfectly sure that if ever he and m de lesay should come together all would be lost but that day came madame the captain was almost hidden by flowers that day and seemed so much like a monument commemorating the glories of the empire that one would have liked to pass a garland of immortelles over each of his arms he was in an extraordinarily good humour and the first person to profit by that good humour was our cook for he put his arm around her waist while she was placing the roast on the table after dinner he pushed away the decanter presented to him observing that he was going to burn some brandy in his coffee later on i asked him tremblingly whether he would not prefer to have his coffee at once he was very suspicious and not at all dull of comprehension my uncle victor 
my precipitation seemed to him in very bad taste for he looked at me in a peculiar way and said patience my nephew it isn't the business of the baby of the regiment to sound the retreat devil take it you must be in a great hurry master pedant to see if i've got spurs on my boots it was evident the captain had divined that i wanted him to go and i knew him well enough to be sure that he was going to stay he stayed the least circumstances of that evening remain impressed on my memory my uncle was extremely jovial the mere idea of being in somebody's way was enough to keep him in good humour he told us in regular barrack style ma foi a certain story about a monk a trumpet and five bottles of chambertin which must have been much enjoyed in the garrison society but which i would not venture to repeat to you madame even if i could remember it when we passed into the parlour the captain called attention to the bad condition of our andirons and learnedly discoursed on the merits of rotten stone as a brass polisher not a word on the subject of politics he was husbanding his forces eight o'clock sounded from the ruins of carthage on the mantelpiece it was m de lassay's hour a few moments later he entered the parlour with his daughter the ordinary evening chat began clementine sat down and began to work on some embroidery beside the lamp whose shade left her pretty head in a soft shadow and threw down upon her fingers a radiance that made them seem almost self-luminous m de lassay spoke of a comet announced by the astronomers and developed some theories in relation to the subject which however audacious betrayed at least a certain degree of intellectual culture my father who knew a good deal about astronomy advanced some sound ideas of his own which he ended up with his eternal but what do we know about it after all in my turn i cited the opinion of our neighbour of the observatory the great arago my uncle victor declared that comets had a peculiar influence on the quality of wines and related in support of this view a jolly tavern story i was so delighted with the turn the conversation had taken that i did all in my power to maintain it in the same groove with the help of my most recent studies by a long exposition of the chemical composition of those nebulous bodies which although extending over a length of billions of leagues could be contained in a small bottle my father a little surprised at my unusual eloquence watched me with his peculiar placid ironical smile but one cannot always remain in heaven i spoke as i looked at clementine of a certain cometa of diamonds which i had been admiring in a jeweller's window the evening before it was a most unfortunate inspiration of mine ah my nephew cried uncle victor that cometa of yours was nothing to the one which the empress josephine wore in her hair when she came to strasbourg to distribute crosses to the army that little josephine was very fond of finery and display observed m de lacy between two sips of coffee i do not blame her for it she had good qualities though rather frivolous in character she was a tasher and she conferred a great honour on bonaparte by marrying him to say a tasher does not of course mean a great deal but to say a bonaparte simply means nothing at all what do you mean by that monsieur the marquis demanded captain victor i'm not a marquis dryly responded monsieur de lacy and i mean simply that bonaparte would have been very well suited had he married one of those cannibal women described by captain cook in his voyages naked tattooed with a ring in her nose devouring with delight putrefied human flesh i had foreseen it and in my anguish o oh, pitiful human heart my first idea was about the remarkable exactness of my anticipations i must say that the captain's reply belonged to the sublime order he put his arms akimbo eyed m de lacy contemptuously from head to foot and said napoleon m the vidame had another spouse besides josephine another spouse besides marie louise that companion you know nothing of but i have seen her close to me she wears a mantle of azure gemmed with stars she is crowned with laurels the cross of honour flames upon her breast her name is glory m de lacy set his cup on the mantelpiece and quietly observed your bonaparte was a blackguard my father rose up calmly extended his arm and said very softly to m de lacy whatever the man was who died at st helena i have worked for ten years in his government and my brother-in-law was three times wounded under his eagles i beg of you dear sir and friend never to forget these facts in future what the sublime and burlesque insolence of the captain could not do the courteous remonstrance of my father effected immediately throwing m de lacy into a furious passion i did forget he exclaimed between his set teeth livid in his rage and fairly foaming at the mouth the herring cask always smells of herring 
and when one has been in the service of rascals as he uttered the word the captain sprang at his throat i am sure he would have strangled him upon the spot but for his daughter and me my father a little paler than his wont stood there with his arms folded and watched the scene with a look of inexpressible pity what followed was still more lamentable but why dwell further upon the folly of two old men finally i succeeded in separating them m de Lassay made a sign to his daughter and left the room as she was following him i ran out into the stairway after her mademoiselle i said to her wildly taking her hand as i spoke i love you i love you for a moment she pressed my hand her lips opened what was it that she was going to say to me but suddenly lifting her eyes towards her father ascending the stairs she drew her hand away and made me a gesture of farewell i never saw her again her father went to live in the neighbourhood of the pantheon in an apartment which he had rented for the sale of his historical atlas he died in a few months afterward of an apoplectic stroke his daughter i was told retired to cannes to live with some aged relative it was there that later on she married a bank clerk the same noel alexandra who became so rich and died so poor as for me madame i have lived alone at peace with myself my existence equally exempt from great pains and great joys has been tolerably happy but for many years i could never see an empty chair beside my own of a winter's evening without feeling a sudden painful sinking at my heart last year i learned from you who had known her the story of her old age and death i saw her daughter at your house i have seen her but i cannot yet say like the aged man of scripture and now o lord let thy servant depart in peace for if an old fellow like me can be of any use to anybody i would wish with your help to devote my last energies and abilities to the care of this orphan i had uttered these last words in madame de garbray's own vestibule and i was about to take leave of my kind guide when she said to me my dear monsieur i cannot help you in this matter as much as i would like to do jeanne is an orphan and a minor you cannot do anything for her without the authorization of her guardian ah i exclaimed i had not the least idea in the world that jeanne had a guardian madame de gabry looked at me with visible surprise she had not expected to find the old man quite so simple she resumed the guardian of jeanne alexandre is maitre mouche notary at la valois Pare. i am afraid you will not be able to come to any understanding with him for he is a very serious person why good god i cried with what kind of people can you expect me to have any sort of understanding at my age except serious persons she smiled with a sweet mischievousness just as my father used to smile and answered with those who are like you the innocent folks who wear their hearts on their sleeves monsieur mouche is not exactly that kind he is cunning and light-fingered but although i have very little liking for him we will go together and see him if you wish and ask his permission to visit jeanne whom he has sent to a boarding-school at les Tons, where she is very unhappy we agreed at once upon a day i kissed madame de gabry's hands and we bade each other good-bye end of section eighteen section nineteen of the crime of sylvestre bonheur by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain from may two to may five i have seen him in his office maitre mouche the guardian of jeanne small thin and dry his complexion looks as if it was made out of the dust of his pigeon-holes he is a spectacled animal for to imagine him without his spectacles would be impossible i have heard him speak this maitre mouche he has a voice like a tin rattle and he uses choice phrases but i should have been better pleased if he had not chosen his phrases so carefully i have observed him this maitre mouche he is very ceremonious and watches his visitors slyly out of the corner of his eye maitre mouche is quite pleased he informs us he is delighted to find we have taken such an interest in his ward but he does not think we are placed in this world just to amuse ourselves no he does not believe it and i am free to acknowledge that anybody in his company is likely to reach the same conclusion so little is he capable of inspiring joyfulness he fears that it would be giving his dear ward a false and pernicious idea of life to allow her too much enjoyment 
it is for this reason that he requests madame de gabry not to invite the young girl to her house except at very long intervals we left the dusty notary and his dusty study with a permit in due form everything which issues from the office of maitre mouche is in due form to visit mademoiselle jeanne alexandre on the first thursday of each month at mademoiselle Préfère's private school rue de mur Terne. the first thursday in may i set out to pay a visit to mademoiselle Préfère whose establishment i discerned from afar off by a big sign painted with blue letters that blue tint was the first indication i received of mademoiselle Préfère's character which i was able to see more of later on a scared-looking servant took my card and abandoned me without one word of hope at the door of a chilly parlour full of that stale odour peculiar to the dining-rooms of educational establishments the floor of this parlour had been waxed with such pitiless energy that i remained for a while in distress upon the threshold but happily observing that little strips of woollen carpet had been scattered over the floor in front of each horsehair chair i succeeded by cautiously stepping from one carpet island to another in reaching the angle of the mantelpiece where i sat down quite out of breath over the mantelpiece in a large gilded frame was a written document entitled in flamboyant gothic lettering tableau d'honneur with a long array of names underneath among which i did not have the pleasure of finding that of jean alexandre after having read over several times the names of those girl pupils who had thus made themselves honoured in the eyes of mademoiselle Préfère, i began to feel uneasy at not hearing any one coming mademoiselle Préfère would certainly have succeeded in establishing the absolute silence of interstellar spaces throughout her pedagogical domains had it not been that the sparrows had chosen her yard to assemble in by legions and chirp at the top of their voices it was a pleasure to hear them but there was no way of seeing them through the ground glass windows i had to content myself with the sights of the parlour decorated from floor to ceiling on all of its four walls with drawings executed by the pupils of the institution there were vestals flowers thatched cottages column capitals and an enormous head of tatius king of the sabines bearing the signature estelle mouton i had already passed some time in admiring the energy with which mademoiselle mouton had delineated the bushy eyebrows and the fierce gaze of the antique warrior when a sound faint like the rustling of a dead leaf moved by the wind caused me to turn my head it was not a dead leaf at all it was mademoiselle Préfère with hands jointed before her she came gliding over the mirror polish of that wonderful floor as the saints of the golden legend were wont to glide over the crystal surface of the waters but upon any other occasion i am sure mademoiselle Préfère would not have made me think in the least about those virgins dear to mystical fancy her face rather gave me the idea of a russet apple preserved or a whole winter in an attic by some economical housekeeper her shoulders were covered with a fringed pelerine which had nothing at all remarkable about it but which she wore as if it were a sacerdotal vestment or the symbol of some high civic function i explained to her the purpose of my visit and gave her my letter of introduction ah so you are monsieur mouche she exclaimed is his health very good he is the most upright of men the most she did not finish the phrase but raised her eyes to the ceiling my own followed the direction of their gaze and observed a little spiral of paper lace suspended from the place of the chandelier which was apparently destined so far as i could discover to attract the flies away from the gilded mirror frames and the tableau d'honneur i met mademoiselle jean alexandre i observed at the residence of madame de gabry and had reason to appreciate the excellent character and quick intelligence of the young girl as i used to know her parents very well the friendship which i felt for them naturally inclines me to take an interest in her mademoiselle Préfère, in lieu of making any reply sighed profoundly pressed her mysterious pelerine to her heart and again contemplated the paper spiral at last she observed since you were once the friend of monsieur and madame alexandre i hope and trust that like monsieur mouche and myself you deplore those crazy speculations 
which led them to ruin and reduced their daughter to absolute poverty i thought to myself in hearing these words how very wrong it is to be unlucky and how unpardonable such an error on the part of those previously in a position worthy of envy their fall at once avenges and flatters us and we are wholly pitiless after having answered very frankly that i knew nothing whatever about the history of the bank i asked the schoolmistress if she was satisfied with mademoiselle alexandre that child is indomitable cried mademoiselle Prefere and she assumed an attitude of lofty resignation to symbolize the difficult situation she was placed in by a pupil so hard to train then with more calmness of manner she added the young person is not unintelligent but she cannot resign herself to learn things by rule what a strange old maid was this mademoiselle Prefere! she walked without lifting her legs and spoke without moving her lips without however considering her peculiarities for more than a reasonable instant i replied that principles were no doubt very excellent things and that i could trust myself to her judgment in regard to their value but that after all when one had learned something it is very little difference what method had been followed in the learning of it mademoiselle made a slow gesture of dissent then with a sigh she declared ah monsieur those who do not understand educational methods are apt to have very false ideas on these subjects i am certain they express their opinions with the best intentions in the world but they would do better a great deal better to leave all such questions to competent people i did not attempt to argue further and simply asked her whether i could see mademoiselle alexandre at once she looked at her pelerine as if trying to read in the entanglements of its fringes as in a conjuring book what sort of answer she ought to make then said mademoiselle alexandre has a penance to perform and a class lesson to give but i should be very sorry to let you put yourself to the trouble of coming here all to no purpose i am going to send for her only first allow me monsieur as is our custom to put your name on the visitor's register she sat down at the table opened a large copy-book and taking out maitre mouche's letter again from under her pelerine where she had placed it looked at it and began to write bona with a d is it not she asked excuse me for being so particular but my opinion is that proper names have an orthography we have dictation lessons in proper names monsieur at this school historical proper names of course after i had written down my name in a running hand she inquired whether she should not put down after it my profession title quality such as retired merchant employee independent gentleman or something else there was a column in her register expressly for that purpose my goodness madame i said if you must absolutely fill that column of yours put down member of the institute it was still mademoiselle Pefer's pelerine i saw before me but it was not mademoiselle Pefer who wore it it was a totally different person obliging gracious caressing radiant happy her eyes smiled the little wrinkles of her face there were a vast number of them also smiled her mouth smiled likewise but only on one side i discovered afterwards that was her best side she spoke her voice had also changed with her manner it was now sweet as honey you said monsieur that our dear jean was very intelligent i discovered the same thing myself and i am proud of being able to agree with you this young girl has really made me feel a great deal of interest in her she has what i call a happy disposition but excuse me for thus drawing upon your valuable time she summoned a servant girl who looked much more hurried and scared than before and who vanished with the order to go and tell mademoiselle alexandre that monsieur sylvestre bonnard member of the institute was waiting to see her in the parlor mademoiselle Prefere had hoped barely time to confide in me that she had the most profound respect for all decisions of the institute whatever they might be when jeanne appeared out of breath red as a poppy with her eyes very wide open and her arms dangling helplessly at her sides charming in her artless awkwardness what a state you are in my dear child murmured mademoiselle Prefere, with maternal sweetness as she arranged the girl's collar jeanne certainly did present an odd aspect 
her hair combed back and imperfectly held by a net from which loose curls were escaping her slender arms sheathed down to the elbows in lustring sleeves her hands which she did not seem to know what to do with all red with chilblains her dress much too short revealing that she had on stockings much too large for her and shoes worn down at the heel and a skipping rope tied round her waist in lieu of a belt all combined to lend mademoiselle jeanne an appearance the reverse of presentable oh you crazy girl sighed mademoiselle Prefere, who now seemed no longer like a mother but rather like an elder sister then she suddenly left the room gliding like a shadow over the polished floor i said to jean sit down jean and talk to me as you would to a friend are you not better satisfied here now than you were last year she hesitated then answered with a good-natured smile of resignation not much better i asked her to tell me about her school life she began at once to enumerate all her different studies piano style chronology of the kings of france sewing drawing catechism deportment i could never remember them all she still held in her hands all unconsciously the two ends of her skipping rope and she raised and lowered them regularly while making her enumeration then all at once she became conscious of what she was doing blushed stammered and became so confused that i had to renounce my desire to know the full programme of study adopted in the prefere institution after having questioned jean on various matters and obtained only the vaguest of answers i perceived that her young mind was totally absorbed by the skipping rope and i entered bravely into that grave subject so you have been skipping i said it is a very nice amusement but one that you must not exert yourself too much at for any excessive exercise of that kind might seriously injure your health and i should be very much grieved about it jean i should be very much grieved indeed you are very kind monsieur the young girl said to have come to see me and talk to me like this i did not think about thanking you when i came in because i was too much surprised have you seen madame de gabry please tell me something about her monsieur madame de gabry i answered is very well i can only tell you about her jean what an old gardener once said of the lady of the castle his mistress when somebody anxiously inquired about her madame is in her road yes madame de gabry is in her own road and you know jean what a good road it is and how steadily she can walk upon it i went out with her the other day very very far away from the house and we talked about you we talked about you my child at your mother's grave i am very glad said jean and then all at once she began to cry i felt too much reverence for those generous tears to attempt in any way to check the emotion that had evoked them but in a little while as the girl wiped her eyes i asked her will you not tell me jean why you were thinking so much about that skipping rope a little while ago why indeed i will monsieur it was only because i had no right to come into the parlour with a skipping rope you know of course that i am past the age for playing at skipping but when the servant said there was an old gentleman oh i mean that a gentleman was waiting for me in the parlour i was making the little girls jump then i tied the rope around my waist in a hurry so that it might not get lost it was wrong but i have not been in the habit of having many people come to see me and mademoiselle Prefere never lets us off if we commit any breach of department so i know she is going to punish me and i am very sorry about it that is too bad jean she became very grave and said yes monsieur it is too bad because when i am punished myself i have no more authority over the little girls i did not at once fully understand the nature of this unpleasantness but jean explained to me that as she was charged by mademoiselle Prefere with the duties of taking care of the youngest class of washing and dressing the children of teaching them how to behave how to sew how to say the alphabet of showing them how to play and finally of putting them to bed at the close of the day she could not make herself obeyed by those turbulent little folks on the days she was condemned to wear a nightcap in the classroom or to eat her meal standing up from a plate turned upside down having secretly admired the punishments devised by the lady of the enchanted pelerine i responded then if i understand you rightly jean you are at once a pupil here and a mistress it is a condition of existence very common in the world you are punished and you punish oh monsieur she exclaimed no i never punish then i suspect said i 
that your indulgence gets you many scoldings from mademoiselle Prefere. she smiled and blinked then i said to her that the troubles in which we often involve ourselves by trying to act according to our conscience and to do the best we can are never of the sort that totally dishearten and weary us but are on the contrary wholesome trials this sort of philosophy touched her very little she even appeared totally unmoved by my moral exhortations but was not this quite natural on her part and ought i not to have remembered that it is only those no longer innocent who can find pleasure in the systems of moralists i had at least good sense enough to cut short my sermonizing jean i said you were asking a moment ago about madame de gabry let us talk about that fairy of yours she was very prettily made do you do any modelling in wax now i have not a bit of wax she exclaimed wringing her hands no wax at all no wax i cried in a republic of busy bees she laughed and then you see monsieur my figurines as you call them are not in mademoiselle prefere's programme but i had begun to make a very small saint georges for madame de gabry a tiny little saint georges with a golden cuirass is not that right monsieur bonnard to give saint georges a gold cuirass quite right jean but what became of it i'm going to tell you i kept it in my pocket because i had no other place to put it and and i sat down on it by mistake she drew out of her pocket a little wax figure which had been squeezed out of all resemblance to human form and of which the dislocated limbs were only attached to the body by their wire framework at the sight of her hero thus marred she was seized at once with compassion and gaiety the latter feeling obtained the mastery and she burst into a clear laugh which however stopped as suddenly as it had begun mademoiselle prefere stood at the parlour door smiling that dear child sighed the schoolmistress in her tenderest tone i am afraid she will tire you and then your time is so precious i begged mademoiselle prefere to dismiss that illusion and rising to take my leave i took from my pocket some chocolate cakes and sweets which i had brought with me that is so nice says jean there will be enough to go round the whole school the lady of the pelerine intervened mademoiselle alexandra she said thank monsieur for his generosity jeanne looked at her for an instant in a sullen way then turning to me said with remarkable firmness monsieur i thank you for your kindness in coming to see me jeanne i said pressing both her hands remain always a good truthful brave girl good-bye as she left the room with her packages of chocolate and confectionery she happened to strike the handles of her skipping rope against the back of a chair mademoiselle prefere full of indignation pressed both hands over her heart under her pelerine and i almost expected to see her give up her scholastic ghost when we found ourselves alone she recovered her composure and i must say without considering myself thereby flattered that she smiled upon me with one whole side of her face mademoiselle i said taking advantage of her good humour i notice that jean alexandre looks a little pale you know better than i how much consideration and care a young girl requires at her age it would only be doing you an injustice by implication to recommend her still more earnestly to your vigilance these words seemed to ravish her with delight she lifted her eyes as in ecstasy to the paper spirals of the ceiling and clasping her hands exclaimed how well these eminent men know the art of considering the most trifling details i called her attention to the fact that the health of a young girl was not a trifling detail and made my farewell bow but she stopped me on the threshold to say to me very confidentially you must excuse me monsieur i am a woman and i love glory i cannot conceal from you the fact that i feel myself greatly honoured by the presence of a member of the institute in my humble institution i duly excuse the weakness of mademoiselle prefere and thinking only of jeanne with the blindness of egotism kept asking myself all along the road what are we going to do with this child End of section nineteen section twenty of the crime of sylvestre bonheur by anatole france 
this librivox recording is in the public domain june three i had escorted to the cimetiere de marne that day a very aged colleague of mine who to use the words of goethe had consented to die the great goethe whose own vital force was something extraordinary actually believed that no one dies until one really wants to die that is to say when all those energies which resist dissolution and the sum of which make up life itself have been totally destroyed in other words he believed that people only die when it is no longer possible for them to live good it is merely a question of properly understanding one another and when fully comprehended the magnificent idea of goethe only brings us quietly back to the song of la palice well my excellent colleague had consented to die thanks to several successive attacks of extremely persuasive apoplexy the last of which proved unanswerable i had been very little acquainted with him during his lifetime but it seems that i became his friend the moment he was dead for our colleagues assured me in a most serious manner with deeply sympathetic countenances that i should act as one of the pallbearers and deliver an address over the tomb after having read very badly a short address i had written as well as i could which is not saying much for it i started out for a walk in the woods of ville d'avray and followed without leaning too much on the captain's cane a shaded path on which the sunlight fell through foliage in little discs of gold never had the scent of grass and fresh leaves never had the beauty of the sky over the trees and the serene might of noble tree contours so deeply affected my senses and all my being and the pleasure i felt in that silence broken only by faintest tinkling sounds was at once of the senses and of the soul i sat down in the shade of the roadside under a clump of young oaks and there i made a promise to myself not to die or at least not to consent to die before i should be again able to sit down under an oak where in the great peace of the open country i could meditate on the nature of the soul and the ultimate destiny of man a bee whose brown breastplate gleamed in the sun-like armour of old gold came to light upon a mallow flower close by me darkly rich in colour and fully opened upon its tufted stalk it was certainly not the first time i had witnessed so common an incident but it was the first time that i had watched it with such comprehensive and friendly curiosity i could discern that there were all sorts of sympathies between the insect and the flower a thousand singular little relationships which i had never before even suspected satiated with nectar the insect rose and buzzed away in a straight line while i lifted myself up as best i could and readjusted myself upon my legs adieu i said to the flower and to the bee adieu heaven grant i may live long enough to discover the secret of your harmonies i am very tired but man is so made that he can only find relaxation from one kind of labour by taking up another the flowers and insects will give me that relaxation with god's will after my long researches in philology and diplomatics how full of meaning is that old myth of antaeus i have touched the earth and i am a new man and now at seventy years of age new feelings of curiosity take birth in my mind even as young shoots sometimes spring up from the hollow trunk of an aged oak End of section twenty. section twenty one of the crime of sylvestre bonheur by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain june four i like to look out of my window at the seine and its keys on those soft grey mornings which give such an infinite tenderness of tint to everything i have seen that azure sky which flings so luminous a calm over the bay of naples but our parisian sky is more animated more kindly more spiritual it smiles threatens caresses takes an aspect of melancholy or a look of merriment like a human gaze 
at this moment it is pouring down a very gentle light on the men and beasts of the city as they accomplish their daily tasks over there on the opposite bank the stevedores of the port saint nicolas are unloading a cargo of cows horns while two men standing on a gangway are tossing sugar loaves from one to the other and thence to somebody in the hold of a steamer on the north quay the cab horses standing in a line under the shade of the plane trees each with its head in a nose-bag are quietly munching their oats while the rubicon drivers are drinking at the counter of the wine-cellar opposite but all the while keeping a sharp lookout for early customers the dealers in second-hand books put their boxes on the parapet these good retailers of mind who are always in the open air with blouses loose to the breeze have become so weather-beaten by the wind the rain the frost the snow the fog and the great sun that they end by looking very much like the old statues of cathedrals they are all friends of mine and i scarcely ever pass by their boxes without picking out of one of them some old book which i had always been in need of up to that very moment without any suspicion of the fact on my part then on my return home i have to endure the outcries of my housekeeper who accuses me of bursting all my pockets and filling the house with waste paper to attract the rats therese is wise about that and it is because she is wise that i do not listen to her for in spite of my tranquil mien i have always preferred the folly of the passions to the wisdom of indifference but just because my own passions are not of that sort which burst out with violence to devastate and kill the common mind is not aware of their existence nevertheless i am greatly moved by them at times and it has more than once been my fate to lose my sleep for the sake of a few pages written by some forgotten monk or printed by some humble apprentice of peter schaeffer and if these fierce enthusiasms are slowly being quenched in me it is only because i am being slowly quenched myself our passions are ourselves my old books are me i am just as old and thumb-worn as they are a light breeze sweeps away along with the dust of the pavements the winged seeds of the plane trees and the fragments of hay drop from the mouths of the horses the dust is nothing remarkable in itself but as i watch it flying i remember a moment in my childhood when i watched just such a swirl of dust and my old parisian soul is much affected by that sudden recollection all that i see from my window that horizon which extends to the left as far as the hills of chaillot and enables me to distinguish the arc de triomphe like a die of stone the seine river of glory and its bridges the ash trees of the terrace of the tuileries the louvre of the renaissance cut and graven like goldsmith work and on my right towards the pont neuf pont lutetia novus dictus as it is named on old engravings all the old and venerable part of paris with its towers and spires all that is my life it is myself and i should be nothing but for all those things which are thus reflected in me through my thousand varying shades of thought inspiring me and animating me that is why i love paris with an immense love and nevertheless i am weary and i know that there can be no rest for me in the heart of this great city which thinks so much which has taught me to think and which forever urges me to think more and how avoid being excited among all these books which incessantly tempt my curiosity without ever satisfying it at one moment it is a date i have to look for at another it is the name of a place i have to make sure of or some quaint term of which it is important to determine the exact meaning words why yes words as a philologist i am their sovereign they are my subjects and like a good king i devote my whole life to them but shall i not be able to abdicate some day 
i have an idea that there is somewhere or other quite far from here a certain little cottage where i could enjoy the quiet i so much need while awaiting that day in which a greater quiet that which can be never broken shall come to wrap me all about i dream of a bench before the threshold and a field spreading away out of sight but i must have a fresh smiling young face beside me to reflect and concentrate all that freshness of nature i could then imagine myself a grandfather and all the long void of my life would be filled i am not a violent man and yet i become easily vexed and all my works have caused me quite as much pain as pleasure and i do not know how it is that i still keep thinking about that very conceited and very inconsiderated impertinence which my young friend of the luxembourg took the liberty to utter about me some three months ago i do not call him friend in irony for i love studious youth with all its temerities and imaginative eccentricities still my young friend certainly went beyond all bounds master amboise Par, pare who was the first to attempt the ligature of arteries and who having commenced his profession at a time when surgery was only performed by quack barbers nevertheless succeeded in lifting the science to the high place it now occupies was assailed in his old age by all the young sawbones apprentices being grossly abused during a discussion by some young addlehead who might have been the best son in the world but who certainly lacked all sense of respect the old master answered him in his treatise de la mumie de la licorne de venin et de la peste i pray him said the great man i pray him that if he desire to make any contradictions to my reply he abandon all animosities and treat the good old man with gentleness this answer seems admirable from the pen of ambroise pare and even had it been written by a village bonesetter grown grey in his calling and mocked by some young stripling it would still be worthy of all praise it might perhaps seem that my memory of the incident had been kept alive only by a base feeling of resentment i thought so myself at first and reproached myself for thus dwelling on the saying of a boy who could not yet know the meaning of his own words but my reflections on this subject subsequently took a better course that is why i now note them down in my diary i remember that one day when i was twenty years old that was more than half a century ago i was walking about in that very same garden of the luxembourg with some comrades we were talking about our old professors and one of us happened to name monsieur petit radel an estimable and learned man who was the first to throw some light upon the origins of early etruscan civilization but who had been unfortunate enough to prepare a chronological table of the lovers of helen we all laughed a great deal about that chronological table and i cried out petit radel is an ass not in three letters but in twelve whole volumes this foolish speech of my adolescence was uttered too lightly to be a weight on my conscience as an old man may god kindly prove to me some day that i never used a less innocent shaft of speech in the battle of life but i now ask myself whether i really never wrote at any time in my life something quite as unconsciously absurd as the chronological table of the lovers of helen the progress of science renders useless the very books which have been the greatest aids to that progress as those works are no longer useful modern youth is naturally inclined to believe they never had any value it despises them and ridicules them if they happen to contain any superannuated opinion whatever that is why in my twentieth year i amused myself at the expense of monsieur petit radel and his chronological table and that was why the other day at the luxembourg my young and irreverent friend rentre en toi-même octave et cesse de te plaindre quoi tu veux quand t'épargne et n'a rien épargne look into thyself octavius and cease complaining what thou wouldst be spared and thou thyself hast spared none End of section twenty one section twenty two of the crime of sylvestre bonheur by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain june six it was the first thursday in june i shut up my books and took my leave of the holy abbot dractovius who being now in the enjoyment of celestial bliss 
cannot feel very impatient to behold his name and works glorified on earth through the humble compilation being prepared by my hands must i confess it that mallow plant i saw visited by a bee the other day has been occupying my thoughts much more than all the ancient abbots who ever bore grosier or wore mitres there is in one of sprengel's books which i read in my youth at that time when i used to read in my youth at that time when i used to read anything and everything some ideas about loves of flowers which now return to memory after having been forgotten for half a century and which to-day interests me so much that i regret not to have devoted the humble capacities of my mind to the study of insects and of plants and only a while ago my housekeeper surprised me at the kitchen window in the act of examining some wallflowers through a magnifying glass it was while looking for my cravat that i made these reflections but after searching to no purpose in a great number of drawers i found myself obliged after all to have recourse to my housekeeper therese came limping in monsieur she said you ought to have told me you were going out and i would have given you your cravat but therese i replied would it not be a great deal better to put in some place where i could find it without your help therese did not deign to answer me therese no longer allows me to arrange anything i cannot even have a handkerchief without asking her for it and as she is deaf crippled and what is worse beginning to lose her memory i languish in perpetual destitution but she exercises her domestic authority with such quiet pride that i do not feel the courage to attempt a coup d'etat against her government my cravat therese do you hear my cravat if you drive me wild like this with your slow ways it will not be a cravat i shall need but a rope to hang myself you must be in a very great hurry monsieur replied therese your cravat is not lost nothing is ever lost in this house because i have charge of everything but please allow me the time at least to find it yet here i thought to myself here is the result of half a century of devotedness and self-sacrifice ah if by any happy chance this inexorable therese had once in her whole life only once failed in her duty as a servant if she had ever been at fault for one single instant she could never have assumed this inflexible authority over me and i should at least have the courage to resist her but how can one resist virtue the people who have no weaknesses are terrible there is no way of taking advantage of them just look at therese for example she has not a single fault for which you can blame her she has no doubt of herself nor of god nor of the world she is the valiant woman the wise virgin of scripture others may know nothing about her but i know her worth in my fancy i always see her carrying a lamp a humble kitchen lamp illuminating the beams of some rustic roof a lamp which will never go out while suspended from that meagre arm of hers scraggy and strong as a vine branch therese my cravat don't you know wretched woman that to-day is the first thursday in june and that mademoiselle jean will be waiting for me the schoolmistress has certainly had the parlour floor vigorously waxed i am sure one can look at oneself in it now and it will be quite a consolation for me when i slip and break my old bones upon it which is sure to happen sooner or later to see my rueful countenance reflected in it as in a looking-glass then taking for my model that amiable and admirable hero whose image is carved upon the handle of uncle victor's walking-stick i will control myself so as not to make too ugly a grimace see what a splendid sun the keys are all gilded by it and the sand smiles in countless little flashing wrinkles the city is gold a dust haze blonde and gold toned as a woman's hair floats above its beautiful contours therese my cravat ah, i can now comprehend the wisdom of that old chrysal who used to keep his neckbands in a big plutarch hereafter i shall follow his example by laying all my neckties away between the leaves of the acta sanctorum therese let me talk on and keeps looking for the necktie in silence i hear a gentle ringing at our door-bell therese i exclaim there is somebody ringing the bell give me my cravat and go to the door or rather go to the door first and then with the help of heaven you will give me my cravat but please do not stand there between the clothes press and the door like an old hack-horse between two saddles therese marched to the door as if advancing upon the enemy my excellent housekeeper becomes more inhospitable the older she grows every stranger is an object of suspicion to her according to her own assertion this disposition is the result of a long experience with human nature i had not the time to consider whether the same experience on the part of another experimenter would produce the same results 
maitre mouche was waiting to see me in the ante-room maitre mouche is still more yellow than i had believed him to be he wears blue glasses and his eyes keep moving uneasily behind them like mice running about behind a screen maitre mouche excuses himself for having intruded upon me at a moment when he does not characterize the moment but i think he means to say a moment in which i happen to be without my cravat it is not my fault as you very well know maitre mouche who does not know does not appear to be at all shocked however he is only afraid that he might have dropped in at the wrong moment i succeeded in partially reassuring him at once upon that point he then tells me it is as guardian of mademoiselle alexandre that he has come to talk with me first of all he desires that i shall not hereafter pay any heed to those restrictions he had at first deemed necessary to put upon the permit given to visit mademoiselle jeanne at the boarding-school henceforth the establishment of mademoiselle prefere will be open to me any day that i might choose to call between the hours of midday and four o'clock knowing the interest i have taken in the young girl he considers it his duty to give me some information about the person to whom he has confided his ward mademoiselle prefere whom he has known for many years is in possession of his utmost confidence mademoiselle prefere is in his estimation an enlightened person of excellent morals and capable of giving excellent counsel mademoiselle prefere he said to me has principles and principles are rare these days monsieur everything has been totally changed and this epoch of ours cannot compare with the preceding ones my stairway is a good example monsieur i replied twenty-five years ago it used to allow me to climb it without any trouble and now it takes my breath away and wears my legs out before i have climbed half a dozen steps it has had its character spoiled then there are those journals and books i used once to devour without difficulty by moonlight to-day even in the brightest sunlight they mock my curiosity and exhibit nothing but a blur of white and black when i have not got my spectacles on then the gout has got into my limbs that is another malicious trick of the times not only that monsieur gravely replied maitre mouche but what is really unfortunate in our epoch is that no one is satisfied with his position from the top of society to the bottom in every class there prevails a discontent a restlessness a love of comfort mon dieu monsieur i exclaimed you think this love of comfort is a sign of the times men have never had at any epoch a love of discomfort they have always tried to better their condition this constant effort produces constant changes and the effort is always going on that is all there is about it ah monsieur replied maitre mouche it is easy to see that you live in your books out of the business world altogether you do not see as i see them the conflicts of interest the struggle for money it is the same effervescence in all minds great or small the wildest speculations are being everywhere indulged in what i see around me simply terrifies me i wondered within myself whether maitre mouche had called upon me only for the purpose of expressing his virtuous misanthropy but all at once i heard words of a more consoling character issue from his lips maitre mouche began to speak to me of virginie prefere as a person worthy of respect of esteem and of sympathy highly honourable capable of great devotedness cultivated discreet able to read aloud remarkably well extremely modest and skilful in the art of applying blisters then i began to understand that he had only been painting that dismal picture of universal corruption in order the better to bring out by contrast the virtues of the schoolmistress i was further informed that the institution in the rue de Mour was well patronized prosperous and enjoyed a high reputation with the public maitre mouche lifted up his hand with a black woollen glove on it as if making oath to the truth of these statements then he added i am enabled by the very character of my profession to know a great deal about people a notary is to a certain extent a father confessor i deemed it my duty monsieur to give you this agreeable information at the moment when a lucky chance enabled you to meet mademoiselle prefere there is only one thing more which i would like to say this lady who is of course quite unaware of my action in the matter spoke to me of you the other day in terms of deepest sympathy i could only weaken their expression by repeating them to you and furthermore i could not repeat them without betraying to a certain extent the confidence of mademoiselle prefere do not betray it monsieur do not betray it i responded to tell you the truth i had no idea that mademoiselle prefere knew anything whatever about me but since you have the influence of an old friend with her 
i will take advantage of your good will monsieur to ask you to exercise that influence in behalf of mademoiselle jeanne alexandre the child for she is still a child is overloaded with work she is at once a pupil and a mistress she is overtasked besides she is punished in petty disgusting ways and hers is one of those generous natures which will be forced into revolt by such continual humiliation alas replied maitre mouche she must be trained to take her part in the struggle of life one does not come into this world simply to amuse oneself and to do just what one pleases one comes into this world i responded rather warmly to enjoy what is beautiful and what is good and to do as one pleases when the things one wants to do are noble intelligent and generous an education which does not cultivate the will is an education that depraves the mind it is a teacher's duty to teach the pupil how to will i perceived that maitre mouche began to think me a rather silly man with a great deal of quiet self-assurance he proceeded you must remember monsieur that the education of the poor has to be conducted with a great deal of circumspection and with a view to that future state of dependence they must occupy in society perhaps you are not aware that the late noel alexandre died a bankrupt and that his daughter is being educated almost by charity oh monsieur i exclaimed do not say it to say it is to pay oneself back and then the statement ceases to be true the liabilities of the estate continued the notary exceeded the assets but i was able to effect a settlement with the creditors in favour of the minor he undertook to explain matters in detail i declined to listen to these explanations being incapable of understanding business methods in general and those of maitre mouche in particular the notary then took it upon himself to justify mademoiselle profere's educational system and observed by way of conclusion it is not by amusing oneself that one can learn it is only by amusing oneself that one can learn i replied the whole art of teaching is only the art of awakening the natural curiosity of young minds for the purpose of satisfying it afterwards and curiosity itself can be vivid and wholesome only in proportion as the mind is contented and happy those acquirements crammed by force into the minds of children simply clog and stifle intelligence in order that knowledge be properly digested it must have been swallowed with a good appetite i know jean if that child were entrusted to my care i should make of her not a learned woman for i would look to her future happiness only but a child full of bright intelligence and full of life in whom everything beautiful in art or nature would awaken some gentle responsive thrill i would teach her to live in sympathy with all that is beautiful comely landscapes the ideal scenes of poetry and history the emotional charm of noble music i would make lovable to her everything i would wish her to love even her needlework i would make pleasurable to her by a proper choice of fabrics the style of embroideries the designs of lace i would give her a beautiful dog and a pony to teach her how to manage animals i would give her birds to take care of so that she could learn the value of even a drop of water and a crumb of bread and in order that she should have a still higher pleasure i would train her to find delight in exercising charity and inasmuch as none of us may escape pain i should teach her that christian wisdom which elevates us above all suffering and gives a beauty even to grief itself that is my idea of the right way to educate a young girl i yield monsieur replied maitre mouche joining his black gloved hands together and he rose of course you understand i remarked as i went to the door with him that i do not pretend for a moment to impose my educational system upon mademoiselle Prefere. it is necessarily a private one and quite incompatible with the organization of even the best managed boarding-schools i only ask you to persuade her to give jean less work and more play and not to punish her except in case of absolute necessity and to let her have as much freedom of mind and body as the regulations of the institution permit it was with a pale and mysterious smile that maitre mouche informed me that my observations would be taken in good part and should receive all possible consideration therewith he made me a little bow and took his departure leaving me with a peculiar feeling of discomfort and uneasiness i have met a great many strange characters in my time but never any at all resembling either this notary or this schoolmistress End of section twenty two section twenty three of the crime of sylvestre bonnard by anatole france 
this librivox recording is in the public domain july six maitre mouche has so much delayed me by his visit that i gave up going to see jean that day professional duties kept me very busy for the rest of the week although at the age when most men retire altogether from active life i am still attached by a thousand ties to the society in which i have lived i have to reside at meetings of academies scientific congresses assemblies of various learned bodies i am overburdened with honorary functions i have seven of these in one governmental department alone the bureau would be very glad to get rid of them but habit is stronger than both of us together and i continue to hobble up the stairs of various government buildings old clerks point me out to each other as i go by like a ghost wandering through the corridors when one has become very old one finds it extremely difficult to disappear nevertheless it is time as the old song says de prendre ma retraite et de songer à faire enfin to retire on my pension and prepare myself to die a good death an old marchioness who used to be a friend of helvetius in her youth and whom i once met at my father's house when a very old woman was visited during her last sickness by the priest of her parish who wanted to prepare her to die is that really necessary she asked i see everybody else manage it perfectly well the first time my father went to see her very soon afterwards and found her extremely ill good evening my friend she said pressing his hand i am going to see whether god improves upon acquaintance so were wont to die the belles amis of the philosophers such an end is certainly not vulgar nor impertinent and such levities are not of the sort that emanate from dull minds nevertheless they shock me neither my fears nor my hopes could accommodate themselves to such a mode of departure i would like to make mine with a perfectly collected mind and that is why i must begin to think in a year or two about some way of belonging to myself otherwise i should certainly risk but hush let him not hear his name and turn to look as he passes by i can still lift my faggot without his aid i found jeanne very happy indeed she told me that on the thursday previous after the visit of her guardian mademoiselle prefere had set her free from the ordinary regulations and lightened her tasks in several ways since that lucky thursday she could walk in the garden which only lacked leaves and flowers as much as she liked and she had been given facilities to work at her unfortunate little figure of saint georges she said to me with a smile i know very well that i owe all of this to you i tried to talk with her about other matters but i remarked that she could not attend to what i was saying in spite of her effort to do so i see you are thinking about something else i said well tell me what it is for if you do not we shall not be able to talk to each other at all which would be very unworthy of both of us she answered oh i was really listening to you monsieur but it is true that i was thinking about something else you will excuse me won't you i could not help thinking that mademoiselle prefere must like you very very much indeed to have become so good to me all of a sudden then she looked at me in an odd smiling frightened way which made me laugh does that surprise you i asked very much she replied please tell me why because i can see no reason no reason at all but there no reason at all why you should please mademoiselle prefere so much so then you think i'm very displeasing jean she bit her lips as if to punish them for having made a mistake and then in a coaxing way looking at me with great soft eyes gentle and beautiful as a spaniel's she said i know i said a foolish think but still i do not see any reason why you should be so pleasing to mademoiselle prefere and nevertheless you seem to please her a great deal a very great deal she called me one day and asked me all sorts of questions about you really yes she wanted to find out all about your house just think she even asked me how old your servant was and jean burst out laughing 
well what do you think about it i asked she remained a long while with her eyes fixed on the worn-out cloth of her shoes and seemed to be thinking very deeply finally looking up again she answered i am distrustful isn't it very natural to feel uneasy about what one cannot understand i know i am foolish but you won't be offended with me will you why certainly not jean i'm not a bit offended with you i must acknowledge that i was beginning to share her surprise and i began to turn over in my old head the singular thought of this young girl one is uneasy about what one cannot understand but with a fresh burst of merriment she cried out she asked me guess i will give you a hundred guesses a thousand guesses you give it up she asked me if you liked good eating and how did you receive this shower of interrogations jean i replied i don't know mademoiselle and mademoiselle then said to me you are a little fool the least details of the life of an eminent man ought to be observed pleased to know mademoiselle that monsieur sylvestre bonheur is one of the glories of france stuff i exclaimed and what did you think about it mademoiselle i thought that mademoiselle prefer was right but i don't care at all i know it is naughty what i am going to say i don't care a bit not a bit whether mademoiselle prefer is or is not right about anything well then content yourself jean mademoiselle prefer was not right yes yes she was quite right that time but i wanted to love everybody who loved you everybody without exception and i cannot do it because it would never be possible for me to love mademoiselle prefer listen jean i answered very seriously mademoiselle prefer has become good to you try now to be good to her she answered sharply it is very easy for mademoiselle prefer to be good to me and it would be very difficult indeed for me to be good to her i then said in a still more serious tone my child the authority of a teacher is sacred you must consider your schoolmistress as occupying the place to you of the mother whom you lost i had scarcely uttered this solemn stupidity when i bitterly regretted it the child turned pale and the tears sprang to her eyes oh monsieur she cried how could you say such a thing you you never knew mamma i just heaven i did know her mamma and how indeed could i have been foolish enough to have said what i did she repeated as if to herself mamma my dear mamma my poor mamma a lucky chance prevented me from playing the fool any further i do not know how it happened at that moment i looked as if i was going to cry at my age one does not cry it must have been a bad cough which brought the tears into my eyes but anyhow appearances were in my favour jean was deceived by them oh what a pure and radiant smile suddenly shone out under her beautiful wet eyelashes like sunshine among branches after a summer shower we took each other by the hand and sat a long while without saying a word absolutely happy those celestial harmonies which i once thought i heard thrilling through my soul while i knelt before that tomb to which a saintly woman had guided me suddenly awoke again in my heart slow swelling through the blissful moments with infinite softness doubtless the child whose hand pressed my own also heard them and then elevated by their enchantment above the material world the poor old man and the artless young girl both knew that a tender ghostly presence was making sweetness all about them my child i said at last i am very old and many secrets of life which you will only learn little by little have been revealed to me believe me the future is shaped out of the past whatever you can do to live contentedly here without impatience and without fretting will help you live some future day in peace and joy in your own home be gentle and learn how to suffer when one suffers patiently one suffers less if you should be badly treated madame de gapery and i would both consider ourselves badly treated in your person 
is your health very good indeed dear monsieur it was mademoiselle prefere approaching stealthily behind us who had asked the question with a peculiar smile my first idea was to tell her to go to the devil my second that her mouth was as little suited for smiling as a frying-pan for musical purposes my third was to answer her politely and assure her that i hoped she was very well she sent the young girl out to take a walk in the garden then pressing one hand upon her pelerine and extending the other towards the tableau d'honneur she showed me the name of jean alexandre written at the head of the list in large text i am very much pleased i said to her to find that you are satisfied with the behaviour of that child nothing could delight me more and i am inclined to attribute this happy result to your affectionate vigilance i have taken the liberty to send you a few books which i think may serve both to instruct and to amuse young girls you will be able to judge by glancing over them whether they are adapted to the perusal of mademoiselle alexandre and her companions the gratitude of the schoolmistress not only overflowed in words but seemed about to take the form of tearful sensibility in order to change the subject i observed what a beautiful day this is yes she replied and if this weather continues those dear children will have a nice time for their enjoyment i suppose you are referring to the holidays but mademoiselle alexandre who has no relatives cannot go away what in the world is she going to do all alone in this great big house oh we will do everything we can to amuse her i will take her to the museums and she hesitated blushed and continued and to your house if you will permit me why of course i exclaimed that is a first-rate idea we separated very good friends with one another i with her because i had been able to obtain what i desired she with me for no appreciable motive which fact according to plato elevated her into the highest rank of the hierarchy of souls and nevertheless it is not without a presentiment of evil that i find myself on the point of introducing this person into my house and i would be very glad indeed to see jean in charge of anybody else rather than of her maitre mouche and mademoiselle profere are characters whom i cannot at all understand i never can imagine why they say what they do say nor why they do what they do they have a mysterious something in common which makes me feel uneasy as jean said to me a little while ago one is uneasy about what one cannot understand alas at my age one has learned only too well how little sincerity there is in life one has learned only too well how much one loses by living a long time in this world and one feels that one can no longer trust any except the young End of section twenty three section twenty four of the crime of sylvester bonal by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain august twelfth i waited for them in fact i waited for them very impatiently i exerted all my powers of insinuation and of coaxing to induce therese to receive them kindly but my powers in this direction are very limited they came jean was neater and prettier than i had ever expected to see her she is not it is true anything approaching the charm of her mother but to-day for the first time i observed that she has a pleasing face and a pleasing face is of great advantage to a woman in this world i think that her hat was a little on one side but she smiled and the city of books was all illuminated by that smile i watched therese to see whether the rigid manners of the old housekeeper would soften a little at the sight of the young girl i saw her turning her lustreless eyes upon jean i saw her long wrinkled face her toothless mouth 
and that pointed chin of hers like the chin of some puissant old fairy and that was all i could see mademoiselle prefere made her appearance all in blue advanced retreated skipped tripped cried out sighed cast her eyes down rolled her eyes up bewildered herself with excuses said she dared not and nevertheless dared said she would never dare again and nevertheless dared again made courtesies innumerable made in short all the fuss she could what a lot of books she screamed and have you really read them all monsieur bonnard alas i have i replied and that is just the reason that i do not know anything for there is not a single one of those books which does not contradict some other book so that by the time one has read them all one does not know what to think about anything that is just my condition madame thereupon she called jean for the purpose of communicating her impressions but jean was looking out of the window how beautiful it is she said to us how i love to see the river flowing it makes you think about all kinds of things mademoiselle prefer having removed her hat and exhibited a forehead tricked out with blonde curls my housekeeper sturdily snatched up the hat at once with the observation that she did not like to see people's clothes scattered over the furniture then she approached jeanne and asked her for her things calling her my little lady whereupon the little lady giving up her cloak and hat exposed to view a very graceful neck and a lithe figure whose outlines were beautifully relieved against the great glow of the open window and i could have wished that some one else might have seen her at that moment some one very different from an aged housekeeper a schoolmistress frizzled like a sheep and this old humbug of an archivist and paleographer so you are looking at the sun i said to her see how it sparkles in the sun yes she replied leaning over the window bar it looks like a flowing of fire but see how nice and cool it looks on the other side over there under the shadow of the willows that little spot there pleases me better than all the rest good i answered i see that the river has a charm for you how would you like with mademoiselle prefere's permission to make a trip of st cloud we should certainly be in time to catch the steamboat just below the pont royal jeanne was delighted with my suggestion and mademoiselle prefere willing to make any sacrifice but my housekeeper was not at all willing to let us go off so unconcernedly she summoned me into the dining-room whither i followed her in fear and trembling monsieur she said to me as soon as we found ourselves alone you never think about anything and it is always i who have to think about everything luckily for you i have a good memory i did not think that it was a favourable moment for any attempt to dispel this wild illusion she continued so you are going off without saying a word to me about what this little lady likes to eat at her age one does not know anything one does not care about anything in particular one eats like a bird you yourself monsieur are very difficult to please but at least you know what is good it is very different with these young people they do not know anything about cooking it is often the very best thing which they think the worst and what is bad seems to them good because their stomachs are not quite formed yet so that one never knows just what to do for them tell me if the little lady would like a pigeon cooked with green peas and whether she is fond of vanilla ice-cream my good therese i answered just do whatever you think best and whatever that may be i am sure it will be very nice those ladies will be quite contented with our humble ordinary fare therese replied very dryly monsieur i am asking you about the little lady she must not leave this house without having enjoyed herself a little as for that old frizzle-headed thing if she doesn't like my dinner she can suck her thumbs i don't care what she likes my mind being thus set at rest i returned to the city of books where mademoiselle prefere was crocheting as calmly as if she were at home i almost felt inclined myself to think she was she did not take up much room it is true in the angle of the window but she had chosen her chair and her footstool so well that those articles of furniture seemed to have been made expressly for her jeanne on the other hand devoted her attention to the books and pictures gazing at them in a kindly expressive half sad way as if she were bidding them an affectionate farewell here i said to her amuse yourself with this book which i am sure you cannot help liking because it is full of beautiful engravings and i threw open before her the 
collection of costume designs not the commonplace edition by your leaf so meagrely reproduced by modern artists but in truth a magnificent and venerable copy of that editio princeps which is noble as those noble dames who figure upon its yellowed leaves made beautiful by time while turning over the engravings with artless curiosity jean said to me we were talking about taking a walk but this is a great journey you are making me take and i would like to travel very very far away in that case mademoiselle i said to her you must arrange yourself as comfortably as possible for travelling but you are now sitting on one corner of your chair so that the chair is standing upon only one leg and that vicellio must tire your knees sit down comfortably put your chair on its four feet and put your book on the table she obeyed me with a laugh i watched her she cried out suddenly oh come look at this beautiful costume it was that of the wife of a doge of venice how noble it is what magnificent ideas it gives one of that light oh i must tell you i adore luxury you must not express such thoughts as these mademoiselle said the schoolmistress lifting up her little shapeless nose from her work nevertheless it was a very innocent utterance i replied there are splendid souls in whom the love of splendid things is natural and inborn the little shapeless nose went down again mademoiselle prefere likes luxury too said jean she cuts out paper trimmings and shades for the lamps it is economical luxury but it is luxury all the same having returned to the subject of venice we were just about to make the acquaintance of a certain patrician lady attired in an embroidered dalmatic when i heard the bell ring i thought it was some peddler with his basket but the gate of the city of books opened and well master said esquibonar you were wishing a while ago that the grace of your protege might be observed by some other eyes than old withered ones behind spectacles your wishes have been fulfilled in a most unexpected manner and a voice cries out to you as to the imprudent theseus grenier seigneur grenier que le ciel rigolot ne vous hais assez pour accoquer vos vers ce dans sa colère il requiert nos victimes ces présents sont sur la peine de nos crimes beware my lord beware lest stern heaven hate you enough to hear your prayers often tis in wrath that heaven receives our sacrifices its gifts are often the punishment of our crimes the gate of the city of books had opened and a handsome young man made his appearance ushered in by therese that good old soul only knows how to open the door for people and to shut it behind them she has no idea whatever of the tact requisite for the waiting-room and for the parlour it is not in her nature either to make any announcements or to make anybody wait she either throws people out on the lobby or simply pitches them at your head and here is this handsome young man already inside and i cannot really take the girl at once and hide her like a secret treasure in the next room i wait for him to explain himself he does it without the least embarrassment but it seems to me that he has already observed the young girl who is still bending over the table looking at the chelio as i observe the young man it occurs to me that i have seen him somewhere before or else i must be very much mistaken his name is jealous that is a name which i have heard somewhere i can't remember where at all events monsieur jealous since there is a jealous is a fine-looking young fellow he tells me that this is his third class year at the ecole de Cartes, and that he has been working for the past fifteen or eighteen months upon his graduation thesis the subject of which is the condition of the benetine abbeys in seventeen hundred he has just read my works upon the monasticon and he is convinced that he cannot terminate this thesis successfully without my advice to begin with and in the second place without a certain manuscript which i possess and which is nothing less than the register of the accounts of the abbey of citeaux from sixteen eighty three to seventeen o four having thus explained himself he hands me a letter of introduction bearing a signature of one of the most illustrious of my colleagues good now i know who he is monsieur jealous is the very same young man who last year under the chestnut trees called me an idiot and while unfolding his letter of introduction i think to myself aha my unlucky youth you are very far from suspecting that i overheard what you said and that i know what you think of me or at least what you did think of me that day for these young minds are so fickle i have got you now my friend you have fallen into the lion's den 
and so unexpectedly in good sooth that the astonished old lion does not know what to do with his prey but come now old lion do not act like an idiot is it not possible that you were an idiot if you are not one now you certainly were one you were a fool to have been listening to monsieur Jelly at the foot of the statue of marguerite de valois you were doubly a fool to have heard what he said and you were trebly a fool not to have forgotten what it would have been much better never to have heard having thus scolded the old lion i exhorted him to show clemency he did not appear to require much coaxing and gradually became so good-natured that he had some difficulty in restraining himself from bursting out into joyous roarings from the way in which i had read my colleague's letter one might have supposed me a man who did not know his alphabet i took a long while to read it and monsieur Jelly might have become very tired under different circumstances but he was watching jean and endured the trial with exemplary patience jean occasionally turned her face in our direction well you could not expect a person to remain perfectly motionless could you mademoiselle prefer was arranging her curls and her bosom occasionally swelled with little sighs it may be observed that i have myself often been honoured with those little sighs monsieur i said as i folded up the letter i shall be very happy to be of any service to you you are occupied with researches in which i myself have always felt a very lively interest i have done all that lay in my power i know as you do and still better than you can know how much there remains to do the manuscript you ask for is at your disposal you may take it home with you but it is not a manuscript of the smallest kind and i am afraid oh monsieur said Jelly, big books have never been able to make me afraid of them i begged the young man to wait for me and i went into the next room to get the register which i could not find at first and which i almost despaired of finding as i discerned from certain familiar signs that therese had been setting the room in order but the register was so big and so heavy that lucky for me therese had not been able to put it in order as she had doubtless wished to do i could scarcely lift it up myself and i had the pleasure of finding it quite as heavy as i could have hoped wait my boy i said with a smile which must have been very sarcastic wait i am going to give you something to do which will break your arms first and afterwards your head that will be the first vengeance of sylvester bonheur later on we shall see what else there is to be done when i returned to the city of books i heard monsieur Jelly and mademoiselle jean chatting chatting together if, if you please as if they were the best friends in the world mademoiselle prefer being full of decorum did not say anything but the other two were chatting like birds and what about about the blonde tint used by venetian painters yes about the venetian blonde that little serpent of a Jolie was telling jean the secret of the dye with which according to the best authorities the women of titian and of veronese day tinted their hair and mademoiselle jean was expressing her opinion very prettily about the honey tint and the golden tint i understood that the scamp of a vigilio was responsible that they had been bending over the book together and that they had been admiring either the doge's wife we had been looking at a while before or some other patrician woman of venice never mind i appeared with my enormous old book thinking that jelly was going to make a grimace it was as much as one could have asked the porter to carry and my arms were stiff merely with lifting it but the young man caught it up like a feather and slipped it under his arm with a smile then he thanked me with that sort of brevity which i like reminded me that he had need of my advice and having made an appointment to meet me another day took his departure after bowing to us with the most perfect self-possession conceivable he seems quite a decent lad i said jean turned over a few more pages of vicelio and made no answer aha i thought to myself and then we went to st cloud end of section twenty four section twenty five of the crime of sylvestre bonheur by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain september to december the regularity with which visit succeeded visit to the old man's house thereafter made me feel very grateful to mademoiselle Poifre who succeeded at last in winning her right to occupy a special corner in the city of books she now says my chair my footstool my pigeon-hole 
her pigeonhole is really a small shelf properly belonging to the poets of la champagne whom she expelled therefrom in order to obtain a lodging for her work-bag she is very amiable and i must really be a monster not to like her i can only endure her in the severest signification of the word but what would one not endure for jeanne's sake her presence lends to the city of books a charm which seems to hover about it even after she is gone she is very ignorant but she is so finely gifted that whenever i show her anything beautiful i am astounded to find that i had never really seen it before and that it is she who makes me see it i found it impossible so far to make her follow some of my ideas but i have often found pleasure in following the whimsical and delicate course of her own a more practical man than i would attempt to teach her to make herself useful but is not the capacity of being amiable a useful thing in life without being pretty she charms and the power to charm is perhaps after all worth quite as much as the ability to darn stockings furthermore i am not immortal and i doubt whether she will have become very old when my notary who is not maitre mouge shall read to her a certain paper which i signed a little while ago i do not wish that any one except myself should provide for her and give her her dowry i am not however very rich and the paternal inheritance did not gain bulk in my hands one does not accumulate money by poring over old texts but my books at the price which such noble merchandise fetches to-day are worth something why on that shelf there are some poets of the sixteenth century for which bankers would bid against princes and i think that those hears of simon vostre would not be readily overlooked at the hotel sylvestre any more than would those prays pi compiled for the use of queen claude i have taken great pains to collect and to preserve all those rare and curious editions which people the city of books and for a long time i used to believe that they were as necessary to my life as air and light i have loved them well and even now i cannot prevent myself from smiling at them and caressing them those morocco bindings are so delightful to the eye these old vellums are so soft to the touch there is not a single one among those books which is not worthy by reason of some special merit to command the respect of an honourable man what other owner would ever know how to dip into them in the proper way can i be even sure that another owner would not leave them to decay and neglect or mutilate them at the prompting of some ignorant whim into whose hands will fall that incomparable copy of the histoire de l'abbaye de saint germain de prés on the margins of which the author himself in the person of jacques bouillard made such substantial notes in his own handwriting master bernard you are an old fool your housekeeper poor soul is nailed down upon her bed with a merciless attack of rheumatism jean is come with her chaperon and instead of thinking how you are going to receive them you are thinking about a thousand stupidities sylvestre bernard you will never succeed at anything in this world and it is i myself who tell you so and at this very moment i catch sight of them from my window as they get out of the omnibus jean leaps down like a kitten but mademoiselle parfair entrusts herself to the strong arm of the conductor with the shy grace of a virginia recovering after the shipwreck and this time quite resigned to being saved jean looks up sees me laughs and mademoiselle prouvaire has to prevent her from waving her umbrella at me as a friendly signal there is a certain stage of civilization to which mademoiselle jean never can be brought you can teach her all the arts if you like it is not exactly to mademoiselle prouvaire that i am now speaking but you will never be able to teach her perfect manners as a charming child she makes the mistake of being charming only in her own way only an old fool like myself could forgive her pranks as for young fools and there are several of them still to be found i do not know what they would think about it and what they might think is none of my business just look at her running along the pavement wrapped in her cloak with her 
hat tilted back on her head and her feather fluttering in the wind like a schooner in full rig and really she has a grace of poise and motion which suggests a fine sailing vessel so much so indeed that she makes me remember seeing one day when i was at havre babona my friend how many times is it necessary to tell you that your housekeeper is in bed and that you must go and open the door yourself open old man winter tis spring who rings the bell it is jeanne herself jeanne is all flushed like a rose mademoiselle prefer indignant and out of breath has still another whole flight to climb before reaching our lobby i explained the condition of my housekeeper and proposed that we should dine at a restaurant but therese all powerful still even upon her sick-bed decided that we should dine at home whether we wanted to or no respectable people in her opinion never dined at restaurants moreover she had made all necessary arrangements the dinner had been bought the concierge would cook it the audacious jean insisted upon going to see whether the old woman wanted anything as you might suppose she was sent back to the parlour with short shrift but not so harshly as i had feared if i want anybody to do anything for me which thank god i do not therese had replied i would get somebody less delicate and dainty than you are what i want is rest that is a merchandise which is not sold at fairs under the sign of modus the finger on lip go and have your fun and don't stay here for old age might be catching jean after telling us what she had said added that she liked very much to hear old therese talk whereupon mademoiselle prefer reproached her for expressing such unladylike tastes i tried to excuse her by citing the example of moliere just at that moment it came to pass that while climbing the ladder to get a book she upset a whole shelf row there was a heavy crash and mademoiselle prefer being of course a very delicate person almost fainted jean quickly followed the books to the foot of the ladder she made one think of a kitten suddenly transformed into a woman catching mice which had been transformed into old books while picking them up she found one which happened to interest her and she began to read it squatting down upon her heels it was the prince granouille she told us mademoiselle prefer took occasion to complain that jean had so little taste for poetry it was impossible to get her to recite casimir de la vigne's poem on the death of jean of arc without mistakes it was the very most she could do to learn le petit savoyard the schoolmistress did not think that any one should read the prince granouille before learning by heart the stanzas to du perrier and carried away by her enthusiasm she began to recite them in a voice sweeter than the bleating of a sheep ta douleur du perrier sera donc éternel et les tristes discours que te met en l'esprit l'amitié perdonnelle l'augmenteront toujours je sais de quel appât son enfance était plein et n'est pas entrepris un jurieux ami de consoler ta peine avec son mépris then in ecstasy she exclaimed how beautiful that is what harmony how is it possible for any one not to admire such exquisite such touching verses but why did malherbe call that poor monsieur de poirier his injurieux ami at a time when he had been so severely tied by the death of his daughter injurieux ami you must acknowledge that the term is very harsh i explained to this poetical person that the phrase injurieux ami which shocked her so much was in apposition etc etc what i said however had so little effect towards clearing her head that she was seized with a severe and prolonged fit of sneezing meanwhile it was evident that the history of prince franouille had proved extremely funny for it was all that jean could do as she crouched down there on the carpet to keep herself from bursting into a wild fit of laughter but when she had finished with the prince and princess of the story and the multitude of their children she assumed a very suppliant expression and begged me as a great favour to allow her to put on a white apron and go to the kitchen to help in getting the dinner ready jean and i replied with the gravity of a master i think that if it is a question of breaking plates knocking off the edges of dishes denting all the pans and smashing all the skimmers the person whom therese has set to work in the kitchen already will be able to perform her task without assistance for it seems to me at this very moment i can hear disastrous noises in that kitchen 
but anyhow jean i will charge you with the duty of preparing the dessert so go and get your white apron i will tie it on for you accordingly i solemnly knotted the linen apron about her waist and she rushed into the kitchen where she proceeded at once as we discovered later on to prepare various dishes unknown to vatel unknown even to that great carême who began his treatise upon pieces monte with these words the fine arts are five in number painting music poetry sculpture and architecture whereof the principal branch is confectionary but i had no reason to be pleased with this little arrangement for mademoiselle prefere on finding herself alone with me began to act after a fashion which filled me with frightful anxiety she gazed upon me with eyes full of tears and flames and uttered enormous sighs oh how i pity you she said a man like you a man so superior as you are having to live alone with a coarse servant for she is certainly coarse that is incontestable how cruel such a life must be you have need of repose you have need of comfort of care of every kind of attention you might fall sick and yet there is no woman who would not deem it an honour to bear your name and to share your existence no there is none my own heart tells me so and she squeezed both hands over that heart of hers always so ready to fly away i was driven almost to distraction i tried to make mademoiselle prefere comprehend that i had no intention whatever of changing my habits at so advanced an age and that i found just as much happiness in life as my character and my circumstances rendered possible no you are not happy she cried you need to have always beside you a mind capable of comprehending your own shake off your lethargy and cast your eyes about you your professional connections are of the most extended character and you must have charming acquaintances one cannot be a member of the institute without going into society see judge compare no sensible woman would refuse you her hand i am a woman monsieur my instinct never deceives me there is something within me which assures me that you would find happiness in marriage women are so devoted so loving not all of course but some and then they are so sensitive to glory remember that at your age one has need like oedipus of an egeria your cook is no longer able she is deaf she is infirm if anything should happen to you at night oh it makes me shudder even to think of it and she really shuddered she closed her eyes clenched her hands stamped on the floor great was my dismay with awful intensity she resumed your health your dear health the health of a member of the institute how joyfully i would shed the very last drop of my blood to preserve the life of a scholar of a literateur of a man of worth and any woman who would not do as much i should despise her let me tell you monsieur i used to know the wife of a great mathematician a man who used to fill whole notebooks with calculations so many notebooks that they filled all the cupboards in the house he had heart disease and he was visibly pining away and i saw that wife of his sitting there beside him perfectly calm i could not endure it i said to her one day my dear you have no heart if i were in your place i should i should i do not know what i should do she paused for want of breath my situation was terrible as for telling mademoiselle prefere what i really thought about her advice that was something which i could not even dream of daring to do for to fall out with her was to lose the chance of seeing jean so i resolved to take the matter quietly in any case she was in my house that consideration helped me to treat her with something of courtesy i am very ill mademoiselle i answered her and i am very much afraid that your advice comes to me rather late in life still i will think about it in the meanwhile let me beg of you to be calm i think a glass of eau sucre would do you good to my great surprise these words calmed her at once and i saw her sit down very quietly in her corner close to her her pigeonhole upon her chair with her feet upon her footstool the dinner was a complete failure mademoiselle Prefer, who seemed lost in a brown study never noticed the fact as a rule i am very sensitive about such misfortunes but this one caused jean so much delight that at last i could not help enjoying it myself even at my age i had not been able to learn before that a chicken raw on one side and burned on the other was a funny thing but jean's burst of laughter taught me that it was that chicken caused us to say a thousand very witty things which i had forgotten and i was enchanted that it had not been properly cooked jean put it back to roast again then she broiled it then she stewed it with butter and every time it came back to the table it was much less appetizing and much more mirth-provoking than before when we did eat it at last it had become a thing for which there is no name in any cuisine 
the almond cake was much more extraordinary it was brought to the table in the pan because it never could have got out of it i invited jean to help us all to a piece thinking that i was going to embarrass her but she broke the pan and gave each of us a fragment to think that anybody at my age could eat such things was an idea possible only to the very artless mind mademoiselle Perfer suddenly awakened from her dream indignantly pushed away the sugary splinter of earthenware and deemed it opportune to inform me that she herself was exceedingly skilful in making confectionery ah exclaimed jean with an air of surprise not altogether without malice then she wrapped all the fragments of the pan in a piece of paper for the purpose of giving them to her little playmates especially to the three little mouton girls who are naturally inclined to gluttony secretly however i was beginning to feel very uneasy it did not now seem in any way possible to keep much longer upon good terms with mademoiselle Perfer, since her matrimonial fury had this burst forth and that lady affronted good by to jean i took advantage of a moment while the sweet soul was busy putting on her cloak in order to ask jean to tell me exactly what her own age was she was eighteen years and one month old i counted on my fingers and found she would not come of age for another two years and eleven months and how should we be able to manage during all that time at the door mademoiselle Perfer squeezed my hand with so much meaning that i fairly shook from head to foot good-bye i said very gravely to the young girl but listen to me a moment your friend is very old and might perhaps fail you when you need him most promise me never to fail in your duty to yourself and then i shall have no fear god keep you my child after closing the door behind them i opened the window to get a last look at her as she was going away but the night was dark and i could see only two vague shadows flitting across the quay i heard the vast deep hum of the city rising up about me and i suddenly felt a great sinking at my heart poor child End of section 25section 26 of the crime of sylvestre bonaro by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain december 15 the king of thule kept a goblet of gold which his dying mistress had bequeathed him as a souvenir when about to die himself after having drunk from it for the last time he threw the goblet into the sea and i keep this diary of memories even as that old prince of the mist-haunted seas kept his carven goblet and even as he flung away at last his love pledge so will i burn this book of souvenirs assuredly it is not through any arrogant avarice nor through any egotistical pride that i shall destroy this record of a humble life it is only because i fear lest those things which are dear and sacred to me might appear before others because of my inartistic manner of expression either commonplace or absurd i do not say this in view of what is going to follow absurd i certainly must have been when having been invited to dinner by mademoiselle Perfer, i took my seat in a bergere it was really a bergere at the right hand of that alarming person the table had been set in a little parlour and i could observe from the poor way in which it was set out that the schoolmistress was one of those ethereal souls who soar above terrestrial things chipped plates unmatched glasses knives with loose handles forks with yellow prongs there was absolutely nothing wanting to spoil the appetite of an honest man i was assured that the dinner had been cooked for me for me alone although maitre mouge had also been invited mademoiselle Perfer must have imagined that i had sarmatian tastes on the subject of butter for that which she offered me served up in little thin paths was excessively rancid the roast very nearly poisoned me but i had the pleasure of hearing maitre mouche and mademoiselle Perfer discourse upon virtue i said the pleasure i ought to have said the shame for the sentiments to which they gave expression soared far beyond the range of my vulgar nature what they said proved to me as clear as day that devotedness was their daily bread and that self-sacrifice was not less necessary to their existence than air and water 
observing that i was not eating mademoiselle prefere made a thousand efforts to overcome that which she was good enough to term my discretion jean was not of the party because i was told her presence at it would have been contrary to the rules and would have wounded the feelings of the other school-children among whom it was necessary to maintain a certain equality i secretly congratulated her upon having escaped from the merovingian butter from the huge radishes empty as funeral urns from the leathery roast and from various other curiosities of diet to which i had exposed myself for the love of her the extremely disconsolate-looking servants served up some liquid to which they gave the name of cream i do not know why and vanished away like a ghost then mademoiselle prefere related to maitre mouche with extraordinary transports of emotion all that she had said to me in the city of books during the time that my housekeeper was sick in bed her admiration for a member of the institute her terror lest i should be taken ill while unattended and the certainty she felt that any intelligent woman would be proud and happy to share my existence she concealed nothing but on the contrary added many fresh follies to the recital maitre mouche kept nodding his head in approval while cracking nuts then after all this verbiage he demanded with an agreeable smile what my answer had been mademoiselle prefere pressing her hand upon her heart and extending the other towards me cried out he is so affectionate so superior so good and so great he answered but i could never because i am only a humble woman i could never repeat the words of a member of the institute i can only utter the substance of them he answered yes i understand you yes and with these words she reached out and seized one of my hands then maitre mouche also overwhelmed with emotion arose and seized my other hand monsieur he said permit me to offer my congratulations several times in my life i have known fear but never before had i experienced any fright of so nauseating a character a sickening terror came upon me i disengaged my two hands and rising to my feet so as to give all possible seriousness to my words i said madame either i explained myself very badly when you were at my house or i have totally misunderstood you here in your own in either case a positive declaration is absolutely necessary permit me madame to make it now very plainly no i never did understand you i am totally ignorant of the nature of this marriage project that you have been planning for me if you really have been planning one in any event i should not think of marrying it would be unpardonable folly at my age and even now at this moment i cannot conceive how a sensible person like you could ever have advised me to marry indeed i am strongly inclined to believe that i must have been mistaken and that you never said anything of the kind before in the latter case please excuse an old man totally unfamiliar with the usages of society unaccustomed to the conversation of ladies and very contrite for his mistake maitre mouche went back very softly to his place where not finding any more nuts to crack he began to whittle a cork mademoiselle prefere after staring at me for a few moments with an expression in her little round dry eyes which i had never seen there before suddenly resumed her customary sweetness and graciousness then she cried out in honeyed tones oh these learned men these studious men they are like children yes monsieur bonnard you are a real child then turning to the notary who still sat very quietly in his corner with his nose over his cork she exclaimed in beseeching tones oh do not accuse him do not accuse him do not think any evil of him i beg of you do not think it at all must i ask you upon my knees maitre mouche continued to examine all the various aspects and surfaces of his cork without making any further manifestation i was very indignant and i know that my cheeks must have been extremely red if i could judge by the flush of heat which i felt rise to my face 
this would enable me to explain the words i heard through all the buzzing in my ears i'm frightened about him our poor friend monsieur muche be kind enough to open a window it seems to me that a compress of arnica would do him some good i rushed out into the street with an unspeakable feeling of shame my poor jean end of section twenty six section twenty seven of the crime of sylvestre bonnard by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain december twenty i passed eight days without hearing anything further in regard to the prefere establishment then feeling myself unable to remain any longer without some news of clementine's daughter and feeling furthermore that i owed it as a duty to myself not to cease my visits with the school without more serious cause i took my way to les ternes the parlour seemed to me more cold more damp more inhospitable and more insidious than ever before and the servant much more silent and much more scared i asked to see mademoiselle jeanne but after a very considerable time it was mademoiselle prefere who made her appearance instead severe and pale with lips compressed and a hard look in her eyes monsieur she said folding her arms over her pelerine i regret very much that i cannot allow you to see mademoiselle alexandre to-day but i cannot possibly do it why not i asked in astonishment monsieur she replied the reasons which compel me to request that your visit shall be less frequent hereafter are of an excessively delicate nature and i must beg you to spare me the unpleasantness of mentioning them madame i replied i have been authorized by jean's guardian to see his ward every day will you please to inform me of your reasons of opposing the will of monsieur mouche the guardian of mademoiselle alexandre she replied and she dwelt upon that word guardian as upon a solid support desires quite as strongly as i myself do that your assiduities may come to an end as soon as possible then if that be the case i said be kind enough to let me know his reasons and your own she looked up at the little spiral of paper on the ceiling and then replied with stern composure you insist upon it well although such explanations are very painful for a woman to make i will yield to your exaction this house monsieur is an honourable house i have my responsibility i have to watch like a mother over each one of my pupils your assiduities in regard to mademoiselle alexandre could not possibly be continued without serious injury to the young girl herself and it is my duty to insist that they shall cease i do not really understand you i replied and i was telling the plain truth then she deliberately resumed your assiduities in this house are being interpreted by the most respectable and the least suspicious persons in such a manner that i find myself obliged both in the interest of my establishment and in the interest of mademoiselle alexandre to see that they end at once madame i cried i have heard a great many silly things in my life but never anything so silly as what you have just said she answered me quietly your words of abuse will not affect me in the slightest when one has a duty to accomplish one is strong enough to endure all and she pressed her pelerine over her heart once more not perhaps on this occasion to restrain but doubtless only to caress that generous heart madame i said shaking my finger at her you have wantonly aroused the indignation of an aged man be good enough to act in such a fashion that the old man may be able at least to forget your existence and do not add fresh insults to those which i have already sustained from your lips i give you fair warning that i shall never cease to look after mademoiselle alexandre and that should you attempt to do her any harm 
in any manner whatsoever you will have serious reason to regret it the more i became excited the more she became cool and she answered in a tone of superb indifference monsieur i am much too well informed in regard to the nature of the interest which you take in this young girl not to withdraw her immediately from that very surveillance with which you threaten me after observing the more than equivocal intimacy in which you are living with your housekeeper i ought to have taken measures at once to render it impossible for you ever to come into contact with an innocent child in the future i shall certainly do it if up to this time i have been too trustful it is for mademoiselle alexandre and not for you to reproach me with it but she is too artless and too pure thanks to me ever to have suspected the nature of that danger into which you were trying to lead her i scarcely suppose that you will place me under the necessity of enlightening her upon the subject come my poor old bona i said to myself as i shrugged my shoulders so you had to live as long as this in order to learn for the first time exactly what a wicked woman is and now your knowledge of the subject is complete i went out without replying and i had the pleasure of observing from the sudden flush which overspread the face of the schoolmistress that my silence had wounded her far more than my words as i passed through the court i looked about me in every direction for jean she was watching for me and she ran to me if anybody touches one little hair of your head jean write to me good-bye no not good-bye i replied well no not good-bye write to me i went straight to madame de gabry's residence madame is at rome with monsieur did not monsieur know it why yes i replied madame wrote to me she had indeed written to me in regard to her leaving home but my head must have become very much confused so that i had forgotten all about it the servant seemed to be of the same opinion for he looked at me in a way that seemed to signify monsieur bonnat is doting and he leaned down over the balustrade of the stairway to see if i was not going to do something extraordinary before i got to the bottom but i descended the stairs rationally enough and then he drew back his head in disappointment on returning home i was informed that monsieur Gély was waiting for me in the parlour this young man has become a constant visitor his judgment is at fault at times but his mind is not at all commonplace on this occasion however his usually welcome visit only embarrassed me alas i thought to myself i shall be sure to say something very stupid to my young friend to-day and he also will think that my facilities are becoming impaired but still i cannot really explain to him that i had first been demanded in wedlock and subsequently traduced as a man wholly devoid of morals that even therese had become an object of suspicion and that jean remains in the power of the most rascally woman on the face of the earth i am certainly in an admirable state of mind for conversing about cistercian abbeys with a young and mischievously minded man nevertheless we shall see we shall try but therese stopped me how red you are monsieur she exclaimed in a tone of reproach it must be the spring i answered she cried out the spring in the month of december that is a fact this is december ah what is the matter with my head what a fine help i am going to be to poor jean therese take my cane and put it if you possibly can in some place where i shall be able to find it again good day monsieur Gély. how are you undated next morning the old boy wanted to get up but the old boy could not get up a merciless invisible hand kept him down upon his bed finding himself immovable riveted there the old boy resigned himself to remain motionless but his thoughts kept running in all directions he must have had a very violent fever for mademoiselle prefere the abbe of saint germain des prés and the servant of madame de gabry appeared to him in divers fantastic shapes the figure of the servant in particular lengthened weirdly over his head grimacing like some gargoyle of a cathedral then it seemed to me that there were a great many people much too many people in my bedroom this bedroom of mine is furnished after the antiquated fashion the portrait of my father in full uniform 
and the portrait of my mother in her cashmere dress are suspended on the wall the wallpaper is covered with green foliage designs i am aware of all this and i am even conscious that everything is faded very much faded but an old man's room does not require it to be pretty it is enough that it should be clean and therese sees to that at all events my room is sufficiently decorated to please a mind like mine which has always remained somewhat childish and dreamy there are things hanging on the wall or scattered over the tables and shelves which usually please my fancy and amuse me but to-day it would seem as if all those objects had suddenly conceived some kind of ill-will against me they have all become garish grimacing menacing that statuette modelled after one of the theological virtues of notre dame de Bru, always so ingeniously graceful in its natural condition as now making contortions and putting out its tongue at me and that beautiful miniature in which one of the most skilful pupils of Johann Fouquet depicted himself girdled with the cord girdle of the sons of st francis offering his book on bended knee to the good duke d'angoulême who has taken it out of its frame and put in its place a great ugly cat's head which stares at me with phosphorescent eyes and the designs on the wallpaper have also turned into heads hideous green heads but no i'm sure that wallpaper must have foliage designs upon it at this moment just as it had twenty years ago and nothing else but no again i was right before they are heads with eyes noses mouths they are heads ah now i understand they are both heads and foliage designs at the same time i wish i could not see them at all and there am i right the pretty miniature of the franciscan has come back again but it seems to me as if i can only keep it in its frame by a tremendous effort of will and at the moment i get tired the ugly cathead will appear in its place certainly i am not delirious i can see therese very plainly standing at the foot of my bed i can hear her speaking to me perfectly well and i should be able to answer her quite satisfactorily if i were not kept so busy in trying to compel the various objects about me to maintain their natural aspect here is the doctor coming i never sent for him but he gives me pleasure to see him he is an old neighbour of mine i have never been of much service to him but i like him very much even if i do not say much to him i have at least full possession of all my faculties and i even find myself extraordinarily crafty and observant to-day for i note all his gestures his every look the least wrinkling of his face but the doctor is very cunning too and i cannot really tell what he thinks about me the deep thought of goethe suddenly comes to my mind and i exclaim doctor the old man has consented to allow himself to become sick but he does not intend this time at least to make any further concessions to nature neither the doctor nor therese laughs at my little joke i suppose they cannot have understood it the doctor goes away evening comes and all sorts of strange shadows begin to shape themselves about my bed curtains forming and dissolving by turns and other shadows ghosts thronged by before me and through them i can see distinctively the impassive face of my faithful servant and suddenly a cry a shrill cry a great cry of distress rends my ears was it you who called me jean the day is over and the shadows take their places at my bedside to remain with me all through the long night then morning comes i feel a peace a vast peace wrapping me all about art thou about to take me and to thy rest my dear lord god end of section twenty seven section twenty eight of the crime of sylvestre bonal by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain february eighteen sixty something the doctor is quite jovial it seems that i am doing him a great deal of credit by being able to get out of bed if i must believe him innumerable disorders must have pounced down upon my poor old body all at the same time these disorders which are the terror of ordinary mankind have names which are the terror of philologists they are hybrid names half greek half latin with terminations in itis indicating the inflammatory condition and in algia indicating pain 
the doctor gives me all their names together with a corresponding number of adjectives ending in ick which serve to characterize their detestable qualities in short they represent a good half of that most perfect copy of the dictionary of medicine contained in the too authentic box of pandora doctor what an excellent common-sense story the story of pandora is if i were a poet i would put it into french verse shake hands doctor you have brought me back to life i forgive you for it you have given me back to my friends i thank you for it you say i am quite strong that may be that may be but i have lasted a very long time i am a very old article of furniture i might be very satisfactorily compared to my father's armchair it was an armchair which the good man had inherited and in which he used to lounge from morning until evening twenty times a day when i was quite a baby i used to climb up and seat myself on one of the arms of that old-fashioned chair so long as the chair remained intact nobody paid any particular attention to it but it began to limp on one foot and then folks began to say that it was a very good chair afterwards it became lame in three legs squeaked with the fourth leg and lost nearly half of both arms and everybody would exclaim what a strong chair they wondered how it was that after its arms had been worn off and all its legs knocked out of perpendicular it could yet preserve the recognizable shape of a chair remains nearly erect and still be of some service the horsehair came out of its body at last and it gave up the ghost and when cyprian our servant sawed up its mutilated members for firewood everybody redoubled their cries of admiration oh what an excellent what a marvellous chair it was the chair of pierre sylvestre bonnard the cloth merchant of epimenides bonnard his son of jean baptiste bonnard pyronian philosopher and chief of the third maritime division oh what a robust and venerable chair in reality it was a dead chair well doctor i am that chair you think i am solid because i have been able to resist an attack which would have killed many people and which only three-fourths killed me much obliged i feel none the less that i am something which has been irremediably damaged the doctor tries to prove to me with the help of enormous greek and latin words that i am really in a very good condition it would of course be useless to attempt any demonstration of this kind in so lucid a language as french however i allow him to persuade me at last and i see him to the door good good exclaimed therese that is the way to put the doctor out of the house just do the same thing once or twice again and he will not come to see you any more and so much the better well therese now that i have become such a hardy man again do not refuse to give me my letters i am sure there must be quite a big bundle of letters and it would be very wicked to keep me any longer from reading them therese after some little grumbling gave me my letters but what did it matter i looked at all the envelopes and saw that no one of them had been addressed by the little hand which i so much wish i could see here now turning over the pages of the vecellio i pushed the whole bundle of letters away they had no more interest for me End of section twenty eight section twenty nine of the crime of sylvestre bonnard by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain april june it was a hotly contested engagement wait monsieur until i have put on my clean things exclaimed therese and i will go out with you this time also i will carry your folding-stool as i have been doing these last few days and we will go and sit down somewhere in the sun therese actually thinks me infirm i have been sick it is true but there is an end to all things madame malady has taken her departure quite a while ago and it is now more than three months since her pale and gracious visaged handmaid dame convalescence politely bade me farewell 
if i were to listen to my housekeeper i should become a veritable monsieur argent and i should wear a nightcap with ribbons for the rest of my life no more of this i propose to go out by myself therese will not hear of it she takes my folding-stool and wants to follow me therese to-morrow if you like we will take our seats on the sunny side of the wall of la petite provence and stay there just as long as you please but to-day i have some very important affairs to attend to so much the better but your affairs are not the only affairs in this world i beg i scold i make my escape it is quite a pleasant day with the aid of a cab and the help of almighty god i trust to be able to fulfil my purpose there is the wall on which is painted in great blue letters the words pensionnat de demoiselle tenu par mademoiselle virginie prefere there is the iron gate which would give free entrance into the courtyard if it were ever opened but the lock is rusty and sheets of zinc put up behind the bars protect the indiscreet observation those dear little souls to whom mademoiselle prefere doubtless teaches modesty sincerity justice and disinterestedness there is a window with iron bars before it and panes daubed over with white paint the window of the domestic offices like a glazed eye the only aperture of the building opening upon the exterior world as for the house door through which i entered so often but which is now closed against me for ever it is just as i saw it the last time with its little iron gated wicket the single stone step in front of it is deeply worn and without having very good eyes behind my spectacles i can see the little white scratches on the stone which have been made by the nails in the shoes of the girls going in and out and why cannot i also go in i have a feeling that jeanne must be suffering a great deal in this dismal house and that she calls my name in secret i cannot go away from the gate a strange anxiety takes hold of me i pull the bell the scared-looking servant comes to the door even more scared-looking than when i saw her the last time strict orders have been given i am not to be allowed to see mademoiselle jeanne i beg the servant to be so kind as to tell me how the child is the servant after looking to her right and then to her left tells me that mademoiselle jeanne is well and then shuts the door in my face and i am all alone in the street again how many times since then have i wandered in the same way under that wall and passed before the little door full of shame and despair to find myself even weaker than that poor child who has no other help of friend except myself in the world finally i overcame my repugnance sufficiently to call upon maitre mouche the first thing i remarked was that his office is much more dusty and much more mouldy this year than it was last year the notary made his appearance after a moment with his familiar stiff gestures and his restless eyes quivering behind his eyeglasses i made my complaints to him he answered me but why should i write down even in a notebook what i am going to burn my recollections of a downright scoundrel he takes sides with mademoiselle prefere whose intelligent mind and irreproachable character he has long appreciated he does not feel himself in a position to decide the nature of the question at issue but he must assure me that appearances have been greatly against me that of course makes no difference to me he adds and this does make some sense to me that the small sum which had been placed in his hands to defray the expenses of the education of his ward has been expended and that in view of the circumstances he cannot but gently admire the disinterestedness of mademoiselle prefere in consenting to allow mademoiselle jean to remain with her a magnificent light the light of a perfect day floods the sordid place with its incorruptible torrent and illuminates the person of that man and outside it pours down its splendour upon all the wretchedness of a populous quarter how sweet it is this light with which my eyes have so long been filled and which ere long i must for ever cease to enjoy i wander out with my hands behind me dreaming as i go following the line of the fortifications and i find myself after a while i know not how in an out-of-the-way suburb full of miserable little gardens by the dusty roadside i observe a plant whose flower at once dark and splendid seems worthy of association with the noblest and purest mourning for the dead it is a columbine 
our fathers called it our lady's glove la grand la gant de notre dame only such a notre dame as might make herself very very small for the sake of appearing to little children could ever slip her dainty fingers into the narrow capsule of that flower and there is a big bumblebee who tries to force himself into the flower brutally but his mouth cannot reach the nectar and the poor glutton strives and strives in vain he has to give up the attempt and comes out of the flower all smeared over with pollen he flies off in his own heavy lumbering way but there are not many flowers in this portion of the suburbs which has been defiled by the soot and smoke of factories so he comes back to the columbine again and this time he pierces the corolla and sucks the honey through the little hole which he has made i should never have thought that a bumblebee had so much sense why that is admirable the more i observe them the more do insects and flowers fill me with astonishment i am like that good rollin who went wild with delight over the flowers of his peach trees i wish i could have a fine garden and live at the verge of a wood End of section 29 Section 30 of The Crime of Sylvestre Bonnau by Anatole France. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. August, September. It occurred to me one Sunday morning to watch for the moment when mademoiselle prefere's pupils were leaving the school in procession to attend mass at the parish church i watched them passing two by two the little ones first with very serious faces there were three of them all dressed exactly alike dumpy plump and important-looking little creatures whom i recognized at once as the mouton girls their elder sister is the artist who drew that terrible head of tatius king of the sabines beside the column the assistant school-teacher with her prayer-book in her hand was gesturing and frowning then came the next oldest class and finally the big girls all whispering to each other as they went by but i did not see jeanne i went to police headquarters and inquired whether they chanced to have filed away somewhere or other any information regarding the establishment in the rue de Mour. i succeeded in inducing them to send some female inspectors there these returned bringing with them the most favourable reports about the establishment in their opinion the prayer fair school was a model school it is evident that if i were to force an investigation mademoiselle prefere would receive academic honours End of section 30. Section 31 of The Crime of Sylvestre Bonnat by Anatole France. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. October 3. This Thursday, being a school holiday, I had the chance of meeting the three little mouton girls in the vicinity of the Rue de Mour after bowing to their mother i asked the eldest who appears to be about ten years old how was her playmate mademoiselle jean alexandre the little mouton girl answered me all in a breath jean alexandre is not my playmate she is only kept in the school for charity so they make her sweep the classrooms it was mademoiselle who said so and jean alexandre is a bad girl so they lock her up in the dark room and it serves her right and i am a good girl and i am never locked up in the dark room the three little girls resumed their walk and madame mouton followed close behind them looking back over her broad shoulder at me in a very suspicious manner alas i find myself reduced to expedients of a questionable character madame de gabry will not come back to paris for at least three months more at the very soonest without her i have no tact i have no common sense i am nothing but a cumbersome clumsy mischief-making machine nevertheless i cannot possibly permit them to make jean a boarding-school servant end of section thirty one section thirty two of the crime of sylvestre bonheur by 
anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain december twenty eighth the idea that jean was obliged to sweep the rooms had become absolutely unbearable the weather was dark and cold night had already begun i rang the school door bell with the tranquillity of a resolute man the moment that the timid servant opened the door i slipped a gold piece into her hand and promised her another if she would arrange matters so that i could see mademoiselle alexandre her answer was in one hour from now at the grated window and she slammed the door in my face so rudely that she knocked my hat into the gutter i waited for one very long hour in a violent snowstorm then i approached the window nothing the wind raged and the snow fell heavily workmen passing by with their implements on their shoulders and their heads bent down to keep the snow from coming in their faces rudely jostled me still nothing i began to fear i had been observed i knew that i had done wrong in bribing a servant but i was not a bit sorry for it woe to the man who does not know how to break through social regulations in case of necessity another quarter of an hour passed nothing at last the window was partly opened is that you monsieur bonnard is that you jean tell me at once what has become of you i am well very well but what else they have put me in the kitchen and i have to sweep the schoolrooms in the kitchen sweeping you gracious goodness yes because my guardian does not pay for my schooling any longer gracious goodness your guardian seems to me to be a thorough scoundrel then you know what oh don't ask me to tell you that but i would rather die than find myself alone with him again and why did you not write to me i was watched at this instant i formed a resolve which nothing in this world could have induced me to change i did indeed have some idea that i might be acting contrary to law but i did not give myself the least concern about that idea and being firmly resolved i was able to be prudent i acted with remarkable coolness jean i asked tell me does that room you are in open into the courtyard yes can you open the street door from the inside yourself yes if there is nobody in the porter's lodge go and see if there is any one there and be careful that nobody observes you then i waited keeping a watch on the door and window in six or seven seconds jean reappeared behind the bars and said the servant is in the porter's lodge very well i said have you a pen and ink no a pencil yes pass it out here i took an old newspaper out of my pocket and in a wind which blew almost hard enough to put the street lamps out in a downpour of snow which almost blinded me i managed to wrap up and address that paper to mademoiselle prefere while i was writing i asked jean when the postman passes he puts the papers and letters in the box doesn't he he rings the bell and goes away then the servant opens the letter-box and takes whatever she finds there to mademoiselle prefer immediately is not that about the way the thing is managed whenever any thing comes by post jean thought it was then we shall soon see jean go and watch again and as soon as the servant leaves the lodge open the door and come out here to me having said this i put my newspaper in the box gave the bell a tremendous pull and then hid myself in the embrasure of a neighbouring door i might have been there several minutes when that little door quivered then opened and a young girl's head made its appearance through the opening i took hold of it i pulled it towards me come jean come she stared at me uneasily certainly she must have been afraid that i had gone mad but on the contrary i was very rational indeed come my child come where to madame de gabry's then she took my arm for some time we ran like a couple of thieves but running is an exercise ill-suited to one as corpulent as i am and finding myself out of breath at last i stopped and leaned upon something which turned out to be the stove of a dealer in roasted chestnuts who was doing business at the corner of a wine-seller's shop where a number of cabmen were drinking one of them asked us if we did not want a cab 
most assuredly we wanted a cab the driver after setting down his glass on the zinc counter climbed upon his seat and urged his horse forward we were saved phew i panted wiping my forehead for in spite of the cold i was perspiring profusely what seemed very odd was that jean appeared to be much more conscious than i was of the enormity which we had committed she looked very serious indeed and was visibly uneasy in the kitchen i cried out with indignation she shook her head as if to say well there or anywhere else what does it matter to me and by the light of the street lamps i observed with pain that her face was very thin and her features all pinched i did not find in her any of that vivacity any of those bright impulses any of that quickness of expression which used to please me so much her gaze had become timid her gestures constrained her whole attitude melancholy i took her hand a little cold hand which had become all hardened and bruised the poor child must have suffered very much i questioned her she told me very quietly that mademoiselle prefere had summoned her one day and called her a little monster and a little viper for some reason which she had never been able to learn she had added you shall not see monsieur bonnard any more for he has been giving you bad advice and he has conducted himself in a most shameful manner towards me i then said to her that mademoiselle you will never be able to make me believe then mademoiselle slapped my face and sent me back to the schoolroom the announcement that i should never be allowed to see you again made me feel as if night had come down upon me don't you know those evenings when one feels so sad to see the darkness come or just imagine such a moment stretched out into weeks into whole months don't you remember my little st georges up to that time i had worked at it as well as i could just simply to work at it just to amuse myself but when i lost all hope of ever seeing you again i took my little wax figure and i began to work at it in quite another way i did not try to model it with wooden matches any more as i had been doing but with hairpins i even made use of apingles a la neige but perhaps you do not know what apingles a la neige are well i became more particular about than you can possibly imagine i put a dragon on st georges's helmet and i passed hours and hours in making a head and eyes and tail for the dragon oh the eyes the eyes above all i never stopped working at them till i got them so that they had red pupils and white eyelids and eyebrows and everything i know i am very silly i had an idea that i was going to die as soon as my little st georges would be finished i worked at it during recreation hours and mademoiselle Prefer used to let me alone one day i learned that you were in the parlor with the schoolmistress i watched for you we said au revoir that day to each other i was a little consoled by seeing you but some time after that my guardian came and wanted to make me go to his house but please don't ask me why monsieur he answered me quite gently that i was a very whimsical little girl and then he left me alone but the next day mademoiselle Prefere came to me with such a wicked look on her face that i was really afraid she had a letter in her hand mademoiselle she said to me i am informed by your guardian that he has spent all the money which belonged to you don't be afraid i do not intend to abandon you but you must acknowledge yourself it is only right that you should earn your own livelihood then she put me to work house cleaning and whenever i made a mistake she would lock me up in the garret for days together and that is what has happened to me since i saw you last even if i had been able to write to you i do not know whether i should have done it because i did not think you could possibly take me away from the school and as maitre mouche did not come back to see me there was no hurry i thought i could wait for a while in the garret and the kitchen jean i cried even if we should have to flee to oceania the abominable prefer shall never get hold of you again i will take a great oath on that and why should we not go to oceania the climate is very healthy and i read in the newspaper the other day that they have pianos there but in the meantime let us go to the house of madame de gabry who returned to paris as luck would have it some three or four days ago for you and i are two innocent fools and we have great need of some one to help us even as i was speaking jean's features suddenly became pale and seemed to shrink into lifelessness 
her eyes became all dim her lips half open contracted with an expression of pain then her head sank sideways on her shoulder she had fainted i lifted her in my arms and carried her up madame de gabry's staircase like a little baby asleep but i was myself on the point of fainting from emotional excitement and fatigue together when she came to herself again ah it is you she said so much the better such was our condition when we rang our friend's doorbell same day it was eight o'clock madame de gabry as might be supposed was very much surprised by our unexpected appearance but she welcomed the old man and the child with that glad kindness which always expresses itself in her beautiful gestures it seems to me if i might use the language of devotion so familiar to her it seems to me as though some heavenly grace streams from her hands whenever she opens them and even the perfume which impregnates her robes seems to inspire the sweet calm zeal of charity and good works surprised she certainly was but she asked us no question and that silence seemed to me admirable madame i said to her we have both come to place ourselves under your protection and first of all we are going to ask you to give us some supper or to give jean some at least for a moment ago in the carriage she fainted from weakness as for myself i could not eat a bite at this late hour without passing a night of agony in consequence i hope that m de gabry is well oh he is here she said and she called him immediately come in here paul come and see m bonnard and mademoiselle alexandre he came it was a pleasure for me to see his frank broad face and to press his strong square hand then we went all four of us into the dining-room and while some cold meat was being cut for jean which she never touched notwithstanding i related our adventure paul de gabry asked me permission to smoke his pipe after which he listened to me in silence when i had finished my recital he scratched the short stiff beard upon his chin and uttered a tremendous sacre bleu but seeing jean stare at each of us in turn with a frightened look in her face he added we will talk about this matter to-morrow morning come into my study for a moment i have an old book to show you that i want you to tell me something about i followed him into his study where the steel of guns and hunting knives suspended against the dark hangings glimmered in the lamplight there pulling me down beside him upon a leather-covered sofa he exclaimed what have you done great god do you know what you have done corruption of a minor abduction kidnapping you have got yourself into a nice mess you have simply rendered yourself liable to a sentence of imprisonment of not less than five or more than ten years mercy on us i cried ten years imprisonment for having saved an innocent child that is the law answered m de gabry you see my dear m bonnard i happen to know the code pretty well not because i ever studied law as a profession but because as mayor of lusance i was obliged to teach myself something about it in order to be able to give information to my subordinates mouche is a rascal that woman prefer is a vile hussy and you are a well i really cannot find a word strong enough to signify what you are after opening his bookcase where dog collars riding whips stirrups spurs cigar boxes and a few books of reference were indiscriminately stowed away he took out of it a copy of the code and began to turn over the leaves crimes and misdemeanors sequestration of persons that is not your case abduction of minors here we are article three fifty four whosoever shall either by fraud or violence have abducted or have caused to be abducted any minor or minors or shall have enticed them or turned them away from or forcibly removed them or shall have caused them to be enticed or turned away from or forcibly removed from the places on which they have been placed by those to whose authority or direction they have been submitted or confided shall be liable to the penalty of imprisonment c penal code twenty one and twenty eight here is twenty one the term of imprisonment shall not be less than five years twenty eight the sentence of imprisonment shall be considered as involving a loss of civil rights now all that is very plain is it not monsieur bonnard perfectly plain now let us go on article three fifty six in case the abductor be under the age of twenty one years at the time of the offence he shall only be punished with but we certainly cannot invoke this article in your favour 
article three hundred and fifty seven in case the abductor shall have married the girl by him abducted he can only be prosecuted at the insistence of such persons as according to the civil code may have the right to demand that the marriage shall be declared null nor can he be condemned until after the nullity of the marriage shall have been pronounced i do not know whether it is a part of your plans to marry mademoiselle alexandre you can see that the code is good-natured about it it leaves you one door of escape but no i ought not to joke with you because really you have put yourself in a very unfortunate position and how could a man like you imagine that here in paris in the middle of the nineteenth century a young girl can be abducted with absolute impunity we are not living in the middle ages now and such things are no longer permitted by law you need not imagine i reply that abduction was lawful under the ancient code you will find in Toulouse a decree issued by king chetelbert at cologne either in five ninety three or five ninety four on the subject moreover everybody knows that the famous ordonnance de blois of may fifteen seventy nine formally enacted that any persons convicted of having suborned any son or daughter under the age of twenty-five years whether under promise of marriage or otherwise without the full knowledge will or consent of the father mother and guardians should be punished with death and the ordinance adds a pareillement sera puni extraordinairement to ce qui aura participe au dirap et qui aurait conseil confort et aidant d'aucune manière que ce soit and in like manner shall be extraordinarily punished all persons whomsoever who shall have participated in the said abduction and who shall have given their unto counsel succour and aid in any manner whatsoever those are the exact or very nearly the exact terms of the ordinance as for that article of the code napoleon which you have just told me of and which accepts from liability to prosecution the abductor who marries the young girl abducted by him it reminds me that according to the laws of Britannia, forcible abduction followed by marriage was not punished but this usage which involved various abuses was suppressed in seventeen twenty at least i give you the date within ten years my memory is not very good now and the time is long past when i could repeat by heart without even stopping to take breath fifteen hundred verses of gerard de roussillon as far as regards the capitulary of charlemagne which fixes the compensation for abduction i have not mentioned it because i am sure that you must remember it so my dear monsieur de gabry you see abduction was considered as decidedly a punishable offence under the three dynasties of old france it is a very great mistake to suppose that the middle ages represent a period of social chaos you must remember on the contrary monsieur de gabry here interrupted me so he exclaimed you know of the ordonnance de blois you know Balus, you know childebert you know the capitularies and you don't know anything about the code napoleon i replied that as a matter of fact i never had read the code and he looked very much surprised and now do you understand he asked the extreme gravity of the action you have committed i had not indeed been yet able to understand it fully but little by little with the aid of m paul's very sensible explanations i reached the conviction at last that i should not be judged in regard to my motives which were innocent but only according to my action which was punishable thereupon i began to feel very despondent and to utter divers lamentations what am i to do i cried out what am i to do am i then irretrievably ruined and have i also ruined the poor child whom i wanted to save m de gabry silently filled his pipe and lighted it so slowly that his kind broad face remained for at least three or four minutes glowing red behind the light like a blacksmith's in the gleam of his forge fire then he said you want to know what to do why don't do anything my dear monsieur bernard for god's sake and for your own sake don't do anything at all your situation is bad enough as it is don't try to meddle with it now unless you want to create new difficulties for yourself but you must promise me to sustain me in any action that i may take 
i shall go to see monsieur mouche the very first thing to-morrow morning and if he turns out to be what i think he is that is to say a consummate rascal i shall very soon find means of making him harmless even if the devil himself should take sides with him for everything depends on him as it is too late this evening to take mademoiselle jean back to her boarding-school my wife will keep the young lady here to-night this of course plainly constitutes the misdemeanor of complicity but it saves the girl from anything like an equivocal position as for you my dear monsieur you just go back to the quai malaquais as quickly as you can and if they come to look for jean there it will be very easy for you to prove she is not in your house while we were thus talking madame de gabry was preparing to make her young lodger comfortable for the night when she bade me good-bye at the door she was carrying a pair of clean sheets scented with lavender thrown over her arm that i said is a sweet honest smell well of course answered madame de gabry you must remember we are peasants ah i answered her heaven grant that i also may be able one of these days to become a peasant heaven grant that one of these days i may be able as you are at lausance to inhale the sweet fresh odour of the country and live in some little house all hidden among trees and if this wish of mine be too ambitious on the part of an old man whose life is nearly closed then i will only wish that my winding sheet may be as sweetly scented with lavender as that linen you have on your arm it was agreed that i should come to lunch the following morning but i was positively forbidden to show myself at the house before midday jeanne as she kissed me good-bye begged me not to take her back to the school any more we felt much affected at parting and very anxious i found therese waiting for me on the landing in such a condition of worry about me that it had made her furious she talked of nothing less than keeping me under lock and key in the future what a night i passed i never closed my eyes for one single instant from time to time i could not help laughing like a boy at the success of my prank and then again an inexpressible feeling of horror would come upon me at the thought of being dragged before some magistrate and having to take my place upon the prisoner's bench to answer for the crime which i had so naturally committed i was very much afraid and nevertheless i felt no remorse or regret whatever the sun coming into my room at last merrily lighted upon the foot of my bed and then i made this prayer my god thou who didst make the sky and the dew as it is said in tristan judge me in thine equity not indeed according unto my acts but according only to my motives which thou knowest have been upright and pure and i will say glory to thee in heaven and peace on earth to men of good will i give into thy hands the child i stole away do that for her which i have not known how to do guard for her from all her enemies and blessed for ever be thy name in a section thirty two section thirty three of the crime of sylvestre bonheur by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain december twenty nine when i arrived at madame de gabry's i found jean completely transfigured had she also like myself at the very first light of dawn called upon him who made the sky and the dew she smiled with such a sweet calm smile madame de gabry called her away to arrange her hair for the amiable lady had insisted upon combing and plaiting with her own hands the hair of the child confided to her care as i had come a little before the hour agreed upon i had interrupted this charming toilet by way of punishment i was told to go and wait in the parlour all by myself monsieur de gabry joined me there in a little while he had evidently just come in for i could see on his forehead the mark left by the lining of his hat his frank face wore an expression of joyful excitement i thought i had better not ask him any questions and we all went to lunch when the servants had finished waiting at table monsieur pole who had been keeping his good story for the dessert said to us well i went to la valois 
did you see maitre mouche excitedly inquired madame de gabry no he replied curiously watching the expression of disappointment upon our faces after having amused himself with our anxiety for a reasonable time the good fellow added maitre mouche is no longer at le valois maitre mouche has gone away from france the day after to-morrow will make just eight days since he decamped taking with him all the money of his clients a tolerably large sum i found the office closed a woman who lived close by told me all about it with an abundance of curses and imprecations the notary did not take the seven fifty five train all by himself he took with him the daughter of the hairdresser of la valois a young person quite famous in that part of the country for her beauty and her accomplishments they say she could shave better than her father well anyhow mouche has run away with her the commissaire de police confirmed the fact for me now really could it have been possible for maitre mouche to have left the country at a more opportune moment if he had only deferred his escapade one week longer he would have been still the representative of society and would have had you dragged off to jail monsieur bonnard like a criminal at present we have nothing whatever to fear from him here is to the health of maitre mouche he cried pouring out a glass of white wine i would like to live a long time if it were only to remember that delightful morning we four were all assembled in the big white dining-room around the waxed oak table monsieur pole's mirth was of the hearty kind even perhaps a little riotous and the good man quaffed deeply madame de gabry smiled at me with a smile so sweet so perfect and so noble that i thought such a woman ought to keep smiles like that simply as a reward for good actions and thus make everybody who knew her do all the good of which they were capable then to reward us for our pains jean who had regained something of her former vivacity asked us in less than a quarter of an hour one dozen questions to answer which would have required an exhaustive exposition on the nature of man the nature of the universe the science of physics and of metaphysics the macrocosm and the microcosm not to speak of the ineffable and the unknowable then she drew out of her pocket her little saint georges who had suffered most cruelly during our flight his legs and arms were gone but he still had his gold helmet with the green dragon on it jeanne solemnly pledged herself to make a restoration of him in honour of madame de gabry delightful friends i left them at last overwhelmed with fatigue and joy on re-entering my lodgings i had to endure the very sharpest remonstrances from therese who said she had given up trying to understand my new way of living in her opinion monsieur had really lost his mind yes therese i am a mad old man and you are a mad old woman that is certain may the good god bless us both therese and give us new strength for we now have new duties to perform but let me lie down upon the sofa for i really cannot keep myself on my feet any longer End of section thirty three section thirty four of the crime of sylvestre bonnard by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain january fifteenth eighteen sixty something good morning monsieur said jeanne letting herself in while therese remained grumbling in the corridor because she had not been able to get to the door in time mademoiselle i beg you will be kind enough to address me very solemnly by my title and to say to me good morning my guardian then it has all been settled oh how nice cried the child clapping her hands it has all been arranged mademoiselle in the salle commune and before the justice of the peace and from to-day you are under my authority what are you laughing about my ward i see it in your eyes you have some crazy idea in your head this very moment some more nonsense eh oh no monsieur i mean my guardian i was looking at your white hair 
it curls out from under the edge of your hat like honeysuckle on a balcony it is very handsome and i like it very much be good enough to sit down my ward and if you can possibly help it stop saying ridiculous things because i have some very serious things to say to you listen i suppose you are not going to insist upon being sent back to the establishment of mademoiselle Prefere? no well then what would you say if i should take you here to live with me and to finish your education and keep you here until what shall i say for ever as the song has it oh monsieur she cried flushing crimson with pleasure i continued behind there we have a nice little room which my housekeeper has cleaned up and furnished for you you are going to take the place of the books which used to be in it you will succeed them as the day succeeds night go with therese and look at it and see if you think you will be able to live in it madame de gabry and i have made up our minds that you can sleep there to-night she had already started to run i called her back for a moment jean listen to me a moment longer you have always until now made yourself a favourite with my housekeeper who like all very old people is apt to be cross at times be gentle and forbearing make every allowance for her i have thought it my duty to make every allowance for her myself and to put up with all her fits of impatience now let me tell you jean respect her and when i say that i do not forget that she is my servant and yours neither will she ever allow herself to forget it for a moment but what i want you to respect in her is her great age and her great heart she is a humble woman who has lived a very very long time in the habit of doing good and she has become hardened and stiffened in that habit bear patiently with the harsh ways of that upright soul if you know how to command she will know how to obey go now my child arrange your room in whatever way may seem to you best suited for your studies and for your repose having started jean with this viaticum upon her domestic career i began to read a review which although conducted by very young men is excellent the tone of it is somewhat unpolished but the spirit is zealous the article i read was certainly far superior in point of precision and positiveness to anything of the sort ever written when i was a young man the author of the article m paul meyer points out every error with a remarkably lucid power of incisive criticism we used not in my time to criticise with such strict justice our indulgence was vast it went even so far as to confuse the scholar and the ignoramus in the same burst of praise and nevertheless one must learn how to find fault and it is even an imperative duty to blame when the blame is deserved i remember little raymond that was the name we gave him he did not know anything and his mind was not a mind capable of absorbing any solid learning but he was very fond of his mother we took very good care never to utter a hint of the ignorance of so perfect a son and thanks to our forbearance little raymond made his way to the highest positions he had lost his mother then but honours of all kinds were showered upon him he became omnipotent to the grievous injury of his colleagues and of science but here comes my young friend of the luxembourg good evening joly you look very happy to-day what good fortune has come to you my dear lad his good fortune is that he has been able to sustain his thesis very credibly and that he has taken high rank in his class he tells me this with the additional information that my own words which were incidentally referred to in the course of the examination have been spoken of by the college professors in terms of the most unqualified praise that is very nice i replied and it makes me very happy joly to find my old reputation thus associated with your own youthful honours i was very much interested you know in that thesis of yours but some domestic arrangements have been keeping me so busy lately that i quite forgot this was the day on which you were to sustain it mademoiselle jean made her appearance very opportunely as if in order to suggest to him something about the nature of those very domestic arrangements 
the giddy girl burst into the city of books like a fresh breeze crying at the top of her voice that her room was a perfect little wonder then she became very red indeed on seeing m joly there but none of us can escape our destiny m joly asked her how she was with the tone of a young fellow who resumes upon a previous acquaintance and who proposes to put himself forward as an old friend oh never fear she had not forgotten him at all that was very evident from the fact that then and there right under my nose they resumed their last year's conversation on the subject of the venetian blonde they continued the discussion after quite an animated fashion i began to ask myself what right i had to be in the room at all the only thing i could do in order to make myself heard was to cough as for getting in a word they never even gave me a chance joly discoursed enthusiastically not only about the venetian colorists but also upon all other matters relating to nature or to mankind and jean kept answering him yes monsieur you are right that is just what i suppose monsieur monsieur you express so beautifully just what i feel i am going to think a great deal about what you have just told me monsieur when i speak mademoiselle never answers me in that tone it is only with the very tip of her tongue that she will even taste any intellectual food which i set before her usually she will not touch it at all but m joly seems to be in her opinion the supreme authority upon all subjects it was always oh yes oh of course to all his empty chatter and then the eyes of jean i had never seen them look so large before i had never before observed in them such fixity of expression but her gaze otherwise remained what it always is artless frank and brave joly evidently pleased her she like joly and her eyes betrayed the fact they would have published it to the entire universe all very fine master bonar you have been so deeply interested in observing your ward that you have been forgetting you are her guardian you began only this morning to exercise that function and you can already see that it involves some very delicate and difficult duties bonar you must really try to devise some means of keeping that young man away from her you really ought eh how am i to know what i am to do i have picked up a book at random from the nearest shelf i open it and i enter respectfully into the middle of a drama of sophocles the older i grow the more i learn to love the two civilizations of the antique world and now i always keep the poets of italy and of greece on a shelf within easy reach of my arm in the city of books monsieur and mademoiselle finally condescend to take some notice of me now that i seem too busy to take any notice of them i really think that mademoiselle jeanne has even asked me what i am reading no indeed i will not tell her what it is what i am reading between ourselves is the change of that smooth and luminous course which rolls out its magnificent tunefulness through a scene of passionate violence the course of the old men of thebes us avixiate invincible love o thou who descendest upon rich houses thou who dost rest upon the delicate cheek of the maiden thou who dost traverse all seas surely none among the immortals can escape thee nor indeed any among men who live but for a little space and he who is possessed by thee there is a madness upon him and when i had re-read that delicious chant the face of antigone appeared before me in all its passionless purity what images gods and goddesses who hover in the highest heights of heaven the blind old man the long wandering beggar king led by antigone has now been buried with holy rites and his daughter fair as the fairest dream ever conceived by human soul resists the will of the tyrant and gives pious sepulture to her brother she loves the son of the tyrant and that son loves her also and as she goes on her way to execution the victim of her own sweet piety the old men sing invincible love o thou who dost descend upon rich houses thou who dost rest upon the delicate cheek of the maiden mademoiselle jeanne are you really very anxious to know what i am reading i am reading mademoiselle i am reading that antigone having buried the blind old man wove a fair tapestry embroidered with images in the likeness of laughing faces ah said joly as he bursts out laughing that is not in the text it is a scolium i said unpublished he added getting up i am not an egotist but i am prudent i have to bring up this child she is much too young to be married now 
no i am not an egotist but i must certainly keep her with me for a few years more keep her alone with me she can surely wait until i am dead fear not antigone old oedipus will find holy burial soon enough in the meanwhile antigone is helping our housekeeper to scrape the carrots she says she likes to do it that it is in her line being related to the art of sculpture end of section thirty four section thirty five of the crime of sylvestre bonard by anatole france this librivox recording is in the public domain may who would recognize the city of books now there are flowers everywhere even upon all the articles of furniture jean was right those roses do look very nice in that blue china vase she goes to market every day with therese under the pretext of helping the old servant to make her purchases but she never brings anything back with her except flowers flowers are really very charming creatures and one of these days i must certainly carry out my plan and devote myself to the study of them in their own natural domain in the country with all the science and earnestness which i possess for what have i to do here why should i burn my eyes out over these old parchments which cannot now tell me anything worth knowing i used to study them these old texts with the most ardent enjoyment what was it which i was then so anxious to find in them the date of a pious foundation the name of some monkish engineer or a copyist the price of a loaf or of an ox or of a field some judicial or administrative enactment all that and yet something more a something vaguely mysterious and sublime which excited my enthusiasm but for sixty years i have been searching in vain for that something better men than i the masters the truly great the fauriels the tiris who found so many things died at their task without having been able any more than i have been to find that something which being incorporeal has no name and without which nevertheless no great mental work would ever be undertaken in this world and now that i am only looking for what i should certainly be able to find i cannot find anything at all and it is probable that i shall never be able to finish the history of the abbots of st germain des prés guardian just guess what i have in my handkerchief judging from appearance jean i should say flowers oh no not flowers look i look and i see a little gray head poking itself out of the handkerchief it is the head of a little gray cat the handkerchief opens the animal leaps down upon the carpet shakes itself pricks up first one ear and then the other and begins to examine with due caution the locality and the inhabitants thereof therese out of breath with her basket on her arm suddenly makes her appearance in time to take an objective part in this examination which does not appear to result altogether in her favour for the young cat moves slowly away from her without however venturing near my legs or approaching jean who displays extraordinary volubility in the use of caressing appellations therese whose chief fault is her inability to hide her feelings thereupon vehemently reproaches mademoiselle for bringing home a cat that she did not know anything about jean in order to justify herself tells the whole story while she was passing with therese before a chemist's shop she saw the assistant kick a little cat into the street the cat astonished and frightened seemed to be asking itself whether to remain in the street where it was being terrified and knocked about by the people passing by or whether to go back into the chemist's even at the risk of being kicked out a second time jean thought it was in a very critical position and understood its hesitation it looked so stupid and she knew it looked stupid only because it could not decide what to do so she took it up into her arms and as it had not been able to obtain any rest either indoors or out of doors it allowed her to hold it then she stroked and petted it to keep it from being afraid and boldly went to the chemist's assistant and said if you don't like that animal you mustn't beat it you must give it to me take it said the assistant now there 
as jean by way of conclusion and then she changes her voice again to a flute tone in order to say all kinds of sweet things to the cat he is horribly thin i observe looking at the wretched animal moreover he is horribly ugly jean thinks he is not ugly at all but she acknowledges that he looks even more stupid than he looked at first this time she thinks it not indecision but surprise which gives that unfortunate aspect to his countenance she asks us to imagine ourselves in his place then we are obliged to acknowledge that he cannot possibly understand what has happened to him and then we all burst out laughing in the face of the poor little beast which maintains the most comical look of gravity jean wants to take him up but he hides himself under the table and cannot even be tempted to come out by the lure of a saucer of milk we all turn our backs and promise not to look when we inspect the saucer again we find it empty jean i observe your protege has a decidedly tristful aspect of countenance he is of sly and suspicious disposition i trust he is not going to commit in the city of books any such misdemeanors as might render it necessary for us to send him back to his chemist's shop in the meantime we must give him a name suppose we call him dangri de gouttiere but perhaps that is too long pill drug or castor oil would be short enough and would further serve to recall his early condition in life what do you think about it pill would not sound bad answers jean but it would be very unkind to give him a name which would be always reminding him of the misery from which we saved him it would be making him pay too dearly for our hospitality let us be more generous and give him a pretty name in hopes that he is going to deserve it see how he looks at us he knows that we are talking about him and now that he is no longer unhappy he is beginning to look a great deal less stupid i am not joking unhappiness does make people look stupid i am perfectly sure it does well jean if you like we will call your protege hannibal the appropriateness of that name does not seem to strike you at once but the angora cat who preceded him here as an intimate of the city of books and to whom i was in the habit of telling all my secrets for he was a very wise and discreet person used to be called hamilcar it is natural that this name should beget the other and that hannibal should succeed hamilcar we all agreed upon this point hannibal cried jean come here hannibal greatly frightened by the strange sonority of his own name ran to hide himself under a bookcase in an orifice so small that a rat could not have squeezed himself into it a nice way of doing credit to so great a name i was in a good humour for working that day and i just dipped the nib of my pen into the ink bottle when i heard some one ring should any one ever read these pages written by an unimaginative old man he will be sure to laugh at the way that bell keeps ringing through my narrative without ever announcing the arrival of a new personage or introducing any unexpected incident on the stage things are managed on the reverse principle monsieur scribe never has the curtain raised without good reason and for the greater enjoyment of ladies and young misses that is art i would rather hang myself than write a play not that i despise life but because i should never be able to invent anything amusing invent in order to do that one must have received the gift of inspiration it would be a very unfortunate thing for me to possess such a gift suppose i were to invent some monkling in my history of the abbey of st germain des prés what would our young erudites say what a scandal for the school as for the institute it would say nothing and probably not even think about the matter either even if my colleagues still write a little sometimes they never read they are of the opinion of parnay who said une paisible indifférence est la plus sage des vertus the most wise of the virtues as a calm indifference to be the least wise in order to become the most wise this is precisely what those buddhists are aiming at without knowing it if there is any wiser wisdom than that i will go to rome to report upon it and all this because monsieur Gély happened to ring the bell this young man has latterly changed his manner completely with jean he is now quite as serious as he used to be frivolous 
and quite as silent as he used to be chatty and jean follows his example we have reached the phase of passionate love under constraint for old as i am i cannot be deceived about it these two children are violently and sincerely in love with each other jean now avoids him she hides herself in a room when he comes into the library but how well she knows how to reach him when she is alone alone at her piano every evening she talks to him through the music she plays with a rich thrill of passional feeling which is the new utterance of her new soul well why should i not confess it why should i not avow my weakness surely my egotism would not become any less blameworthy by keeping it hidden from myself so i will write it yes i was hoping for something else yes i thought i was going to keep her all to myself as my own child as my own daughter not always of course not even perhaps for very long but just for a few short years more i am so old could she not wait and who knows with the help of the gout i would not have imposed upon her patience too much that was my wish that was my hope i had made my plans i had not reckoned upon the coming of this wild young man but the mistake is none the less cruel because my reckoning happened to be wrong and yet it seems to me that you are condemning yourself very rashly friend sylvestre bonnard if you did not want to keep this young girl a few years longer it was quite as much in her own interest as in yours she has a great deal to learn yet and you are not a master to be despised when that miserable notary mouche who subsequently committed his rascalities at so opportune a moment paid you the honour of a visit you explained to him your ideas of education with all the fervour of high enthusiasm then you attempted to put that system of yours into practice jean is certainly an ungrateful girl and jelly a much too seductive young man but still unless i put him out of the house which would be a detestably ill-mannered and ill-natured thing to do i must continue to receive him he has been waiting ever so long in my little parlour in front of those sevres vases with which king louis philippe so graciously presented me the maisonneur and the pasteur of leopold robert are painted upon those porcelain vases which jaly nevertheless dares to call frightfully ugly with the warm approval of jean whom he has absolutely bewitched my dear lad excuse me for having kept you waiting so long i had a little bit of work to finish i am telling the truth meditation is work but of course jaly does not know what i mean he thinks i am referring to something archaeological and his question in regard to the health of mademoiselle jean having been answered by a very well indeed uttered in that extremely dry tone which reveals my moral authority as guardian we begin to converse about historical subjects we first enter upon generalities generalities are sometimes extremely serviceable i tried to inculcate into m joly some respect for that generation of historians to which i belong i say to him history which was formerly an art and which afforded place for the fullest exercise of the imagination has in our time become a science the study of which demands absolute exactness of knowledge jaly asks leave to differ from me on this subject he tells me he does not believe that history is a science or that it could possibly ever become a science in the first place he says to me what is history the written representation of past events but what is an event is it merely a commonplace fact it is any fact no you say yourself it is a noteworthy fact now how is the historian to tell whether a fact is noteworthy or not he judges it arbitrarily according to his tastes and his caprices and his ideas in short as an artist for facts cannot by reason of their own intrinsic character be divided into historical facts and non-historical facts but any fact is something exceedingly complex will the historian represent facts in all their complexity no that is impossible then he will represent them stripped of the greater part of the peculiarities which constituted them and consequently lopped mutilated different from what they really were as for the interrelation of facts needless to speak of it if a so-called historical fact be brought into notice as is very possible by one or more facts which are not historical at all 
and are for that very reason unknown how is the historian going to establish the relation of these facts one to another and in saying this monsieur bonnard i am supposing that the historian has positive evidence before him whereas in reality he feels confidence only in such or such a witness for sympathetic reasons history is not a science it is an art and one can succeed in that art only through the exercise of his faculty of imagination m Jelly reminds me very much at this moment of a certain young fool whom i heard talking wildly one day in the garden of the luxembourg under the statue of marguerite of navarre but at another turn of the conversation we find ourselves face to face with walter scott whose work my disdainful f young friend pleases to term rococo troubadourish and only fit to inspire somebody engaged in making designs for cheap bronze clocks those are his very words why i exclaimed zealous to defend the magnificent creator of the bride of lamamour and the fair maid of perth the whole past lives in those admirable novels of his that is history that is epic it is frippery jelly answers me and will you believe it this crazy boy actually tells me that no matter how learned one may be one cannot possibly know just how men used to live five or ten centuries ago because it is only with the very greatest difficulty that one can picture them to oneself even as they were only ten or fifteen years ago in his opinion the historical poem the historical novel the historical painting are all according to their kind abominably false as branches of art in all the arts he adds the artist can only reflect his own soul his work no matter how it may be dressed up is of necessity contemporary with himself being the reflection of his own mind what do we admire in the divine comedy unless it be the great soul of dante and the marbles of michelangelo what do they represent to us that is at all extraordinary unless it be michelangelo himself the artist either communicates his own life to his creations or else merely whittles out puppets and dresses up dolls what a torrent of paradoxes and irreverences but boldness in a young man is not displeasing to me jaily gets up from his chair and sits down again i know perfectly well what is worrying him and whom he is waiting for and now he begins to talk to me about his being able to make fifteen hundred francs a year to which he can add the revenue he derives from a little property that he has inherited two thousand francs a year more and i am not in the least deceived as to the purpose of these confidences on his part i know perfectly well that he is only making his little financial statements in order to persuade me that he is comfortably circumstanced steady fond of home comparatively independent or to put the matter in the fewest words possible able to marry quod erat demonstrandum as the geometricians say he has got up and sat down just twenty times he now rises for the twenty-first time and as he has not been able to see jean he goes away feeling as unhappy as possible the moment he is gone jean comes into the city of books under the pretext of looking for hannibal she is also quite unhappy and her voice becomes singularly plaintive as she calls her pet to give him some milk look at that sad little face bonnard tyrant gaze upon thy work thou hast been able to keep them from seeing each other but they have now both of them the same expression of countenance and thou mayest discern from that similarity of expression that in spite of thee they are united in thought cassandra be happy bartolo rejoice this is what it means to be a guardian just see her kneeling down there on the carpet with hannibal's head between her hands yes caress the stupid animal pity him moan over him we know very well you little rogue the real cause of all these sighs and plaints nevertheless it makes a very pretty picture i look at it for a long time then throwing a glance around my library i exclaim jean i am tired of all those books we must sell them End of section thirty five